All rise. Court is now in session. The Honorable Cheryl A. Matthews presiding. Good morning, Mr. Chief. Good morning. Your Honor, calling people versus James Crumbly, case number 22279-989-FH. Thank you. Good morning. Mark Easton, on behalf of the people. Karen McDonald, on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Marielle Lehman, on behalf of James Crumbly, who is standing to my left. Good morning. Uh, are you ready to proceed? They're all here. That's the good news. Thanks, Judge. Our first witness is in the courtroom. <clears throat> we discussed at the bench. I don't think counsel and I put on the record a mutual sequestration order. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that's something we all uh, fail to do to start with. Uh, mutual sequestration order. So if the witness is going to come back into the courtroom after testifying, we have to agree. All Correct. Right. Thank you, Judge. Obviously, we have two officers in charge in the courtroom today, exceptions for those two individuals. Sure. Sure. All right. Um, other than jury? Thank you, Judge. Mm -hmm. Sean Hopkins. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you have to give as a truth to help you back? I do. Okay, please step up and have a seat. State your name for the record and spell your first and last name. Sean, S H A W N, Hopkins, H O P. K I N S. Go ahead, Pastor. Thank you. Sir, how are you? I'm here. Sir, do you work with for the, do you work for the Oxford School District? Uh, I have been employed for the Oxford School District. I am currently on leave okay. at this moment. Now I'd like to direct your attention specifically to the fall of 2021. Were you working with Oxford School District at that point? Yes, I was. In what role? I was a counselor at Oxford High School. And tell us, please, what general duties are associated with that particular role? Um, I managed a caseload of about 400 students. With that, I was in charge of scheduling for those students, um, preparing them for life after high school by, by helping them kind of look through different potential job opportunities, um, caring for social-emotional uh, wellness for students, um, and being kind of just a general person who would be consistent throughout their time in high school working with them. Okay. You said you had a caseload of about 400 students? Yes. How many students went to Oxford High School that particular time? There were approximately 1,800 students um, divided amongst four counselors. There were 1,600 and then approximately 200 in an early college program as well. 
<coughs> so in November, excuse me, in November of 2021, approximately how long had you been employed at Baxter High School? I started as an intern in 2014 and was hired full-time in fall of 2015. Okay. Tell me a little bit about your background, please. Um, I came out of college, graduated with a degree in youth ministry, worked as a youth pastor starting in 2009, um, and then did that and went back to school for a master's degree in counseling. I graduated with that, um, actually walked in December of 2014 and started working in the high school thereafter. Okay. Now you mentioned your role included helping students transition into post uh, secondary either education or employment, scheduling, as well as social, emotional issues? Yes. Would one of those roles take precedence? It would ebb and flow depending on the time of year, but there was never anything that you did that was, this is the most important thing, because to it was what student you were with at the time. Okay. To a senior going to college, helping them with that college application took precedence in that moment. To a student sitting in front of you with social emotional needs, that took precedence in that moment. So, <clears throat> did you have regular check ins with students, or was it an as needed basis? It depended on what it was for. We did have regular meetings with students in regards to scheduling, but when it came to social emotional, that was more of an as needed basis. Did your role as a counselor involve disciplining students? No. Okay, who, who took care of that? That would have been the dean or our administration. Okay. At the, in November of 2021, who was the dean? Nick Jack. All right. And did you work with him a lot? No, I didn't. He was actually new to the district that year. Okay. So is there a reason why the counselor would be separate from the discipline of students? The counselor's role was to be a student advocate, um, to remain on the side of the student, um, through difficult situations oftentimes, um, to give the students somebody that they could build that trust and rapport with, where the dean would be enforcing code of conduct. Okay. What code of conduct? What's that? Uh, the standards that are expected to be followed by students. Okay, so a rule? Would that be fair? That would be a part of it, okay. yes. Yes. Now, in the fall of 2021, was Oxford High School in person, hybrid, or remote? Oxford High School was in person. Okay. Were all students and teachers wearing face masks at that point? Yes, they were. In the fall of 2021, what sort of issues, issues would you face with the students' social-emotional health? Social-emotional health was definitely on our radar in the fall of 2021. Um, coming out of COVID, coming out of time being out from school, the anxiety that was associated with that time period, we saw a lot of issues for students, um, whether it be anxiety, whether it be depression, and in a few cases, it was suicide attempts. Okay. Now that year, did you encounter any students who actually had attempted suicide? I did. How many? Uh, at least four. So are you familiar with the term suicidal ideation? Yes, I am familiar with that term. Could you please explain to us what that means? Suicidal ideation yeah, is... I'm going to object to relevance. Judge, I believe this witness will testify that he indicated that the defendant's son was expressing signs of suicidal ideation that was expressed to the defendant. Well, that was his belief at the time, right? So I'm going to allow it. Thank you. What's suicidal ideation? Suicidal ideation is looking at themes, ideas, behaviors, which could be associated with suicide. So when you take sadness, depression, anxiety, those on their own aren't necessarily suicidal. And when we look at them, we may see somebody who's not actively suicidal that may not be expressing a date or a plan or a method, but we see themes that if left unchecked could be associated with potentially becoming suicidal. Okay. Now, as your role as a counselor at Oxford High School, as you dealt with students who were expressing suicidal ideation, separate from those who actually attempted suicide? Yes. Could you put a number on how many? Dozens. Now, with, you mentioned that there were four counselors for a school of around 1,700 or 1,800 or so. Um, 
how was it that each student was assigned to a counselor? Of the students who are not in the early college program, they were divided out alphabetically okay. um, amongst their counselors. Was James Crumbly's son one of the students assigned to your caseload in November of 2021? Yes. Is James Crumbly in court today? Yes, he is. Could you please point to him and describe something he's wearing today? He is yeah, this seated is at right this now. table wearing a suit yeah. coat with a blue tie. Would the record re reflect identification no, of the defendant? The record would reflect yeah. the in-court identification of the defendant, James Crumbly. Sir, when is the first time that you would have interacted with James Crumbly's son? The first time that I likely interacted with him would have been scheduling during his freshman <laughs> year. Okay, yeah. so for context, November of 2021, he was a sophomore, is that right? That is correct. Okay, so this would have been August or September of 2020? No. Um, when students are in eighth grade, they're scheduled at the middle school level. Okay. I may or may not have been in his classroom because it's divided out within their eighth grade classrooms. And we're not really, we don't know the students at all at that point. Okay. I would have done scheduling with him during his freshman year, approximately February of 2021. February of 21. Yes. Okay. Those meetings were done virtually and were not in depth and were only to discuss their next year's schedule. Do you remember anything about that meeting if you had? I don't remember that meeting in particular, right. no. Well, I'm going to show you. First of all, if you recall, when is the next time that you had any interaction with the defendant's son? I don't recall this particular meeting, but I know that there was a phone call in spring of 2021 okay. um, from a teacher to me. And then I called into the student's classroom to meet with the student. Okay. I do not remember that meeting. All right, I'm going to show you what's been, if it is Exhibit 198. This is an email, May 13, 2021, 146 in the afternoon. Without telling us that person's name, who was that person who sent you the email? Without telling. Well, who, does, does she work there at Oxford High School? She was an English teacher English at Oxford teacher. High School. Okay. And the email is, hi, when you get a chance, can you call the defendant's son down and see how he's doing? He is failing my class and tries to sleep all the time. In class, thanks. That's Exhibit 198, May 13, 2021. You received this email? Yes, I did. Okay. And the response from you at 2.07 p.m. is, I'll catch him before the end of the day. And then her response at 2.08 was, thanks, just a little worried. Okay, did you have any interaction with the defendant's son because of this email? I have, um, through phone records, I called into a student's classroom and called him down to my office. I okay. don't remember that particular meeting. Okay. But at least your recollection is that you would have had that meeting. The evidence from everything suggests that I had that meeting. Sure, that's fair. Did you contact either James or Jennifer Crumbly then? I did not. Okay. And why or why not? It was a check-in, um, and it didn't raise to the level of concern where I would contact a parent. Now, as a counselor with Oxford High School, do you have a sort of method or protocol for when you determine when to contact a parent? There isn't a set, like, there isn't always a set level of when you do it, but when something becomes repeated or when something becomes more concerning, um, I am going to then involve a parent. Okay. Are grades available to parents on a district ride basis? Yes, they are. They are available through a system called PowerSchool, which is available online. Okay, and that's the system that a parent can log in daily if they would choose to? As often as they would like. Now, the next interaction you had with the defendant's son would be September 2021? I did not actually have an interaction with the defendant's son. Um, I received information about the defendant's son. Okay, I'm showing you Exhibit 199. This is an email from a different teacher to you, September 8, 2021? Yes. Okay. And why don't you go ahead and read um, the email here that you received. Hi, Sean. Could you please touch base with student? In his autobiography poem, he said that he feels terrible and that his family is a mistake. Unusual responses for sure. Okay, that is September the 8th, 2021. Do you recall any interaction with the defendant's son at that point? I do not. Okay. Now, do you recall any 
meetings, check-ins, or phone calls from September to November of 2008, or 2021? No, so to give context on this, what I did was have a conversation with the teacher um, to gain a little more context of what was meant by the email. And then the teacher filled me in that the student was actually joking with others in the class um, and that it was not at the level of concern that she had believed when she sent the email. Okay, so if I'm correct, then you received the email, then you made contact with the teacher who sent you the email? Yes. Okay, and then the determination was made that no further involvement was required? Correct. Okay. I'm going to show you what's... Oh, this is your response. Thanks for the heads up. I'm in senior meetings throughout the day, but we'll try and catch up with him. That was to the same teacher, September 8, 2021, 9-15? Yes, that is correct. This is People's Exhibit 200. This is November the 10th, 2021. Um, the same teacher emailed you, Hi, Sean. The defendant's son is having a rough time right now. He might need to speak with you. Do you recall that email? I do. Okay. And tell us what you did when you received that email. I... I checked in with the student um, in the hallway in between classes to just let them know that if they were having a hard time, that I was available to talk to. Okay. And uh, here's your response at 4.44 p.m. I'm sorry, I was in a meeting through the end of the day. I'll catch up with them. Yes. So you recall that interaction with the defendant's son? Yes. Okay, tell us about that, please. It was in between classes. Um, I believe the morning after I had responded to this email, um, and I just spoke to him briefly in passing to let him know that if he needed to talk um, for any reason, that I would make myself available for him. Okay. Did you make a decision to contact a parent at that point? I did not. Okay. You did not contact a parent? I did not contact a parent. And tell us why, please. Because I wanted to gain any information from the student and allow the student the opportunity um, to talk. Being sad isn't unusual, um, but if I had no information other than a student is sad, I, it's not something I would call a parent over. Okay. When's the next time you've had any interaction with the defendant's son? November 29th. All right, I'm going to show you what's been meant as People's 201. This is an email um, from a teacher to uh, Mr. Ejack and Ms. Fine, and you eventually were CC'd on this email? I was forwarded this email, okay. yes. And the email says, good morning, I had a student during first hour today, the defendant's son, who was on his phone looking at different bullets at the end of first hour today as I was walking around the room passing out their essays. I didn't get a chance to investigate it a bit further since it was the end of the hour. Now that he's on my radar, I'm also noticing some of his previous work that he's completed from earlier in the year leans a bit toward the violent side. I can bring down these things later today during my fifth hour prep if you would like them. And then it was forwarded to you at 9.34 a.m.? Yes, it was. Okay. And then your response was, thanks, Jacqueline, I'll be touching base with him as well. Yes. Okay, and tell us what happened with this, please. Um... I ended up going down to Ms. Fine's office, who was on the initial email. So who's Ms. Fine? She was our restorative practices coordinator okay. at that time. Um, and she called the student down to her office uh, to chat about the email that had been sent. Were you present for that meeting? I was present for that meeting. Okay, tell us about that, please. Uh, the student came down towards the end of the second class of the day. Um, and Ms. Fine led the meeting. Um, I was there to be a support for the student in case it became a disciplinary issue. Um, but it was very cordial. Uh, we say support for the student in case it became a disciplinary issue. That's not for you to discipline, correct? That is correct. I would be there just as somebody who's able to be a comfort to the student okay. um, during a time where they may potentially be experiencing discipline. Now, at that point, was everybody wearing a uh, COVID face mask? Yes, they were. And in fact, had you ever interacted with the defendant's son without a COVID face mask? No, I did not. So you said Ms. Fine led the meeting? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yes, Ms. Fine did lead the meeting. Um, she had a conversation with the student about the email that was received. Um, 
and, and led it in a way to see if the student would, would bring any information available um, based on what the email was received, where she asked him, were you looking at anything in class? Were you looking at, what teacher were you looking at um, this information in class to see if he would acknowledge that it was Ms. Kavina who sent the email? He did, he was compliant during that meeting. Um, and the conversation centered around how it was not school appropriate. Um, the student understood, at least stated he understood, um, and was returned to class. A uh, phone call was then placed to the student's mom from Ms. Fine. Okay, and we heard that uh, last week during the trial. That was from Ms. Fine to Jennifer Crumbler? That is correct. Okay, and um, was that a voicemail that was left? It was left as a voicemail, yes. Did the defendant's son indicate that he had received the gun for Christmas a few days before? No. So what happened next? In, in terms of that meeting? Yes. The meeting was over, he returned to class. How long was the meeting? Five to ten minutes. Okay. Now, in the realm of either discipline or your role as a counselor, what does it take to move from a check-in to a phone call? home? It can be subjective. Oftentimes it would be if there's information we feel that is necessary for parents to know. Um, somewhere it's obvious as if you feel the student may be a threat to himself or if there's any potential that that could be a possibility. Um, if you have concerning information that the student has shared. Um, or it could just be simply to confirm what a student has said is true. So that's a phone call home. What does it take to actually call the parents in for a meeting immediately? I would have to have a high level of concern that needed parental involvement. Okay. And when was the next time you had any interaction with the defendant's son? November 30th. Okay, so that would be Tuesday the next day? Yes. All right. So let's talk about the 30th. I'm going to show you People's Exhibit 202. This is an email on Tuesday, November 30th, 2021, 8.05 a.m. Um, from a teacher to you, Ms. Fine. Uh, good morning. I know Jackie emailed you guys yesterday with some concerns about the defendant's son in our first hour class. Today he's watching videos on his phone of a guy gunning down people. It looks like it's a movie scene and not security footage slash real event, but definitely still concerning when taking into account some of his other behaviors. Just wanted to keep you guys updated. Do you recall receiving that email? I do. Do you remember when you received it? Uh, it was sent at 8.05. I believe I saw it approximately 20 to 30 minutes later. Okay. And what was your reaction when you received this email? My initial reaction was frustration of a student that just had a conversation about school-appropriate behavior. Um, and I wanted to, to make sure that I met with him. Okay. So this is Exhibit 203. This is from another teacher to you at 9.32 a.m. Again, Tuesday, November 30th. Here's the photo I took of his paper in case you need it with a um, picture of a math assignment. Now, what happened in between the time you saw this email that was sent at 8.05 to this email sent at 9.32? So I was on the phone with... Um, other parents at the time I received the first email. And when I was done with that phone call, um, at that time, Mr. Ejack actually was in my office as I was wrapping up the phone call. Okay. He had been presented with a picture of the math assignment from the math teacher and wanted to make sure I was involved in that this conversation. I don't know exactly what it was. I know he was showing a picture on his cell phone. Okay. Um, I would believe it was the initial one, but I do not know that for a fact. I never saw the cell phone. That's fair. Um, so he wanted to involve me in a conversation with the student about the math assignment, and I wanted to talk to the student about the email that had been sent that morning. I do not know if he was on that email, Mr. E. Jack was on that email about the watching the video or not. Okay. Um, so we saw, we talked about the email from that morning, we're referring to this email regarding yes. the, the video. Yes. Okay. So this is the information I had at the time that I was making a decision to meet with the student, 
and Mr. Ejack had the information that there was a math assignment or something on it. So at the time that you decided to meet with the defendant's son, you hadn't even seen this picture yet? That is correct. Okay. So Go ahead. When, I, when Mr. Ejack came and mentioned that there was something going on with the student, I made the decision that I was going to go to the math class and retrieve the student. Um, it's less concerning oftentimes for a counselor to walk into a class than a dean um, because I could be talking about 50 different things with the student. Okay. Um, so it just isn't going to raise suspicion for others. Um, so I went to the class and asked the student if he could come with me and I grabbed the math assignment um, as part of it. So you grabbed the math assignment. So you, it was been admitted as Exhibit 128. Now this math assignment looks different than the one that was emailed to you. Did you receive an explanation as to why? I didn't know there was a difference initially because for the first 30 minutes, all I had was the actual physical copy. And that would be this in Exhibit 128? Yes. Okay. Yes. So as I was meeting with the student in the office, I had the email about what had been sent about watching videos, and I had the copy that is currently on the screen of the math assignment. Um, so I initially asked the student, what, what, was, what was it that you were watching in class? Why am I receiving an email from a teacher one day after I know you just had a conversation about what's appropriate in school and what's not? The student told me he was watching a video game on his phone, not uncommon, also not school appropriate, especially given the context of what we had just had in the conversation. Okay. So we had a conversation about making that good choice and making wise choices. And then I, I grabbed the math assignment and I put it in between the student and I. Um, so Mr. Ejack was actually in that meeting as well. He sat kind of off to my right, the student was across from me, across from my desk. Um, and I asked him, okay, so we can talk about, you know, making good choices in the classroom, but let's talk about this. And I put the assignment in between us. Um, and what and, stood out to you when you saw this? Well, I wanted him to, to explain it to me, but some of the things that actually stood out to me the most were what was written on it. Um, because I, I read something like the thoughts won't stop and I could read help me underneath it being crossed out. Um, is this the part right here that I'm highlighting? Yes. Okay. Um, I read harmless act. I saw what looked like one body and my initial concern was that this student's drawing some things that lead me to think he might hurt himself. Okay. So I asked him to explain what's on here because I didn't want it to just be me interpreting what he wrote. I wanted to hear what he had to say about it, and he told me initially that it was a video game, that he liked like drawing video game characters, liked, liked that area of entertainment, and that he wanted to go into video game design. So then I, I told him, okay, you can tell me that, but let's explain these words. Here, here you write, the thoughts won't stop. Here you write, harmless act. And here you write, I have to look at it, I think it was like, my life is useless or something like that, where he crossed it out. This part that's highlighted right here? Yeah, and, and I said, that doesn't sound like a video game to me. So I take it then you didn't accept his explanation of the video game? Not in totality, no, because I wanted to gain more context. So did you make a decision at that point to do something? Well, as he continued talking... Um, he then started talking about things that were going on in his life. What do you mean things that are going on? Well, he mentioned that school's been tough during COVID, that a family member had passed recently, a family dog had died. He said a, a friend moved away. And, and as he was talking, I just kept hearing all these themes of sadness. What was and his demeanor like? Appropriately sad. Um... It matched what he was saying. Okay. And, and so at that point, I, I told him, okay, this is a lot that you've, you've got going on, and I want to make sure that we get you help. Um, 
And so I told him, when, when I hear all of this, what, what I do is I, I'm going to call a parent. And I asked him, is there a parent you'd rather I call? He told me mom would probably be easier to get a hold of. So I, I called mom first and left a voicemail. This would have been approximately 20 to 25 minutes after the meeting started. Okay. Um, so at this point, I, I, I just decided that it was enough that I wanted to involve a parent. All right. And you said you called mom first and left a voicemail? I did. Did you also call the defendant, James Trumbly? I did, and it was right after leaving a voicemail. I'm not entirely sure if he answered or not. I think he did, but it was almost like it was almost like there was just air on the other end. Okay. Um, so I wasn't able to leave a message or anything. Mom then called me back uh, a few minutes later, and and we talked for I would guess five or six minutes. Um, she was on speakerphone with her son. Um, for a brief part of that conversation, and I asked her to please be able to come in, um, that I, I had some concerns I wanted to go over. I texted her... Did you specify those concerns? Well, I texted her a picture of the math assignment, um, and by that time, I also then received the email that I think you put up earlier So of the math assignment. By this point in time, this was 9.32 a.m. that Ms. Morgan sent it, was the defendant's son already in your office at that point? Yes. Okay. And then did you have a chance to look at this picture as well? I looked briefly at it, but I was already on the phone with mom at that point. Okay. This is exhibit 130. This is what we refer to as the original drawing. Okay. And you said you were on the phone with Jennifer Crumley at that point? Yes. Yeah, so I emailed her then the original drawing as well. Okay. So you sent this to, to the, the student's mother? Yes. Okay. And did you have a chance to look at this? I did look at it. Um, most of it confirmed what I thought was under the scribble outs, and I also noticed some words were added. Okay. What words stuck out, stood out to you? What do you mean? When you said words were added, what, what did you notice? I, on the one where he added words, I, I know he added, like, oh, just rocks, or we're all friends here, which I, I kind of took as just a 15-year-old writing things. It okay. didn't... So you're referring to this exhibit 128, some additional words. Yes, there. he added video game this is, OHS rocks, I think I love my life so much was added. Okay. Things that were facetious. And that was after he was seen with this, is that correct? Is it, it was he, after he created this, exhibit 130. Yes, the, it, exi it existed in its form as exhibit 130 prior to the edits that okay. I had seen on the paper. Now, at some point, did both James and Jennifer Crumbly come to your office? Yeah, so I ended up being on the phone with mom for that five to six minutes. She stated she was going to try and get dad to come to the office that she was unable to. Um, and so during that point, we had about 20 minutes um, where I was sort of just waiting. During that time, I, I showed the student the list of resources I was going to give to his parents. Um, Tell me about that, please. It was about a three-page list of just different mental health um, services in the area. On it, it gave contact information for them. It gave um, specialization areas for them and it gave oftentimes insurance, um, if it was accepted, if they worked without insurance, um, anything that they would work with, payment plans. Okay. So I wanted him to see what I would be providing his parents. Was the defendant's son with you from the point that you brought him out of class to the point that James and Jennifer Crumley arrived at school? Yes. Okay, and approximately how long was that? It was approximately an hour and a half. Um, so around, I, I want to say, a little before 10, probably like 9.45, 9.50, I received another call from Mom um, stating that she was unable to get a hold of Dad and that she would be coming in. Okay. Now, if I told you that we saw surveillance video that indicated you welcomed them 
both James and Jennifer in your office at 10.40 a.m. Does that sound right? Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay. Now, what was your expectations of what was to happen at the end of that meeting? My hope was that they were going to take him and either take him to get help or even just to take him to let's have a good day. Let's have a, let's have a day where we just spend time with you, where we are with you. To take him out of school. Yeah. Did you believe that he could be left alone at that point? I didn't want him left alone. Um, I didn't want to make that decision that he was okay to be left alone. So that's why I stayed with him for as long as I did. Until I had parents there. <clears throat> did you express to the student or his parents that you identified suicidal ideation? Yes, I, I said that I, the student, when I asked the student if he had a plan, if he was a threat to himself or others, the student said, his, his words were something to the effect of, I can see why this looks bad, I'm not going to do anything. So I had all this information, but the student was saying he wasn't going to be doing anything. Um, so when the parents came in, I went over all of the things I had seen, um, with over my time with the student, um, that he expressed the sadness over, over a dog passing. He expressed that COVID has been hard, that a family member passed, that a friend left. Um, he expressed a, an argument the night before with parents. Um, Did he tell you de details about the argument? No. Did he tell you that he received the gun a few days ago? No. Tell us about the meeting when James and Jennifer arrived. It was initially odd to me that they were both there because I wasn't expecting that. Um, but not to the point where I asked anything about it, just it was unexpected. Um, both parents followed me back to my office. Um, the student, that was the one time he was in there by himself was when I went out to greet the parents and brought them back. Um, and uh, the student and his dad sat across from me, and mom sat in a chair kind of diagonal from me. And Mr. Ejack had left once we had confirmed parents were coming, and he returned for that portion of the meeting. Um, so really, I felt like parents were confirming what I had said without giving additional information. Well, hang on, let me, let me ask you about that. You say confirming without giving additional information. I want to make sure I understand what you mean by that. So first of all, you've had these kind of meetings with parents in the past? I have. Okay. When you say confirming, is that something that would typically happen in these meetings? It could, um, but oftentimes you may gain additional um, information. As you know, as a school employee, I, I had 90 minutes. Okay. He's 15 years old. So did James or Jennifer give you any additional information? No. Okay. So tell me what you did and, and what, what was said. So to start off the meeting, I asked mom if she had received, if she had received the phone call from the previous day and that those events were true. She said yes. Um, I talked about how, how the student had expressed these different areas of sadness, that his dog had passed, yes, a family member had passed, yep, uh, friends left, um, and all of those were just confirmed. Um, Are there so, any details about the circumstances of the friend leaving and the impact on their son? I didn't know any details about it. No. They didn't share any with you? No. I'm sorry, I interrupted again, go ahead. It's okay. Um, so, so a lot of it was, I felt like I was bringing information and they knew it, but I wasn't, I wasn't gaining information. Um, so at that point, I, I know I handed mom the list of resources and, and said I, I'd like him to get support outside of here. I'd like him to get help and have somebody that he can talk to. Um, and mom made mention that 
they would, but they couldn't right away. So I told mom that I, I wanted him to get help as soon as possible, today if possible, and, and was told that wasn't possible. Okay, told by James, Jennifer, or both? By Jennifer. Okay. Um, James, at that time, to my memory, was talking with his son. Do you recall what he said? I remember it, yes. He was looking at the math assignment with his son. When you say math assignment, are we talking about this It's the hard, the hard copy. So we're referring to this, Exhibit 128? Yes. Okay. Um, and, and he was talking to his son and mentioned that, you know, you have people you can talk to. Um, you can talk to your counselor. You have your journal. We talk. Um, and, and it felt appropriate at that time, but... At that point, did he share any details about anything you had discussed? I don't, I don't recall any additional details, no. Okay. Um, but my concern at that point was that there wasn't any action happening. When his wife said that they can't, did he protest that? No. So you said you had a concern that no action was happening, so what did you decide to do? Well, I, I told them that uh, with getting help, I, I said I wanted to see movement on 48 out, within 48 hours, and then I'd be following up. Okay. So um, if the shooting didn't occur, what, what was your plan? I was going to meet with the student the next morning and see if they had had conversations about it, if they had made some plans to move towards some sort of therapy. And if that didn't occur, what were you going to do? I was going to call Child Protective Services. Now, generally speaking, within Oxford High School, is it preferred to send the school, the student home when an issue arises or keep the student at school? I'm not sure I understand what you mean with that. So you didn't force, you didn't call the police? As a counselor, I can't send a student home okay. anyway. But you didn't want him to be alone? I didn't want him to be alone. So in this context, my thought was when parents were saying they had to return to work, I wanted to make sure the student was with people okay. um, because my concern was him, was his well-being and his, his ability to be safe and cared for. Did James Crumbly elaborate at all on the fight they had the night before? No. Now, how long did the... Tell us how the meeting ended. Jennifer asked if they were done. Um, which felt abrupt. And uh, during that time, the student had also expressed interest. He, he wanted to go back to class. I asked uh, Mr. Ejack if there was any... Like, from a discipline standpoint, is there anything you need to do? Is there any reason he, he can't go to class? Um, and I was told no. Um, so I wrote him a pass to return to his end of his third hour. Okay. Um, and Jennifer asked, are we done here? Did James protest at all? No. So tell us what happened as you wrote the student a pass. I told the student that I cared about him um, and wanted him to know that I just wanted him to know that. Did either James or Jennifer say that to him? No. Mr. Hopkins, do you have any knowledge of firearms? I very limited. Would you know what this firearm depicts? What kind of firearm? A handgun. Is that the extent of your knowledge? Yeah. What about this, this bullet here? A bullet. Just a bullet? And neither James nor Jennifer said anything about the firearm or the bullet? No. Now, you indicated that you passed on a three-page list of resources for, for mental health providers? I did. Okay. I'm going to show you a screenshot of 137 here. In James's hand, does this appear to be that list of resources? Objection. I, I would say that calls for speculation. I don't think Mr. Hopkins knows what's in Mr. Crumbly's hand. Do you know what's in his hand? I know that it's multiple pages of paper, and I handed him a stapled three-page piece of paper. Okay. Do you see anything in Jennifer Crumbly's hands? I do not. Or a phone. And something in the right hand, but I'm not sure. Maybe. I see a phone.
Now, in your years as a high school counselor, how many times have you had to call a parent in and tell the, either mom or dad or guardian that you identified suicidal ideation in their child? 15 to 20, over a dozen. Okay. Any of those meetings, did a parent fail to take their child home? I can't think of any, no. Now you indicated this was a confirming responses from James and Jennifer Crumbly. In those other meetings, were parents sharing information? Oftentimes, yes. Um, Oftentimes, parents would come in and, and want to paint a more complete picture of their student, of their situation. Um, oftentimes, all the time, I, I feel parents know their kids better than I do. I have, I, with, if all I ever did was meet with students, I might have two hours a year with each student. Do you rely upon the parent for that information? Absolutely. I've got them for you. Thank you, Jen. Fox? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Hawkins. Good morning. I'm going to go back to your first interactions with Mr. Crumbly's son. Um, I'm not going to use his name, so if for some reason the way that I'm referring to his son confuses you, just let me know if we're using too many he's, he's, does that make sense? Okay, okay, I'll do that. Thank you. So your first interactions with Mr. Crumbly's son were in the fall of 2020. Well, fall of 2020, no, it would have been spring of 2021. Okay, so it would have been before the 2021 school year. Yes. And that was for um, planning his class schedule, is that correct? That would have been the main reason that we would have met with every freshman. Um, and then I had that email that was displayed earlier from his English teacher. The May of, of 2021 email. Yes. And after that May of 2021 email, you didn't specifically recall having a meeting with Mr. Crumbly's son. I don't have memory of that meeting, no. You, in fact, you went back and reviewed your records and determined that there, there appears to have been a phone call. That you called him? You called him down to your office? I called into his class and, and called him down to my office. Okay. But you don't remember ever meeting with him? I don't remember the meeting. You did not contact Mr. Crumbly or his wife after that May of 2021 email? That is correct. So other than discussing his Mr. Crumbly's son's class schedule with him and then maybe meeting with him in May of 2021 about that email, you don't recall any additional interactions with Mr. Crumbly's son before November 10th of 2021? That is correct. In September of 2021, you received another email from a teacher which was displayed, I believe it was Exhibit 198, sorry, 199. Um, which would be the, uh, an email from a teacher talking about a poem. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that he had a school, a class assignment of writing an autobiography poem. And he had said to that teacher he'd made some concerning statements in that poem. Yes, yeah, so if I can give a little more context to this, this was actually a Spanish class, so the poem wouldn't have even been in English. Okay. So he used words in Spanish? That is my understanding after talking to the teacher. And the Spanish teacher had concerns about the Spanish words that he used? That is my understanding based on the email. I also followed up with the teacher and gained further context about it. Right. And as a result of gaining further context, you were not concerned? Because the teacher lowered the level of concern for me, yes. So even though your response that you were going to catch up with Mr. Crumbly's son, even though that's in the email, you didn't actually meet with him because you had the conversation with the teacher. That is correct. Again, you didn't notify James Crumbly or his wife about the teacher's concern in September of 2021. No, I did not. And you didn't forward them the email? No. And that was because in your mind, 
based on the information that you had, there was nothing to be concerned about. Well, I just gained further context from the teacher and made the decision based off of that information. And had no concerns. I think that you're putting those words in to make it a little more extreme. But what I would say is I gained context and made a decision based off of that. And if you had been concerned, if you had had sufficient concern, you would have reached out to Mr. Crumbly or his wife. If it had raised the level of concern where I felt I needed to, I would have, yes. So then on November 10th of 2021, you received another email from a different teacher. From the same teacher. Oh, thank you for correcting me. It was the same teacher. She asked you to check in with Mr. Crumley's son on November 10th. She said he might need to speak with you. And she said that she believed he was having a hard time? She said he's having a rough time right now. He might need to speak with you. The next day, you responded and indicated that you would check in with him. Uh, later that evening, after the school day was over, I responded, I believe. So you obviously couldn't have met with him that day because the school day was over, correct? She sent, on... she sent the email at the end of the school day, and I responded approximately two hours after the end of the school day. So you couldn't have met with him that day because the school day was over. Is that fair? He would not have been there. So you would have, would have met with him the next day? Yes. And do you believe that you did meet with him on November 11th? Yes. You spoke with him in the hallway? Yes, I caught him in between classes. You simply told him that you were available if he needed to talk? Yes. There was no further discussion with him at that time? No, because the way the email was written was that he might need to speak with you. So I just wanted to let him know that there was an opening if he wanted to speak with me. And having a rough time, like the, the teacher indicated in her email on November 10th, having a rough time isn't necessarily something that raises red flags. Is that fair? I didn't have any other context as to what was going on. And I just wanted to offer a chance for the student to speak if he needed to do so. And his response, if you recall, was something along the lines of, okay, thanks, okay. And I'm not asking you to quote him because I don't know if you remember, but it, it was not an uncommon response. Does that make sense? Yeah, it was a normal response given the situation. You did not email James Crumbly or his wife about that November 10th email, correct? I did not email them. Or the November 11th brief meeting with their son? Correct. You did not forward that email to Mr. Crumbly or his wife? I did not. So then the next interaction that you had with Mr. Crumbly's son was on November 29th of 2021, and that was a Monday, if you recall? Yes, that would have been a Monday. You were forwarded another email that was sent to Nicholas Ejak and Pamela Fine, is that correct? Yes, I was. And this third email, this is the third email you've received from a teacher since the school year began, if you recall. Yes, it would have been. September of 21, November 10th of 2021, and now November 29th of 2021. The email advised that Mr. Crumbly's son was looking at bullets on his phone at the end of class. Uh, could I see the email? Yes. Exhibit 201. This is just the forward, so it doesn't have the actual email. You were advised that that was the concern, was that Mr. Crumbly's son was looking at bullets on his phone. I believe that to be true, but this email you have on the screen isn't the one that says that. Correct. The email doesn't say it, but you, you were aware that that's why the teacher was concerned Could and that's why the that teacher email? was emailing. I don't know if that's in the email. That email was displayed earlier, I think. It was sent to Mr. Ejac and Ms. Fine. That was the one. It's at Unless the bottom. It's, oh, there yeah, we go. There you. we go. Thank you. Yeah, so this is the email I was forward, forwarded. Um, and it just was at the end of the hour. The teacher didn't get a chance to really find out what was going on, but it just glanced at it um, and had seen that. And I'll leave that up in case you need to look at it. Thank you. So you were aware that on November 29th of 2021, at the time you received this forwarded email, that Mr. Crumbly's son was looking at bullets on his phone in class? Yes, after reading this email, I was aware. At some point, well, let me go in order. Shortly after this email, you then met with Mr. Crumbly's son and Pamela Fine. Yes. And you met in your office or Ms. Fine's office? It was in Ms. Fine's office. And 
you were there just as support, but Ms. Fine did most of the talking. Is that fair? Yes, I would say that was fair. And Ms. Fine talked to Mr. Crumbly's son about looking at bullets on his phone? She did. Um, she actually asked him to describe why would a teacher be contacting me right now. Um, and the student was forthcoming in what, what had happened in class. He was forthcoming. He was honest. To your knowledge, right? To our knowledge. He shared what we had in the email. He told you what class he was in looking at bullets. He said he was looking at bullets, and he even explained why he was looking at bullets, if you recall. He said that he and Mom had been at the shooting range over the weekend, and he was researching what they had done. And if you recall, Miss Fine acknowledged that what Mr. Crumbly's son was doing may not have been appropriate, but there really didn't seem a lot of concern. Would you, would you agree with that? Well, the concern was that it wasn't appropriate um, and that the concern was then placed by, expressed by placing a phone call home. So the concern was the appropriateness of the behavior in class? Yes. And at that point, a voicemail was left for Jennifer Crumbly? Yes. You said that, um, if you recall, Mr. Crumbly's son was understanding during the meeting. He didn't fight with you about it. He listened, and eventually he went back to class. Yes, I would agree with that. Later in the day, you received an email from the same teacher uh, who expressed that some of Mr. Crumbly's son's prior work may have been a little violent. No, that was in the same email. It's in the same email? It is. Or was it in an email sent later in the day? No, it's in the same email from that morning. It was up on the screen. It's at the bottom of the it. One from, the one that was originally sent to Mr. E. Jack and Ms. Fine? Yes. That was later forwarded to you? Yes. You didn't see any of those assignments prior to meeting with Mr. Crumbly's son? That is correct. If you have seen those assignments, it probably wouldn't have changed your approach to the meeting, correct? Because the approach was really more about the appropriateness of the behavior. Is that I fair? mean, it's a hypothetical of what we would have done. We acted on the information we had. And the, the information that you had was that he was looking at bullets in class? Yes. And looking at bullets is not necessarily something that is in itself concerning to you, correct? I think you're kind of trying to put it in like a pigeonhole. It was trying, to, we were trying to gain context of what was going on in the situation. Um, because a student looking at something on their phone at the end of the hour is different than a student brazenly doing it throughout the entirety of the class. But our conversation was, is this school appropriate or not? And in fact, it's, if you recall, your position is, was at the time, it wasn't necessarily concerning because he was honest about it. It seemed kind of a commonplace thing given the Oxford community and the gun, the gun culture in the Oxford community and things of that nature that you took into a factor. We took a lot of things into a factor, including the fact that we conversed of how it was not school appropriate. And that's why a phone call was placed home. As I just indicated, the Ashford area was and may still be a hunting community, if you know. Okay. I'm asking. People hunt who live at Oxford. In 2021, you would, you would classify it as a hunting community? I would say that there are people who are hunting, yes. Activities with guns were a common hobby in 2021, yeah. if you know? I mean, there were people who had guns as a hobby, yes. It was common for students to be interested in guns? I'm sure there are students who are interested in guns. And to go to the, the shooting range? Yes, students would go to the shooting range. So I'm just going to object to make sure that the witness is speaking with personal knowledge. It appears counsel is asking him to give general speculation. Well, if you know, if you know you're, you're not familiar with gun, uh, guns yourself, it sounds like. So just if you know. Okay. Um, students going to the shooting range isn't viewed as unusual or concerning in and of itself. Is that correct? I think that you're taking, that you've got to have context with all of these. Right, and I'm just asking, in and of itself, 
a student going to the gun range, the shooting range, is not concerning in and of itself? It depends on the context. Because the student weightlifting is not concerning in and of itself unless they're doing it inappropriately, right? So you're, you're taking something that's a broad statement that can have a wide context. And on November 29th of 2021, Mr. Crumbly's son told you and Ms. Fine that he'd gone to the shooting range with his mom the weekend before. Correct. That in itself is not concerning to you. He did it in a way that was appropriate. You would agree, and, I, and can you refresh, refresh my memory, how long were you in the Oxford School District as of 2021? Seven years. And in that seven years, you learned that many households had firearms in the household. Is that, would you agree with that? If you know. What is many? I, there are people More who own 10? guns. There are people who own guns. Okay. And you, as, as a counselor at the school, you were aware of that? Yes. It wasn't completely unheard of? No. It was also relevant when looking at the situation, it was also relevant for you to note the fact that Mr. Crumbly's son was not hiding that he was looking at the bullets or didn't hide it from you when he, when he spoke with you and Ms. Fine. Well, he didn't lie about what had happened. And that was important to you? Yes. As a result of the meeting with Ms. Fine, with you and Ms. Fine, Mr. Crumbly's son was not disciplined. To my knowledge, no. There was a phone call placed to his mother, which we've talked about. There was a voicemail left. You did not yourself call Mr. Crumbly. I did not. You did not forward him the emails that you received. I did not. You don't know if that voicemail um, was ever shared with Mr. Crumbly. Is that fair? Well, we talked about it in our meeting the next day. Okay. On the 29th, you don't know if Mr. Crumbly was ever made aware. I would have no way of knowing that. No. Right. You wouldn't know. You responded to the situation of Mr. Crumbly's son looking at bullets on November 29th on his phone with the information that you had. I did. And from what you knew at the time, other than the behavior being inappropriate for school, you didn't see anything else that might have been concerning. Well, and I want to make clear, I wouldn't be the one doing discipline in this situation. So... And I'm asking, and let me clarify, I'm just asking from a counselor's perspective. I'm not asking for discipline. You clarified that Mr. Eject did discipline. And Ms. Okay. Fine. So could you repeat your question, please? Yes. As a counselor, on November 29th of 2021, you didn't see anything um, overly concerning about what we've just talked about with looking at bullets on the phone, that the focus was more that looking at bullets on his phone was inappropriate for school. So are you asking from a mental health standpoint, did I see anything concerning? Not really. Um, I don't know that, that you're a mental health professional. I mean, you're a school counselor, and you do have some training sure. and education in that. I'm not asking for you to go anywhere outside of your education and experience. Just as a high school counselor, sitting in Ms. Fine's office, with the information that you had, you didn't see a bunch of red flags. We've talked about, and let me ask, let me give you some, mm -hmm. let me go over it a little bit. You've discussed that you know that there are households in Oxford that have firearms in them, right? Yes, there are. You know that people in Oxford hunt. Some do, yes. You know that students are interested in guns. Some can be, yes. <laughs> you know that students look at bullets. We had one student who did that in that situation, yes. You know that that student, um, Mr. Crumbly's son, was honest about looking at the bullets when he was asked about it? To the extent of our knowledge, yes, he was. He told you that he'd gone to the shooting range with his mom? Yes. The weekend before? <laughs> yes. That... Those things were not concerning to you. Taking those things in a vacuum is why we called home. And That's why Ms. Fine called home. And she said, we had this meeting. We told him it's not appropriate. He understands. No need to call back unless you have questions, right? I don't remember the exact voicemail that was left. The voicemail was not, we need you to come to school right now. To my memory, it was not. But again, I don't remember the exact voicemail that was left. On November 30th of 2021, you received another email. It's this one, Exhibit 202, which um, was from another teacher who was talking about 
uh, Mr. Crumbly's son looking at a, a video of a guy gunning people down. Correct? Yeah, so this teacher was a co-teacher in that same first hour class. From the day before? Yes. Okay. You reviewed that email on November 30th of 2021? I did. You made the decision to... You didn't. I think you said you didn't see it for about 20 or 30 minutes. I didn't. I was on the phone, and I actually responded to it while I was on the phone. Um, and then upon ending that conversation, was going to go meet with the student. And this is the fourth email that you've received about Mr. Crumbly's son since the beginning of the 2021 school year. Yes. The third email in two days. Uh, is it? You would have received the... I think it's the second in two days. The November 29th email about the bullets, and then you do you recall receiving a follow-up email later that day? It was a confirmation of that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so this is the second one with additional information. Okay. The second one on a different a different issue. Is that yes. fair? Yes. Okay. Yes. The teacher described the video as a movie scene, but not a real event. Yeah, she said it looks like it's a movie scene and not security footage slash a real event. She expressed some concern based on quote some of his other behaviors. Yeah, but definitely still concerning when taking into account some of his other behaviors, yes. You did not forward this email to Mr. Crumbly after you received it. Well, no, but over an hour later, I called him into the school. Right. And you decided after receiving this email that you were going to meet with Mr. Crumbly's son. Yes. Approximately an hour after receiving this email, Mr. Ejack advised you of another report made by a teacher about Mr. Crumbly's son. Yes, as I was about to go and um, call down his son, Mr. Ejack actually came into my office with information about the math assignment. And that there were some concerning comments and markings on the math assignment. I didn't have any context about the math assignment. I just knew there was something, something about it. At that point, you hadn't seen it. You were just I going know. off of what you were being told. Is that fair? That is fair. Okay. So you went to Mr. Crumbly's son's classroom? I did. You, you called him out of class? I walked to his classroom. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, when I called out, I meant like at his classroom, you went and got him. Yes. Okay. Um, while you were there, you also obtained a copy of the worksheet that we've seen. I did. And that would have been what I call the modified worksheet. That would be the one that had the things scratched out and the words added that you identified and things like that. Yes. Okay. You and Mr. Crumbly's son went back to your office where Nicholas Ejack was, was waiting in your office, if you recall. Yes, that is correct. It was at that point or shortly thereafter that you called Mr. Crumbly's wife? Approximately 20 minutes into our meeting, yes. So you met with, with Mr. Crumbly's son for about 20 minutes? Yes. It was during that meeting that Mr. Crumbly's son told you about um, his family member passing away. He did. About his dog passing away. Yes. About his friend moving away. Yes. He talked about COVID being hard on him. Yes. He had a hard time with virtual school, if you remember. He did say that, yes. And um, you asked about the drawings and the markings and, and the things on the assignment that you had in front of you. Yes, I asked him to clarify what was going on in the assignment, but I also talked about the email I had received and I had also talked about in context of the conversation we had yesterday. Okay. So some of the meeting was about inappropriate behavior. Is that fair? It started off with a conversation about that um, because I didn't know what was on the phone. Um, so I asked him what he was watching. Okay. Um, and then we talked about, look, we just had a conversation yesterday about appropriate behavior in class. This feels like the same thing that we're dealing with here. Um, and after we had talked about that for a few minutes, I brought the math sheet out and asked him to start explaining to me what was on there. And when the prosecutor was asking you questions, you said initially when you got that email around 8, well, around 8.30 when you saw the email um, from the teacher, initially you were frustrated. In fact, you used the word frustrated. I was frustrated. And yes. it was kind of like, we just talked about this yesterday. Is that, does that kind of explain what, what you were feeling at the time? Yes, I would say that it was. we just had a conversation about this. Why am I hearing about something similar again? So 
you talked a little bit about that, and then you, you talked about the homework, or the, I'm sorry, the math assignment or the math paper that we saw, and you asked for some more context about what was on the paper. Well, initially I asked him to just describe what was on the paper, and he started talking about how it was a video game, um, that he liked designing them, liked drawing them. And then I asked for him to explain the words on it, because I didn't feel those were as easily explained by simply stating, well, it's a video game. And in fact, you said that you didn't want to give context to his words. You didn't want to assume what he meant. You wanted to hear from him what those words meant. Yes. And he gave context. He did. His, that's when his demeanor changed from kind of being like, what do I have to say to get out of here and just not get in trouble, to I, like he became sad. And you, you expressed, you used the word appropriate to describe his level of sadness based on what he was telling you. The way he was acting matched what he was saying. It, it's... To me, it's sad if a, a family dog dies or a family pet dies. It's sad if a relative dies or a friend moves away. So his, his demeanor matched what he was saying. And again, in and of itself, being sad is something that you talked about, you saw an increase of after COVID in your students. Do you recall that? Yes, And that. Did. And that that was not again in and of itself. And I'm and I'm not asking you to. I'm not I'm not trying to trick you by asking these questions. Um, I'm not trying to to give meaning to something that isn't there. I'm asking you based on the information that you had at the time. You felt that his his sadness was an appropriate level of sadness, not overly concerning. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but the sadness itself was not necessarily overly concerning beyond wanting him to talk with someone. Appropriate and concerning are two different things. Okay. When I say appropriate, I mean it matched with what he was saying. Something can be an appropriate response, but also be heavily concerning, right? Like, I don't know a good example off the top of my head, but what I'm saying is his demeanor matched with what he was saying, but to me it was concerning, which right. is why I called parents. Right, exactly why you called parents. So if he had been sitting in front of you and talked about these losses and it was kind of like, yeah, it's no big deal, it's not a big deal, that could also be concerning. It would be a different type of concern, okay. yes. If he said, um, I, I lost the top to my pen and was crumbling in pieces and falling into a puddle of tears on your floor, that would be concerning, but for different reasons. It, it would be memorable okay. concerning, yes. So the losses that he experienced you agree, I think we can all agree, we're significant. I think when taken in totality, yeah, yeah. And he was showing you that he was sad. Yes. He was also expressing during this meeting that he had concerns about missing class, if you recall. He did, uh, especially as after um, classes changed, which is a normal thing. Um, he expressed that he was worried about missing his chemistry class which was his next class after the math class. Um, so during that time, Mr. Ejack went and retrieved his belongings and went to go get homework for his chemistry class. And I'm going to go over that in just a second, too. But um, if you recall, and I don't know if you, you pay close attention to your students' attendance, but if you recall, Mr. Crumpley's son had pretty good attendance. He did. He didn't miss school a lot. No, he did not. He, if you recall, his grades weren't great. No, but he was on track for graduation. He was passing. Oh, I believe he was failing one class at the time, and it was not by much. So he was close to passing all of, at all of his classes. One of them he was failing, but close to passing. Yes. So his attendance and his grades obviously were not overly concerning to you. I wouldn't say overly concerning, but a student who cares about class and, and wants to, you know, he had expressed an argument the night before, um, and, and wanted to go to class, had expressed, you know, frustration of missing school during COVID and, and just that entirety. So it, it wasn't strange at that point to have a student not want to miss class. Right. That wasn't odd to you at all, given his history. Now, if he were somebody who missed school all the time and was failing all his classes, he's like, I really want to be in school. I really want to do my homework. You might feel a little differently. Is that fair? I would say it was in line based with the information I had. Okay. 
And you said that after Mr. Crumbly's son expressed these concerns about missing class, that Mr. Ejack went to his was it first hour class to get the backpack? It would have been in his second hour class where his belongings were, yes. So he went, uh, Mr. Ejack went to his second hour class to get his belongings and brought his belongings back to your office? Yes, this would have been after we had confirmed parents were coming, um, probably a, a little after 10 a.m. He, if you recall, began working on schoolwork, waiting for his parents to get there. That is, that is my recollection, yes. Also, if you remember, while you were waiting for his parents, you also began watching some videos with him? Yep, so he had expressed different things he wanted to do after high school, um, and he had expressed wanting to go into video game design. I know that when students are waiting for parents, it can be high anxiety time for them. So I wanted to try and engage him as best as I could. So we actually watched videos from the uh, OTEC, the Technical Center campus, where they had programs that were centered around what he wanted to do. Um, so we talked about what it would look like uh, to do an application for them, because he was a sophomore and he would be able to apply for the next school year. Um, and so I did that, one, to, to kind of just bridge that time that could be high anxiety, and two, if you have any inkling that a student may potentially be displaying any signs of, of suicide or suicidal ideation, getting a gauge of future plans is crucial. So I wanted to get that gauge as well. And he did that, and he, he picked out some videos to watch, is that fair? And, and you picked some out? Yeah. You also asked him during that time if he was a threat to himself or anyone else? I asked him that earlier. And that is part of your assessment of the situation, is that fair? Well, it was a question I felt needed to be asked based on what I had. And based on your education, your experience, and your training, you know that that's an important question to ask. In that situation, yes. And he, he basically said, I know this looks bad, but I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, it, it wasn't said as flippantly, but it was, he understood, like, I can see why this looks bad. I'm not going to do anything. Okay. So... Although you had concerns, you also had the student in front of you reassuring you that he was not going to hurt himself or anyone else. Based on what he told me, yes. Mr. Crumbly and his wife arrived at approximately 10.30. I think that there's a, there was some time lag between them getting to the school and, and actually getting into your office of about 10 minutes, if you recall. Okay, I, I don't know when they arrived at the school. I know when they arrived to my office. Their son was in your office when they got there? Yes. Mr. Ejack came into the office after Mr. Crumley and his wife came into your office? Yes. Because okay. at some point he left while you were sitting with Mr. Crumley's son? He left once we had confirmed that parents were coming. Mr. Ejack comes back in. When Mr. Crumley and his wife walk in, Mr. Uh, I just want to lay the, the room out a little bit. So there's your desk. You're on one side. On the other side was Mr. Crumley's son? Yes. There was a second chair in front of your desk? Yes. Mr. Crumbly sat in the second chair next to his son. Yes. And then Mrs. Crumbly sat in a third chair that was available in uh, kind of, was it behind Mr. Crumbly a little bit? So there were two across from my desk, and then there was one that was kind of off on a corner, um, okay. and that's where she sat. Your office was not the size of this room, is that fair? Yeah, that is fair. Okay. Um, Fairly small? It, it's not small. It's, it's a decent-sized office, but it had space where there were two seats across from me, one seat kind of on the kitty corner, a door, um, and then some space kind of off to what would have been my right as I was sitting in my office. And Mr. Ejack would have been kind of off to your right, is that fair? Yes. Okay, so he wasn't sitting in one of the three or, or four chairs with your, with your chair. He was kind of off to the side. That is correct. You testified with the, when the prosecutor was asking you questions that while you were talking with Mrs. Crumbly, that you recall Mr. Crumbly was interacting with his son. I do. Um, you said that Mr. Crumbly looked at the math assignment, the modified math assignment, because that's the one that you had, that he looked at the modified math assignment with his son. That is correct. They looked at it together and that he, he showed concern for his son. 
Yeah, uh, it it felt like he was interacting with his son, and that he he mentioned some things that were available for his son. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, you felt that Mr. Crumbly's interactions with his son, that he was showing the appropriate level of care and, and caring for him at that point in your office. Yes, I, I'm a, on the surface level, yes. yes. You confirmed um, that Mr. Crumbly's son had gone to the shooting range the weekend before. I did. You confirmed that he had those, those losses. He lost a family member, his... Uh, family dog and a friend had moved away that he experienced all those things in the year of 2021. I also asked that, and he had mentioned the argument the night before as well. And they told you about the argument? They, they confirmed that it, there had been a disagreement. Yes. It's not uncommon for 15 year olds to argue with their parents, is that fair? In, in a surface level statement, yes, that can happen. Um, Mrs. Crumbly also confirmed that her son had struggled with virtual school during COVID. She did. And that confirms what Mr. Crumbly's son had also told you about not, not liking virtual school. Yes. You told Mr. Crumbly and his wife that, well, let me back up a little bit. You told the prosecutor that your hope was that Mr. Crumbly and his wife would take their son out of school, either get them, get him to see someone to talk to or to go have a really fun day. My words to them were I'd like him to to get help as soon as possible, today if possible. And so you expressed to them that you wanted him to get help as soon as possible, today if possible. Yes. And Mrs. Crumbly said, we can't do today, we have to go back to work. Yes. They assured you though, or at least you felt assured that they were going to get him help. They, they were, they were not against it, and they made it seem as if there would be something that they would be willing to do. Okay. So you handed these three sheets of paper to one of them. They didn't toss it in the garbage, right? Not in front of me, no. Right. They didn't scoff about it and say, we're not doing this. They took the paper. Right. So you had no reason to believe that they weren't going to get their help, either at some point, get their son help, either some point that day or as soon as possible. Based on the conversation, no, but that's also why I planned the follow-up meeting with the student the next day was to ensure that there was some movement. And you planned the follow-up meeting kind of in, in, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but you kind of planned that in your head, like this is my next step. Yes. Okay. You didn't express that during the meeting? No. In the meeting, you expressed that you were going to follow up in about 48 hours. Well, because when mom said that today wasn't an option, I said 48 hours then, I'll be following up. Okay. So in your mind, you had some kind of timing that you were going to follow up to make sure that things were being followed through on. Obviously, we know that that, that first check-in point didn't come. Um, but you told them within 48 hours you wanted something done by the next morning. And based on your meeting, you didn't have any reason to think that Mr. Crumbly or his wife were not going to follow up. I would agree. Essentially, you wanted to ensure, and, and I believe that you expressed this to Mr. Crumbly and his wife, wanted to ensure that their son's situation and his sadness didn't get worse. Right. I wanted to ensure that we had something that, if left unchecked, could get worse. Right. So, sitting in the meeting, you weren't concerned necessarily that that day, or even by the next morning, that their son was going to harm himself. Based on what he had told me, I did not believe him to be actively harming himself, no. Or anyone else? Based on what he had told me, no. Mr. Crumbly's son expressed that he wanted to stay in school. He did. He wanted to stay in school for some of the reasons we've discussed. He didn't like virtual school. He wanted to make sure he could stay up with school. He didn't want to miss class. These are some of the reasons that he gave you. Yes, those were, those were some of the reasons. He, he really just said that I, I struggled with virtual school. I want to make sure I'm staying on top of what I have to do. And that wasn't concerning to you, that he wanted to stay in school? No. Obviously, it's not concerning, right? 
in, in that situation? No, I, it's it's not. But it, given the context of what I was hoping, I, you take the kids' desires into consideration. But at the end of the day, you you want a team making that decision. And if you recall, you had just had two virtual days of school, I think the week before. Yes, leading up to Thanksgiving, uh, we did have days that were virtual. And we talked about this a little while ago. To your knowledge, if you recall, and if you don't, just please tell me, he'd only missed one day of school that school year. I, I know he had good attendance. I don't remember the exact days. With... Mrs. Crumbly expressing that she and Mr. Crumbly had to return to work that day, and Mr. Crumbly's son expressing a desire to stay in school, you felt that it was okay for Mr. Crumbly's son to remain in school? I felt that I was not given full options at that point, because really what I was left trying to decide between was I had parents saying they have to return to work. I have a student that I don't want left alone. Um... And so that's when I asked Mr. Ejack, is there anything from a discipline standpoint, is there any reason he can't stay in school? Is there anything you need to do? Um, and then I made the decision, I, I made a judgment call based on what I, I had, is I didn't want a student potentially home alone. So based on the information that you had, you decided that it was okay for him to remain in school? I decided that that was the best decision I thought I could make any information. Okay. Based on that meeting, Mr. Crumbly's son, to your knowledge, was not contemplating suicide. You said that he had suicidal ideation, but that ideations, but that's different than being actively suicidal. It is. Uh, the student stated that he was not. He was not actively suicidal. You knew that he had been to the gun range with his mom the weekend prior. Yes. You knew at a minimum that he had access to a firearm the weekend before because he went to the gun range. I knew that he had been to a gun range and had used a firearm at a gun range, yes. You did not ask him on November 30th of 2021 if he had access to a firearm. I did not. You had no reason to look into whether or not he had access to a firearm. Would you agree with that? Based on the information that you had. It's easy to go in hindsight on a lot of things. Um, based on what my concerns were, I was concerned about student well-being. And again, you said it's easy to go in hindsight. So we know what happened within a couple hours of this meeting. Sure. We all in this courtroom know what happened. It's easy for us to look back and say that different decisions could have been made, right? I made the decisions I made based on the information I had. At the time? At the time. You don't have the benefit of hindsight at 10.40 or 10.50 a.m. on November 30th of 2021. Is that fair? I had 90 minutes of information. You suggested that his parents find a therapist for him to talk to or evaluate him. I did. You have had experience with parents who have refused to provide mental health treatment to their child. Is that, is that accurate? Do you recall that? Off the top of my head, I'm not recalling a specific instance of that. If it occurred, do you remember uh, testifying previously about that? I, I don't, know. Okay. Would reviewing your testimony on that help to refresh your recollection? If we want to bring it up, sure. May I approach your honor? Sure. Thank you. We would like to read the highlighted portions of Mr. Humphreys. Thank you. You can just read that to yourself and let us know if it refreshes your recollection. All right. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, so I, I've asked, um, like, if it's occurred, and I say it's not overly common, but I'm sure it does happen. Um, but... I'm giving a for instance of what we would do in that type of situation if it were to happen. Mayor Procher. Sure. Thank you. So reviewing, based on what you just said, reviewing the transcript has helped to refresh your recollection. Well, what I'm stating in the transcript is in a situation where that could happen, that what we would do is involve CPS and make sure that the student is receiving ordinary care. 
In fact, the question was... You told the jury that CPS was... Child Protective Services would be involved if that situation were to occur. In yeah. fact, the, the question was, thank you, okay, had you ever dealt with a kid at school who you felt needed psychiatric care and yet the parents didn't provide it in some fashion or another? Your answer was, yes, that had occurred. And then I go on to explain what would happen in that type of situation. Right. You said it's not a really common, it does happen. If it did happen, this is what we would do. Correct? Correct. And I know I've asked this a couple of times, but you didn't have any reason to believe on November 30th of 2021 that James Crumbly or his wife were not going to follow through and obtain a therapist for their child to talk to. I didn't have enough time to know if that would happen or not. Um, given our context of our conversation, no, I didn't have reason to believe that at that time. If you recall, the meeting with Mr. Crumbly and his wife and their son concluded at approximately 10.50 in the morning? That sounds about right, yes. Um, their son left the room first, if you recall, and went back to class? Yes. The shooting occurred at approximately, began at approximately 12.51 p.m. that day. Okay. After you heard that there was a shooter at the school, you did not immediately suspect that it was Mr. Crumbly's son, if you remember. I did not. In fact, you didn't suspect that it was Mr. Crumbly's son until you looked into his attendance after the shooting. Correct. This is also after Mr. Crumbly's son had already been arrested. Quite a bit after this. I'm going to talk about just a few things. Just go back to your direct testimony with the prosecutor. You said that calling a parent in is a high level of concern. Yes. And that could be a concern for appropriate behavior. It could be, yes. It could be a concern for the student's well-being. It could be. It could be a concern that the student needs immediate care or help. Yes. It could be for any number of reasons. A high level of concern is dependent on the situation. Is that fair? Yes, I would agree. Your concern with going to... Mr. Crumbly's son's class on November 30th of 2021 is you specifically mentioned that you went because it's it doesn't raise it doesn't basically raise concern or, or red flags if a counselor goes down to get a student out of class. Yes, that is true. Um, and I had very little information at that point as to what was going on. So I wanted to to make sure to do it. And I knew that the dean wanted me involved in a conversation. Um, so I knew that student support was at least a potential plan at that point. When you were discussing, you said that um, you told Mr. Crumbly's son while you were meeting with him before his parents got there that you wanted his parents to get him help. Do you remember discussing that with the prosecution? I do. Okay. At that time, Mr. Crumbly's son didn't say, thank goodness, I've been begging my parents for help and they haven't given it to me. I'm not sure many students would. He didn't say, um, I'm glad you're going to ask them because I've asked them and they didn't listen. He did not say that, no. He didn't say, I, I really need this and I'm really glad that you're, that you're doing this for me. He did not. He didn't say any of that. No, which also would not be, it, it's not uncommon for students to not have a big response to something like that. If he had said any of those things, obviously your reaction would be different when Mr. Crumbly and his wife got to the school. It would be different information that I did not have, yes. And when Mr. Crumbly and his wife were at the school, they also didn't say anything about, or Mr. Crumbly didn't say anything specifically about, um, wow, Son, you, you, you really did need some help. You've been asking me for it, right? No. The discussion was simply looking at the math assignment, the modified math assignment, and then Mr. Crumbly expressing to his son, you know you have people to talk to, right? That was a piece of it over the 10 minutes, yes. That, um, that they've talked. Mr. Crumbly and his son have yep. spoken. He did, he did say that they talked. 
when discussing the impact of Mr. Crumbly's son's friend leaving, you don't know that Mr. Crumbly's son had ever expressed how significant that impact was on him. Is that I, fair? Until had, sitting in your office. I had very little context, even when he was in my office, over what that was. All I knew was that a friend had left recently, had moved, and that was hard. You indicated on your direct testimony with Mr. with Mr. Keese that Mr. Crumbly mentioned you have people you can talk to, we talk, um, and then mentioned something. Your testimony was that that his son mentioned something about a journal, or I'm sorry, that Mr. Crumbly mentioned something about a journal. Mr. Crumbly's statement to to my recollection was. You have your counselor, you have your journal, we talk. Okay. Mr. Crumley didn't say, your journal, you know the one that's in your backpack? No. He didn't say the one that you always keep with you? No. He didn't say a color? No. He didn't describe it at all? No. So, to your knowledge, based on that conversation, you can't say that Mr. Crumley's son knew what his son's journal would look like if he had a journal? Based on that conversation? I, I, no. I had no knowledge beyond that there was an existence of some sort of journey. One moment, Ron. Mr. Hopkins, you made decisions on November 30th of 2021 based on your education, your training, and your experience, correct? That was a piece of it. Also based on the information that you had in front of you? That was a majority of it. Which included four emails from teachers in approximately two months regarding Mr. Crumbly's son? That was a part of it, yes. Concerns that those teachers had raised? Yes, that was a part of it. Much of which you did not share with Mr. Crumbly prior to that November 30th meeting. Is that fair? Correct. It was shared during the meeting. Based on all of these things, you did not believe that Mr. Crumbly's son was an immediate danger to himself? I did not believe that, no. Nor did you believe that he was a danger to anyone else? Based on the information I had, no. I have no further questions. Thank you. Mr. Hopkins, it appears that information and context would be important to you in these kinds of meetings. Yes, it would. Okay. Now, did James Crumbly tell you that November 30th wasn't the first time that his son asked for help? No. Did James Crumbly tell you that his son asked for help in April of 2021? No. Did James Crumbly tell you that, despite that, never once was an appointment with a medical health provider set up? No. Did James Crumbly ever tell you that, as early as June of 2021, his son had obtained his own firearm? No. Did James Crumbly tell you that his son had been begging for a 9mm firearm? No. Did his son, did James Crumley tell you that his son actually sent him a screenshot of a 9mm for sale a few weeks before the meeting? No. <clears throat> did James Crumley tell you that his son actually obtained a 9mm just four days before this meeting? No. Did James Crumley tell you that the 9mm he obtained looked identical to the 9mm that he drew right here on this picture? No. Did James Crumley tell you that he worked for DoorDash, he hadn't begun work that day and he could have taken his son home? No. Did he tell you that when his son was talking about his friend leaving, it was actually his only friend? No. So you took what you learned from the defendant's son, you described those losses he felt as significant? I did. And that's without knowing all of that information? Yes. You mentioned that you would hope that a decision about a student would be made by a team. I did. Who's on the team? The student, the parents, and any caring adult with the school. And did either James or Jennifer Crumbly share any information with you? They did not. Had they of, what would you have done? Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. She, was, she asked the same question on cross. Did you ask that question? She asked, what would you have done? talking about calling CPS and such. I know, actually, that was related to if they had... She asked if, he had, if they had not obtained uh, 
treatment for their son the yes. by the following day or within 48 if hours. If they had they refused, treatment. actually, if they had refused to obtain mental health treatment, what would he have done? Not. I'll rephrase, Judge. That's fine. Mr. Hopkins, you testified earlier that your plan was to call Child Protective Services within 48 hours? Yes. And they, that's based upon just the information that you learned from the defendant's son? It is. Would this meeting have ended differently had you known all the other information that we just went through? Objection, Your Honor. Speculation. I think it does call for speculation. I believe he can offer a definitive answer here, Judge. A definitive answer about uh, what would have happened if they had not um, contacted a therapist. Is that true? No, Your Honor. He's asking about a definitive answer for what Mr. Hopkins would have done if there had been additional information. And, Your Honor, can we approach? Because I. Can we approach, please? Okay, can we turn off the eye? All right, looks like mics are down. Both attorneys are approaching the bench to have a discussion with the judge. You've been watching the James Crumbly trial live. Um, this is going on right now at the Oakland County Courthouse in Pontiac. Um, you just heard from Sean Hopkins. He's the Oxford High School counselor that met with the Crumblies following the violent images that were drawn on his worksheet. We've heard from him before in the Jennifer Crumbly trial where he also testified. He mentioned that he was taken back by the fact that um, they showed up, but they weren't willing to take their son home to get help at that point. Um, they had to go back to work. So they decided, and the shooter actually um, wanted to return to class, which wasn't cross -examination even a concern to come at that time. You Looks didn't like ask we got the mics shooter back on November 30th we'll if he had access to a gun. Do you remember that? I do. And your response was what? I did not. Okay, and did you have reason to ask him about that? At that time, I didn't feel I did. And you were, you were asked about the shooter's recitation of what happened at the shooting range with his mother? I, are you stating I asked that? No, you were asked that. Oh, you, by Cross. Okay, so you okay. learned on November the 29th and November the 30th that the defendant's son went to a shooting range with his mother that prior weekend. I did. Did James Kremley tell you that the shooter actually shot his new gun? No. Thank you. I have nothing further. You can step down and get excuse. All right, for the jury. Traveling in, so I want to make sure it's, it's, okay. it's here. All right, so about 10 minutes. That'd be fine, John.
Good morning, Detroit. You've been watching the James Crumbly Trial live. You just heard from Sean Hopkins. He was the Oxford High School counselor that was there that met with both the Crumbly parents and the shooter um, prior to um, things taking place. He mentioned he was a little bit taken back by the fact that they were unwilling to take their son home to get help. He did say that he was going to follow up with them within 48 hours um, to make sure that he got that help. But inevitably, we know what happened after that. Uh, the court took a quick break. So so are we. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Of the students who are not in the early college program. Welcome back to Live Now in Detroit. I am your host, Bree Teamer. You've been watching a live coverage of the James Crumbly trial. Some interesting things to note here. Right now we're listening to Sean Hopkins, which was the Oxford High School counselor at the time. Right now he's currently on a leave. But two days before the shooting, a teacher actually emailed Sean Hopkins to let him know the shooter was researching bullets on his phone. Um, he said it's not uncommon for Oxford residents to be interested in guns because Oxford is a community where people enjoy hunting and things like that. So it wasn't really unusual um, to him that he was researching that. Here is a full replay of his testimony this morning. Let's check it out. Of the students who are not in the early college program, they were divided out alphabetically. Okay. Um, amongst their counselors. Was James Crumbly's son one of the students assigned to your caseload in November 2021? Yes. Is James Crumbly in court today? Yes, he is. Could you please point please to him and describe something he's wearing today? He is yeah, this sitting is at right this now. table wearing a suit yeah. coat with a blue tie. Oh, uh, Your Honor, the record re reflect identification no, of the defendant? The record would reflect yeah. the in-court identification of the defendant, James Crumbly. Sir, when is the first time that you would have interacted with James Crumbly's son? The first time that I likely interacted with him would have been scheduling during his freshman year. Okay, yeah. so for context, November of 2021, he was a sophomore, is that right? That is correct. Okay, so this would have been August or September of 2020? No, um, 
When students are in eighth grade, they're scheduled at the middle school level. Okay. I may or may not have been in his classroom because it's divided out within their eighth grade classrooms. And we're not really, we don't know the students at all at that point. Okay. I would have done scheduling with him during his freshman year, approximately February of 2021. February of 21. Yes. Okay. Those meetings were done virtually and were not in depth and were only to discuss their next year's schedule. Do you remember anything about that meeting? If you I don't it? remember that meeting in particular. Right. No. Well, I'm going to show you. First of all, if you recall, when is the next time that you had any interaction with the defendant's son? I don't recall this particular meeting, but I know that there was a phone call in spring of 2021 okay. um, from a teacher to me. And then I called into the student's classroom to meet with the student. Okay. I do not remember that meeting. All right, I'm going to show you what's been admitted as Exhibit 198. This is an email, May 13, 2021, 146 in the afternoon. Without telling us that person's name, who was that person who sent you the email? Without telling... Well, who, does, does she work there at Oxford High School? She was an English teacher English at Oxford teacher. High School. Okay. And the email is, hi, when you get a chance, can you call the defendant's son down and see how he's doing? He is failing my class and tries to sleep all the time. In class, thanks. That's Exhibit 198, May 13, 2021. You received this email? Yes, I did. Okay. And the response from you at 2.07 p.m. is, I'll catch him before the end of the day. And then her response at 2.08 was, thanks, just a little worried. Okay, did you have any interaction with the defendant's son because of this email? I have, um, through phone records, I called into a student's classroom and called him down to my office. I okay. don't remember that particular meeting. Okay. But at least your recollection is that you would have had that meeting. The evidence from everything suggests that I had that meeting. Sure, that's fair. Did you contact either James or Jennifer Crumbly then? I did not. Okay. And why or why not? It was a check-in, um, and it didn't raise to the level of concern where I would contact the parent. Now, as a counselor with Oxford High School, do you have a sort of method or protocol for when you determine when to contact a parent? There isn't a set, like, there isn't always a set level of when you do it, but when something becomes repeated or when something becomes more concerning, um, I am going to then involve a parent. Okay. Are grades available to parents on a district-wide basis? Yes, they are. They are available through a system called PowerSchool, which is available online. Okay, and that's a system that a parent can log in daily if they would choose to? As often as they would like. Now, the next interaction you had with the defendant's son would be September 2021? I did not actually have an interaction with the defendant's son. Um, I received information about the defendant's son. Okay, I'm showing you Exhibit 199. This is an email from a different teacher to you, September 8, 2021? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and why don't you go ahead and read um, the email here that you received. Hi, Sean. Could you please touch base with student? In his autobiography poem, he said that he feels terrible and that his family is a mistake. Unusual responses for sure. Okay, that is September the 8th, 2021. Do you recall any interaction with the defendant's son at that point? I do not. Okay. Now, do you recall any meetings, check-ins, or phone calls from September to November of 2008, or 2021? No, so to give context on this, what I did was have a conversation with the teacher um, to gain a little more context of what was meant by the email. And then the teacher filled me in that the student was actually joking with others in the class um, and that it was not at the level of concern that she had believed when she sent the email. Okay, so if I'm correct, then you received the email, then you made contact with the teacher who sent you the email? Yes. Okay, and then the determination was made that no further involvement was required? Correct. Okay. I'm going to show you what's... Oh, this is your response. Thanks for the heads up. I'm in senior meetings throughout the day, but we'll try and catch up with him. That was to the same teacher, September 8, 2021, 9-15? Yes, that is correct. 
This is People's Exhibit 200. This is November the 10th, 2021. Um, the same teacher emailed you. Hi, Sean. The defendant's son is having a rough time right now. He might need to speak with you. Do you recall that email? I do. Okay. And tell us what you did when you received that email. I, I checked in with the student um, in the hallway in between classes to just let them know that if they were having a hard time, that I was available to talk to you. And uh, here's your response at 4.44 p.m. I'm sorry, I was in a meeting through the end of the day. I'll catch up with them. Yes. So you recall that interaction with the defendant's son? Yes. Okay, tell us about that, please. It was in between classes. Um, I believe the morning after I had responded to this email. Um, and I just spoke to him briefly in passing to let him know that if he needed to talk, um, for any reason that I would make myself available for him. Okay. Did you make a decision to contact a, a parent at that point? I did not. Okay. You did not contact a parent? I did not contact a parent. And tell us why, please. Because I wanted to gain any information from the student and allow the student the opportunity um, to talk. Being sad isn't unusual, um, but if I had no information other than the student is sad, uh, it's not something I would call a parent over. Okay. Now, when's the next time you've had any interaction with the defendant's son? November 29th. All right, I'm going to show you what's been meant as People's 201. This is an email um, from a teacher to uh, Mr. Ejack and Ms. Fine, and you eventually were CC'd on this email? I was forwarded this email, okay. yes. And the email says, good morning, I had a student during first hour today, the defendant's son, who was on his phone looking at different bullets at the end of first hour today as I was walking around the room passing out their essays. I didn't get a chance to investigate it a bit further since it was the end of the hour. Now that he's on my radar, I'm also noticing some of his previous work that he's completed from earlier in the year leans a bit toward the violent side. I can bring down these things later today during my fifth hour prep if you would like them. And then it was forwarded to you at 9.34 a.m.? Yes, it was. Okay. And then your response was, thanks, Jacqueline, I'll be touching base with him as well. Yes. Okay, and tell us what happened with this, please. Um, I ended up going down to Ms. Fine's office, who was on the initial email. So who's Ms. Fine? She was our restorative practices coordinator okay. at that time. Um, and she called the student down to her office uh, to chat about the email that had been sent. Were you present for that meeting? I was present for that meeting. Okay, tell us about that, please. Uh, the student came down towards the end of the second class of the day, um, and Ms. Fine led the meeting. Um, I was there to be a support for the student in case it became a disciplinary issue, um, but it was very cordial. Uh, we say support for the student in case it became a disciplinary issue. That's not for you to discipline, correct? That is correct. I would be there just as somebody who's able to be a comfort to the student okay. um, during a time where they may potentially be experiencing discipline. Now, at that point, was everybody wearing a COVID face mask? Yes, they were. And in fact, had you ever interacted with the defendant's son without a COVID face mask? No, I did not. So you said Ms. Fine led the meeting? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yes, Ms. Fine did lead the meeting. Um, she had a conversation with the student about the email that was received um, and, and led it in a way to see if the student would, would bring any information available um, based on what the email was received, where she asked him, were you looking at anything in class? Were you looking, like, what teacher were you looking at um, this information in class to see if he would acknowledge that it was Ms. Kavina who sent the email. He did, he was compliant during that meeting. Um, and the conversation centered around how it was not school appropriate. Um, the student understood, or at least stated he understood, um, and was returned to class. A uh, phone call was then placed to the student's mom from Ms. Fine. Okay, and we heard that. Uh last week during the trial. That was from Miss Fine to Jennifer Crumbly? That is correct. Okay. And um, was that a voicemail that was left? It was left as a voicemail, yes. Did the defendant's son indicate that he had 
received a gun for Christmas a few days before? No. So what happened next? And in terms of that meeting? Yes. The meeting was over. He returned to class. How long was the meeting? Five to ten minutes. Okay. Now, in the realm of either discipline or your role as a counselor, what does it take to move from a check-in to a phone call home? It can be subjective. Oftentimes it would be if there's information we feel that is necessary for parents to know. Um, somewhere it's obvious as if you feel the student may be a threat to himself or if there's any potential that that could be a possibility. Um, if you have concerning information that the student has shared. Um, or it could just be simply to confirm what a student has said is true. Okay. So that's a phone call home. What does it take to actually call the parents in for a meeting immediately? I would have to have a high level of concern that needed parental involvement. Okay. And when was the next time you had any interaction with the defendant's son? November 30th. Okay, so that would be Tuesday the next day? Yes. So let's talk about the 30th. I'm going to show you People's Exhibit 202. This is an email on Tuesday, November 30th, 2021, 8.05 a.m. Um, from a teacher to you, Ms. Fine. Uh, good morning. I know Jackie emailed you guys yesterday with some concerns about the defendant's son in our first hour class. Today he's watching videos on his phone of a guy gunning down people. It looks like it's a movie scene and not security footage slash real event but definitely still concerning when taking into account some of his other behaviors. Just wanted to keep you guys updated. Do you recall receiving that email? I do. Do you remember when you received it? Uh, it was sent at 8.05. I believe I saw it approximately 20 to 30 minutes later. Okay. And what was your reaction when you received this email? My initial reaction was frustration of a student that just had a conversation about school-appropriate behavior. Um, and... I wanted to, to make sure that I met with him. Okay. So this is Exhibit 203. This is from another teacher to you at 9.32 a.m. Again, Tuesday, November 30th. Here's the photo I took of his paper in case you need it with a um, picture of a math assignment. Now, what happened in between the time you saw this email at the Senate 805 to this email sent at 9.32? So I was on the phone with um, other parents at the time I received the first email. And when I was done with that phone call, um, at that time, Mr. Ejack actually was in my office as I was wrapping up the phone call. Okay. He had been presented with a picture of the math assignment from the math teacher and wanted to make sure I was involved in that this conversation. I don't know exactly what it was. I know he was showing a picture on his cell phone. Okay. Um, I would believe it was the initial one, but I do not know that for a fact. I never saw the cell phone. That's fair. Um, so he wanted to involve me in a conversation with the student about the math assignment, and I... All right, it looks like we got some movement in the courtroom. We're going to take that live. Again, you're watching the James Crumbly trial. Seven nine nine eight nine FH. Thank you, Mark Keys on behalf of people. Karen McDonald on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Mario Levin on behalf of Mr. Crumbly, who is standing to my left. And I'm ready for the jury. Yes, yes Judge. Right.
Who's the next witness? Nikki Jack. Nicholas E. Jack, first name N I C H O L A S, last name E. Jack, E. J. A. K. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. In the year of 2021, where did you work? Oxford High School. Okay. In what role did you work there? I was the Dean of Students. And could you speak, keep your voice nice and loud? Sure. Please? I was the Dean of Students. Okay. And tell us, please, what does the Dean of Students do? So the Dean of Students is primarily responsible for student code of conduct, so behavior and discipline, um, overseeing the attendance of the school, um, academic intervention, behavior intervention. Okay. So Mr. Hopkins just testified, and he indicated he was a counselor, whereas you are the Dean of Students. So it would be fair to say that you handled discipline, whereas he handled the student advocacy? Yes. Okay. As of November of 2021, how long have you been in that role? Uh, just about four months. Okay, so you were hired for that school year in the fall of 2021? Correct. Now that's part of administration, is that correct? It's an extension of it, yes. Okay. Was James Crumbly's son a student in Oxford High School in November of 2021? Yes. Prior to November of 2021, did you have any interaction with James Crumbly's son? I did not, no. I want to direct your attention to what's been admitted as People's 201. This is an email from November the 29th, 2021, 9.32 a.m. And um, the email reads, Good morning. I had a student during the first hour, the defendant's son, who was on his phone looking at different bullets at the end of the first hour today as I was walking around the room passing out their essays. I didn't get a chance to investigate it a bit further since it was the end of the hour. Now that he's on my radar, I'm also noticing that some of his previous work that he's completed from earlier in the year leans a bit toward the violent side. I can bring down these things later today during my fifth hour prep if you would like them. So you and Miss Pamela Fine were both on that email? That is correct. Okay, and, and tell us who's Pamela Fine? So uh, Miss Fine is the restorative practices coordinator and the anti-bullying coordinator for the school district. Okay, and tell us a little bit if you know what that role entails. Sure. Uh, so, restorative care um, and anti-bullying across the district, uh, she would be working with students to restore uh, situations between uh, two different students, a student and a teacher. Um, it deals a lot with behavior, and so it's more of like, how do you fix or repair the situation? And so she often would <coughs> collaborate with me on student discipline, and then the anti-bullying programming for the district would be like mentoring kids together to prevent bullying and to report it, you know, when they see it, and it's more of a proactive approach. Okay. So if, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like you, Ms. Fan, Ms. Fine, rather, and Mr. Hopkins have separate but sometimes, uh, separate roles, but sometimes they intersect. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Now, did you have any interaction with the defendant's son on November the 29th of 2021? I did not, know. Okay, and tell me what happened after this email was received by you. Uh, so, it was received by me um, when I was in a meeting that morning. Uh, so, I wasn't made aware of it until after um, there was a meeting that took place between uh, Ms. Fine, Mr. Hopkins, and the defendant's son. Okay. So, by the time that you had read this email, that situation had already been addressed by Ms. Fine and Mr. Hopkins? That's correct. Okay. Did you have any follow-up emails, conversations, or any other interaction regarding the defendant's son or with the defendant's son on Monday, November the 29th? I did not know. I'm going to direct your attention now to Tuesday, November the 30th, 2021. This is People's Exhibit 203. This is from um, a teacher in the school. Um, email sent Tuesday, November 30th, 2021, 9.32 a.m. It's addressed to you and Mr. Hopkins. It reads, here is the photo I took of this paper in case you need it. Signed, Becky. Um, and there's an attachment. 
Did you receive this email? Yes, I did. Okay, tell us about your interactions with other students or administrators prior to receiving this email with regards to the defendant's son. So I had received this email um, after I had <coughs> alerted um, Mr. Hopkins to the worksheet uh, because this teacher brought a photo of that. Okay, let office. me back up just a sure. little bit. So before this email was received by you, did you have a conversation with a teacher uh, regarding the defendant's son? No, I did not. Okay, so tell me how it is that you became aware of this math worksheet. Uh, so the morning of November 30th, two, 2021, mm -hmm. um, I was in my office when Miss Morgan, who was the teacher that sent this email, uh, came down to our front office looking for anybody that she could uh, speak with about a student that had uh, drawn some inappropriate okay. things on a worksheet. And you were there? I was the only one available at the time, yes. Okay, and tell me about that interaction, please. Uh, so she entered the threshold of my office door and said she was just looking for somebody to report something, and so I had waved her into my office, and she had stated that there was a student that had drawn some inappropriate things on um, a worksheet, and then she proceeded to turn her phone around and show me a photo of the said worksheet. Okay, so this is Exhibit 130. Do you recognize this? I do, yes. And how do you recognize it? Um, that's the photo that was on her phone. Okay. And so she turned her phone around and shows you this? Yes, that's okay. correct. And tell me what happened next, please. Uh, so I briefly read um, the statements and looked for a name in the corner and noticed that it was a name of the student that had been in the meeting with Mr. Hopkins and Ms. Fine from the day before. Okay, so you looked at the worksheet. What stood out to you when you first saw it? The phrases that were written on there. Specifically, which ones? Um, the thoughts won't stop, help me, the world is dead. Okay. What happened next? Um, I, my response to her was, I need to get his counselor. Uh, and her response to me was she needed to return to class. Okay. So she went back to class? Yes. And then what did you do? I walked down to the counseling portion of our front office to alert Mr. Hopkins. Okay. And tell us about the interaction you had with Mr. Hopkins. Sure. So when I arrived uh, to his office, um, before I even mentioned anything, um, he brought up the uh, defendant's son in sort of a question form. And my response to him was, yes, how did you know? And then he proceeded to share with me that he had uh, received an, an email that morning regarding that student um, and thought that that's why I was there at his office. Um, and then I had shared with him that I had just been shown a photo from Miss Morgan okay. um, and kind of explained what I had saw on the worksheet. And he immediately stood up from his desk and said, I'll go retrieve him from class. Okay, so he received a different email the morning of November 30th than the picture yes. that you were shown. Yes. Okay. Now, when you saw this picture, were you considering this in the realm of student discipline? Not at all, no. Okay, I so was more concerned um, that there was a mental health concern. Is that so why you, you decided to get his counselor involved? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So after you shared what you learned with Mr. Hopkins, he went and retrieved the student back to his office? Yes. Okay, and tell us what happened next, please. Uh, so I waited in Mr. Hopkins' office for uh, him to return with the student, and um, he came in and sat down and began to kind of talk through um, what was going on that led him to uh, write those things on his worksheet and draw some uh, characters on there, um, and the defendant's son repeatedly made sure that we were aware that he understood why we needed to do this and that it made sense and that um, he understood how bad it looked. Okay. Uh, did you lead that interaction with the defendant's son or did Mr. Hopkins? Mr. Hopkins, sir. And why is that? Um, as the school counselor, therefore, um, look, looking into a potential mental health concern, that would be his, his responsibility. Okay. Did your perspective, based upon the information that you were told, ever change from a mental health lens versus a discipline lens? It did not, no. So tell us after, what happened next after the defendant's son went through the drawing of Mr. Hopkins? Uh, so he had sort of explained that he was interested in video games and that uh, part of those drawings, or the drawings on there were him trying to get into graphic design. 
which led into a little bit of a conversation about how that could there could be potential avenues um, during his time at uh, Oxford High School to uh, delve into that deeper with some other programs. Um, and then um, he kind of leaned in more towards the statements that were written on there and talked about how those didn't necessarily explain the video game aspect. Uh, and then I listened to uh, the defendant's son speak about him feeling sad lately, okay. which um, in a high school is not that unusual. Were you, were you involved in the decision to contact the uh, parents of the student? I was there for it, um, but Mr. Hopkins had mentioned that we were going to reach out to um, his parents. Okay. At some point, did you leave Mr. Hopkins' office? Yes, uh, that was after um, we were able to speak with a parent on the phone, um, and so I left to retrieve um, the students' belongings since our class periods had changed. Okay. At that point in time, COVID protocols were still in place? Yes. Okay. Did students carry their backpacks with them? Yes. So you retrieved the defendant's son's backpack from the class that he was in and brought it to Mr. Hopkins' office? That is correct, yes. Okay. And did the defendant's son stay with Mr. Hopkins until his parents arrived? Yes. All right. Were you there in, in Mr. Hopkins' office the entire time, or did you come back in? No, I, um, I came back in once the parents had arrived for the meeting. Right. Now, what was your expectation of what was to happen that day after the meeting with the parents? Uh, my understanding and expectation was that, um, based on the recommendation from the counselor, that the student would be leaving that day based on prior experiences um, at schools where parents are called in for to talk about student mental health typically they leave when it's suggested that they leave with the student yes you were there for the uh, how long first of all how long did the entire meeting last between james and jennifer crumbly and uh, mr hopkins yourself um, i was there for 10 minutes of it um, and it had maybe there had been maybe three or four minutes prior to my arrival. Okay. I'm not sure if they waited for me to start or if they had already begun, but um, I know that I arrived a few minutes after they did, after I was alerted that they had arrived. So were you there when Mr. Hopkins explained his concerns about the, the drawing? Yes. Okay. Now, he just testified, so I, I don't need you to go through everything he said, but do you recall if James Crumbly said anything? Um, during the meeting? Yes. Uh, he did. He expressed concern for uh, his son. Uh, that he knew, uh, or he wanted, he reminded his son that he could always speak to him about stuff and that um, he had a journal that he could write stuff in um, if he was feeling frustrated or going through something. Now, as a dean of students, when are you permitted to search a student's personal belongings? So when I have um, a reasonable suspicion that the student might have something um, illegal or uh, something that's not allowed at school. And so um, there needs to be some sort of sign, like a report from somebody. Um, oftentimes kids will be seen with it or they'll be showing whatever the things are that they brought to school they're not supposed to. Um, there needs to be some type of um, a suspicion or alert that I have that will allow me to do that. Okay. And so in this situation, I there, there was, wasn't something that alerted me that indicated I needed to. So okay, sure. and why not? Um, not none, none, nothing that he said, nothing that he, um, none of the behavior that he exhibited when I returned with his bag indicated that. Um, there wasn't any suspicion that I had at the time that allowed me to believe that I needed to do that. At any point, were you informed about the defendant's son's access to weapons? I was not, no. Okay. Were you given details by the James Jennifer Crumbly about the words and drawings on, on this exhibit. I was not. Thank you, Bethany, for this one. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning. Good morning. Prior to becoming the Dean of Students at Oxford High School, you worked in various schools and school districts. Is that correct? Yes. For most of your career, in fact, you worked with at-risk students. Yes. Um, normally, that includes stu students with some sort of academic or behavioral problems. Yes, that is correct. In fact, your role at Oxford High School, you testified today, primarily you dealt with the Code of Conduct. Yes. Uh, behavioral and academic intervention. Yes. And issues with attendance. Yes. You had not had contact with Mr. Crumbly's son until November 30th of 2021. That's correct. So. 
as far as you know, once you became employed by Oxford High School, there were no behavioral issues with Mr. Crumbly's son? There was not. No academic issues? No attendance issues? No. You learned on November 29th of 2021 that Mr. Crumbly's son was looking at bullets on his phone in class. Yes, that is correct. But once you had been made aware of it, or once you learned of it, you, you learned that that had already been handled by Mr. Hopkins and Ms. Fine. Is that correct? That is correct. So you didn't do anything else with, with anything that day? No. It, okay. I, I didn't need to um, do anything further based on the fact that Ms. Fine and Mr. Hopkins did everything that I would have done in that situation. Okay. So you didn't see any need for additional discipline or any additional intervention or anything like that, correct? That's correct. On November 30th of 2021, you were advised by one of Mr. Crumbly's son's teachers that he was writing inappropriate statements on his home, on a, on a math assignment. Yes. You were quickly shown a picture of the assignment on a, on a cell phone, if you recall. Yes. You correct. didn't look at it very well, correct? No. You saw that there were drawings. Yes. Um, but you didn't see necessarily what all the drawings were. Is that fair? That's fair, yes. You did see the words blood everywhere? Yes. Um, but you didn't see much beyond that? That's correct. To you, the words on the page were more concerning than the drawings themselves, right? I would agree with that, yes. And that's because sometimes kids in high school draw violent things? Absolutely, yes. That's not abnormal? It's not abnormal. You felt that what was on the page here was not appropriate for school, is that correct? Yep, I would agree with that. But that it wasn't in and of itself concerning? Yes. And that you didn't see it as a threat to anybody? That is correct. You didn't see a correlation of violence with the drawings on the paper? Um, I did not, know. Again, Mr. Crumbly's son had no prior disciplinary history? He did not, know. No prior bad behavior? He did not. He was a pretty average student? He was, yes. He'd only missed one class that year? I can't speak to that. Um, I, you said you, you dealt with attendance, so that's why I was asking. Yes, sure. So you're not aware of his attendance? I'm not history. aware of specifically his attendance. Okay. He had none of the typical early indicators um, that there would be a, an issue of concern other than these isolated incidents from November 29th and November 30th that you were aware of. So I'm just going to object to the form of the question. Typical indicators. This witness can testify regarding code of conduct, conduct and discipline, but that's it. Yeah, unless he is able to testify about what a typical indicator would be. Experience. And I can ask him that, Your Honor. Um, based on your experience dealing and your education and training with at-risk students and for your position as the dean of students, there are what you would consider early indicators of potentially concerning or threatening behavior. Is that fair? I would say that's a fair statement. Some of those include prior disciplinary history? Yes. Um, prior bad behavior by the student? Yes. Issues with grades? Yes. Issues with attendance? Yes. Okay. So, knowing all of that, none of those, what I'm calling early indicators, were present other than the two incidents that you were aware of on November 29th and November 30th of 2021. As far as I was aware, yes. Okay. You sat in on a conversation between Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Crumbly's son on November 30th of 2021. Yes, I did. And that was before his, uh, Mr. Crumbly and his wife got to the school? That's correct. Based on the information that you had at that time, you did not believe that Mr. Crumbly's son posed a threat to anyone? That's a fair statement, yes. You were even less concerned after you confirmed some of the information that you'd learned from Mr. Crumbly's son with Mr. Crumbly's wife? Yes, after she had confirmed all the information he shared with us. Um, my concern from a discipline standpoint was pretty much lowered all the way to none at that point. Okay. And you said um, all the information that he had shared with you. And we've heard some about that, but I just want to confirm. That was about the losses that he'd experienced in 2021, correct? The loss of a family member? Yes. The loss of his family dog? Yes. A friend had moved away? Yes. He'd struggled with COVID? He did, yes. Um, he had a hard time with virtual school? Yes. Those were the things that you confirmed with his with his family, with his Al parents. Along with his desire for um, graphic design and video games, and that they thought he should focus more on academics rather than that, which is what he had shared with us um, during the meeting. Okay. Um, when you say he had shared with us, are, are you referencing a discussion or an argument he had with his parents the night before that related to video game design and grades, or was this something separate? 
Um, but both. No, he had he had shared that he was interested in that and that he didn't feel his parents um, supported that and that that led to an argument the night before. Uh, but he didn't provide any any context to that um, at all. And they had confirmed that, with, but they also didn't provide any context to that either. So there was a confirmation that the student and uh, Mr. Crumbly's son and Mr. Crumbly and his wife had had an argument with their son the night before. Um, it, it sounded to you like it may have related to video game design and grades, but you didn't have any context beyond what you believed it to be, be about. That's correct, yes. Now, obviously, during these meetings, you expect for a student's parents to give you information about things that they are concerned about, correct? Typically, in these meetings, parents come to them and they provide additional context, stuff they're seeing at home, um, a history of, um, if, you know, especially in, in a mental health situation, a history of um, any kind of counseling um, and any issues they've had at other schools or whatever, but they usually provide additional information. So you said specifically um, things that they see at home, things that they're concerned about. Obviously, in order for a parent to see something at home or be concerned about it, they have to be aware of it. Is that fair? Speculation too, Judge. I don't know how a parent could be concerned if they're not aware of something. The dean of students can't testify as to how a parent would be aware of something at home in a meeting not even specific to what we're talking about here. What Actually, my question was different, Your Honor. My question was he would expect that or, or it's his belief that if a parent is concerned about something, then they're aware of it. Well, then, it's, then it's a lack of personal knowledge. He, Mr. Ejack was the Dean of Students in Oxford High School in November of 2021 in charge of discipline and code of conduct issues, Judge. Mr. Hopkins was the counselor. He's already testified. Okay. I, I, I think you're... Are you asking him if the parents aren't aware of something they're not aware of? It? I, uh, kind of, Your Honor. Obviously, and I can ask my question differently and see if it makes it a little okay. more simple. All right. Mr. Ejack, based on your experience, your education and your training, and just your knowledge in general of your human being, if someone doesn't have knowledge of something, they can't talk about it. Is that fair? Does that make sense I, to you? I would say that's a fair statement. So we can't talk about things we don't know about. Would you agree with that? Yes. Obviously, James Crumbly can't tell you about things he may not be aware of. Aware of, I'm sorry. Yes. You were concerned on November 30th of 2021 by Mr. Crumbly's son looking at bullets or drawing guns. Is that fair? I think there was a, a level of concern there, which is why we called the parents in for the meeting. And if you recall, the level of concern was regarding the appropriateness of behavior in school. Yes. You didn't find his interest in guns or bullets concerning, especially in the Oxford community, if you remember. Yes, that's correct. You've had students draw guns on papers in the past. Yes, that's correct. In fact, students in Oxford, not all of them, I'm not saying all students in Oxford, but there are students in Oxford who have guns in their home. Yes. That's you know correct. that there are students in Oxford who um, handle firearms. That's a fair judge. Fair okay. Uh, you would agree that it's not unusual? No, it's not unusual. In that community? In that community, yes. I'm not asking you to speak about any other community, but in that community, it's not unusual for students to handle guns. That's correct. When faced with a situation where a student has drawn guns on papers, you typically use your education and training to assess the risk. As far as a discipline standpoint? Discipline or otherwise, whatever your role is in that assessment. Yeah, so my role would be to look for um, any violation of our code of conduct, and so that by itself, the drawings on the worksheet don't violate a code of conduct. And a violation of the code of conduct would also encompass any sort of a threat to other people. Is that fair? That's a fair statement. So as part of your assessment, you're also determining whether or not there's a threat. I'm determining whether or not I need to alert somebody to something that could potentially be a threat. And in this situation, you didn't make that alert. Is that fair? That is correct. There wasn't um, any information that led me to believe there would be a reason to alert somebody else. And part of your assessment is, again, looking at those typical early indicators that we talked about, whether there's a history of violence, correct? That's correct. A history of discipline. That is correct. Bullying behavior. That is correct. You look at, to see if there's a direct threat. That is correct. If those things are not apparent, if those things are not present, then it's just a student who drew a gun. Is that accurate? That's pretty accurate, yes. You were part of the meeting after Mr. Crumbly and his wife arrived 
Um, and let me go back a little bit. So you sat in on the meeting between Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Crumbly's son, correct? That is correct. If you know, that meeting occurred, uh, lasted approximately 90 minutes? Uh, I don't remember. Okay. Um, you left that meeting at some point? Yes. Then you came back once Mr. Crumbly and his wife arrived? So I left um, the meeting to retrieve his belongings, the student's belongings, and returned back to the office and then left again until the parents arrived. Okay. You entered Mr. Hopkins' office after Mr. Crumbly and his wife arrived at, in Mr. Hopkins' office. That's correct. You saw that Mr. Crumbly was seated next to his son? Yes. Which was directly across the desk from Mr. Hopkins? Yes. It was your perception that Mr. Crumbly was showing care for his son? Yes. That he reassured his son that he can always talk to him? Yes. You mentioned something um, on direct with the prosecution about a journal? Yes, I and, and you seem to recall that Mr. Crumbly made reference to a journal? He did, yes. You don't recall Mr. Crumbly saying the one that you always keep with you? I don't recall that, no. Uh, he didn't say anything like the one that's in your backpack? I don't recall. Specific colors? I don't remember. How long he's had it? I don't remember. There were no specifics about anything about a potential journal? Not that I can recall. So to your knowledge, you don't know if there was one journal or 15 journals, is that fair? I can't speak to that. No. Right, you have no knowledge of that, is that fair? Yes. After meeting with Mr. Crumbly and his wife, you felt that they were receptive of getting their son um, help, as was suggested by Mr. Hopkins? Yes. You and Sean Hopkins did not insist that it be done that day. Now, I, I'm going to clarify, because I know that Mr. Hopkins indicated that he preferred that it would be done that day, but neither of you said, you need to take him today, and you need to go get him help right now, and if you don't, there's going to be a problem. What Mr. Hopkins had stated was that he needed to, they needed to find him some counseling as soon as possible that day, if possible. And that, and he, was that going he would be following up within 48 hours to ensure there was something secured for the student. And that was going to be my next question, that he was going to follow up in a couple of days, 48 hours. Yes. And in fact, you didn't feel in that meeting that Mr. Crumbly's son was in need of immediate care based on your education and training and perception and the knowledge that you had in that meeting. I can't speak to that. In no way did you feel that Mr. Crumbly was being neglectful of his son? Uh, no, I did not. You felt that Mr. Crumbly showed the appropriate level of emotion with his son in that meeting? Objection is, he can't speculate as the appropriate level of emotion. He's the Dean of Students regarding Code of Conduct, November of 21. Speculation. What, was there anything odd about his interaction with the son? I wouldn't say there was anything odd. Okay. You also didn't find it strange that Mr. Crumbly and his wife did not take their son home that day because there was no reason for him to go home that day. Is that correct? As far as the discipline goes, no. During the meeting, you said that you retrieved Mr. Crumbly's son's backpack from his classroom and brought it back to Mr. Hopkins' office. That's correct. You indicated this backpack was heavy? Um, yes, such as every other student in the school. And let me clarify, that day, you didn't say that today, that day, November 30th of 2021, you commented to a teacher that the backpack was heavy. Uh, yes, there was, I made a, a joke at how easily she picked it up, and then when, handed, when she handed it off to me, my arm dropped down. Um, so it was more of a joke at how strong she was compared to myself. And if you recall, at the time, the students weren't using their lockers? They were not using their So lockers. it was fairly common for a student's backpack to be heavy? That's correct. You didn't look in the backpack? I did not, know. You didn't, and, and I think you said you didn't have reason to look in the I backpack. I didn't have reasonable suspicion, though. You didn't ask Mr. Crumbly's son to look in his backpack? I did not, know. You did not ask Mr. Crumbly or his wife to look in the backpack? I did not, know. You didn't look yourself or ask anyone else to look because you didn't feel that there was a reason to look in the backpack. Is that fair? There was nothing um, from our conversation or from anything that we had heard so far that would um, indicate it was um, enough to reach to that level, correct? You've had numerous discussions about this case since November 30th of 2021. Yes. You've talked with various attorneys? Um, that Sure. Yeah. And I'm not asking you about what your communications were with your own attorneys. I'm not asking you about that. I'm just asking if you've met with attorneys. I've met with many different attorneys. You've met with the prosecutor's office? Uh, yes. On more than one occasion? Uh, yes. And some of those meetings with the prosecutor's office were to prepare for testimony? 
Uh, yes. Some were to get more information about what occurred on November 30th of 2021. One was, yes. You learned in, through some of those meetings that there was no indication that there was a handgun in um, Mr. Crumbly's son's backpack. Can you restate that? Sure. You learned through some of the meetings with the prosecutor's office that there was no indication that there was a handgun in Mr. Crumbly's son's backpack while he was in Mr. Hopkins' office. Object to the form of the question. Yeah, what do you mean? Can you Yes. I will be more clear. Do you recall testifying in September of... What are you referring to, counsel? There was a testimony in September 14th of 2022 that relates to this. If you'd like, we can approach to talk about it further. I think we should. <laughs> All right, it looks like the attorneys are approaching the bench right now. Right now we're hearing the testimony of Nicholas E. Jack. He's the Dean of Students at Oxford High School. Prior to the shooting, he had only been there for about four months before everything took place. His first interaction with the shooter was actually when he received the email about the shooter looking up bullets on his phone. Um, he, was, he also was present in the office when uh, the counselor Sean Hopkins called his parents and left a voicemail. Um, but other than that, he hadn't really had any exposure or contact to the shooter. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Thank you, Your Honor. As you know, approximately two hours after the meeting, um, after this meeting with Mr. Hopkins, yourself, and Mr. Crumbly and his wife, uh, Mr. Crumbly's son began the shooting. Yes. You saw the footage of the shooting. I did, yes. You were not aware that Mr. Crumbly's son was the shooter? Uh, initially. At the time. Uh, when I saw all of the footage? No, let me go back. So at some point, Early on, on the day of the shooting, you saw footage of the shooting. Yes. And that was while you were in the office of on, the school. On the phone with the 911 operator. Yes. yes. And at that point, the thought didn't cross your mind that the shooter may be Mr. Crumbly's son. That's a fair statement, yes. In fact, you didn't know that it was Mr. Crumbly's son until you were told that it was him after the shooting. Um, I believe um, as the video footage continued to play and we were still on the phone. Um, I, it wasn't confirmed, but I had a pretty good idea that that's who it was. Okay. Even looking back, after you know what Mr. Crumbly's son did two hours after that meeting, his behaviors did not show a pattern of what he was planning to do two hours later. Based on the information I knew, no. It's fair to say that you have years of experience with at-risk students. Yes, that's correct. Years of experience with behavioral, um, academic, attendance, issues of that, of that nature. Yes. You have education and training about concerning things to look for in students. Yes. You knew that Mr. Crumbly's son was looking at bullets on his phone on November 29th of 2021. Yes. You knew that he had drawn a gun um, and some concerning words on his math assignment. Yeah, that's correct. You knew that he was at the shooting range with his mom the weekend before. Yes, that's correct. You confirmed that during the meeting with his parents, correct? Yes. You knew that he had experienced significant losses in the months before November 30th of 2021? Yes. You knew that Mr. Hopkins was recommending that his parents have him talk to a therapist that day if possible? That's correct. You knew that his backpack was heavy and commented about, about the weight of it to a teacher? That's correct. You knew that firearms were not uncommon in homes in Oxford? That's correct. You knew that students at the high school handled firearms and that it wasn't uncommon. We're asked and answered now, Judge. You knew yeah, yeah, he answered that. You knew that the shooter was going to stay in school that day. At the end of the meeting? Yes. Yes. Partly because he wanted to. Yes. And partly because his parents had to go to work. That's what I was told, yes. And with all of this, all of the knowledge that you had 
on November 30th of 2021 at approximately 10.52 a.m., you did not feel that he was a threat to anyone, and you didn't feel that you had reasonable suspicion to look in his backpack? No, because you have to remember, I knew very little of what we all know today. So when we're looking at the big picture today, I knew a fraction of what we all know now. And we talked about this a little bit with Mr. Hopkins as well. Um, we all know what happened at 1251 on November 30th of 2021. But the information that you had at 10.52 a.m., when that, or approximately 10.50 a.m. when that meeting ended, is the information that you were going on. Yes, and that does not rise to the level of... A suspension or of a discipline, especially when you're considering mental health. And That's, it doesn't... That supersedes any type of minor discipline or behavior uh, violation. So, and Mr. Hopkins did, talked about this a little bit, looking in hindsight, mm -hmm. there was more information. Yes, we now know there's a lot more information. You might look at things differently looking in hindsight. I would 100% look at things right. differently. But the information that you had on that day, at that time, is what led you to make the decisions that you made and feel the way that you felt about the situation that you were presented with in Mr. Hopkins' office. That's a fair statement, yes. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you, briefly. <coughs> uh, Mr. Ejack, let's talk about the information not shared with you at 10.52 a.m. on November 30, 2021. Okay, so you formed your belief that you did not have the requisite level of suspicion to search the shooter's backpack based upon what you were told. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Did James Crumbly tell you that he had bought his son a six-hour, nine-millimeter firearm four days before that meeting? He did not. Okay. Did anybody, either his son or his wife, tell you that? No. Did his son tell you that, or did James Crumbly tell you that his son had been begging for a nine-millimeter handgun? No. Did James Crumley tell you that he actually got him a different firearm in June of 2021? No. Did James Crumley tell you that um, the, the details and severity of his son's friend being taken from him at the beginning of the month? No. Now, you indicated that as far as a, a discipline standpoint, your belief was that the mental health concerns would override. Yes. So tell me about that. So when you have a student who is being seen for mental health, and there also are some minor um, violations, you know, this being a second day of insubordination, essentially, the mental health concern is what takes precedence because you want to build that relationship with the student and let them know that it's a safe space, and you don't want to follow it up with a, some kind of a negative interaction, such as a discipline. Is that one of the reasons why Mr. Hopkins led the meeting? Yes. Okay. Did your lens ever change from mental health to discipline? It never did. And is that based upon the information that you learned that day? Yes. Did Jane Trimble ever tell you that the six-hour, nine-millimeter handgun that he bought for his son was kept unlocked in the home? No. You were asked about certain indicators in your experience when you consider discipline. Is access to an unlocked firearm, is that an indicator? Yes. Is that something to consider, had you known that? It would be something to consider. Okay, but that information was not shared with you? No, it was not. Now, just so we're clear, sir, the information that you and Mr. Hopkins were told on November the 30th that information wasn't shared with anybody else in the administration, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Very brief, Your Honor. Very brief. Okay. Mr. Ejack, you don't know whether James Crumbly knew that his son had access to a firearm that was in the home, is that correct? You don't know whether James Crumbly knew. So the question was, was he told that? I don't know how he would know what the defendant knew. Right. He testified he what he was not told, Judge. That was the question. Yeah, he, was, he said he wasn't told, but I, I don't know how he, how he would know what your client knew unless he had a conversation like that. Thank you. Okay. You don't know whether Mr. Crumbly's son had expressed any sadness over his friend moving to his parents based on the information that you had on November 30th. Can, can you say Yes, that? it was are kind you, of a convoluted question. Are whether it was discussed in that meeting? Or? Whether Mr. Ejack knew that Mr. Crumbly's son had expressed any of this sadness that, he, that they had identified to his parents prior to that meeting. Do you know if he did? I'm not sure what you're trying to ask. I'm sorry. Yes. Do you know if James Crumbly was aware of this sadness that, that you all had identified during this meeting with Mr. Hopkins? I, I, I do not know. No further questions, Your Honor. 
Was the information that was shared from Sean Hopkins regarding the emails that he received? Yes. Okay. And he went through the drawing with James and Jennifer Crumbly? Yes. And at no point did James and Jennifer Crumbly ever say that the firearm purchased four days before mirrors the firearm drawn on that math worksheet? They did not. They did not. All right, you can step down and excuse. Your lunch is in. This spot is wrong, obviously. Um, if I were taller, it would have been fixed already. Um, I'm going to ask you to return at 1 o'clock. It's not about uh, 5 to 12. I'm going to ask you to return at 1 o'clock. In the meantime, I'm going to ask you not to discuss the case with, with each other or anyone else. Don't look at any, any news media. Don't talk to anybody. Don't Google anything. Don't, don't uh, do any research on your phone or anything like that. Any questions about the case now? All right, we'll see you at one o'clock. All right, the jury. Find out. I just spoke with counsel about that, and we'll let her know as soon as we know. Okay. All Thank right. you. I'll see you at that time. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. You've been watching the live coverage of the James Crumbly trial. We just heard from Nicholas Ejack. He's the Dean of Students at Oxford High School. Previously before him, we heard from Sean Hopkins, the counselor at Oxford High School. Coming up next, the court is on a break. They're on lunch. Um, so we are going to have a little bit of a rundown here, do a quick recap, chat with Jack Nissen and um, Charlie Langton, who's outside of the courtroom now. We'll be right back of the students who are not in the early college program.
welcome back to Live Now Detroit, where you're watching a live coverage of the James Crumbly trial. We wrapped up this morning with testimonies we heard from two of the last people who spoke to the shooter and his parents before the school shooting, Oxford High School counselor Sean Hopkins and school dean Nicholas Ejak. We're going to take a quick break um, and we're going to talk to Jack really quick uh, joining us for lunch and then we'll talk to Charlie Langton who's been in the courtroom all morning. Hey Jack. Hey Bree. How's it going? Oh going great absolutely. I know we've all been busy over here keeping everyone updated with everything that's going on. Um, so today we heard from the counselor yes. um, which he also testified in Jennifer's uh, trial yeah. and then we also heard from Nicholas Ejack the Dean of Students which we also heard from him as well. Um, do you think this is alluding to the fact that um, the school should be held responsible or what the school did to kind of prevent this all from happening? I think if the defense has their way, they could definitely make the argument that uh, the school's responsibility in all of this is a lot more uh, a lot more important to the case than uh, just the parents' responsibility as well. Uh, it is interesting, though, both Nicholas Ejak and Sean Hopkins uh, testified in the previous trial I'm actually getting a very different interpretation from their testimonies in James's trial. Uh, part of the reason is, is we're getting a little bit more of a, mm, I could say, sympathy from uh, James. He asked, I believe, during the meeting at least, uh, that, son, you know you have people to talk to when speaking to his son in the meeting. They also went over the math assignment that actually spurred a lot of this meeting, uh, as well as his journal as well. I find this really interesting because uh, when we actually listened to both of these individuals talk during Jennifer's trial, we didn't get the same kind of response from Jennifer. I believe she sat to the side of the uh, in the room at the time. She also uh, didn't. I don't think at least <laughs> prosecutors asked that she didn't. You know, touch him. She didn't hug him. She didn't show much. Uh, parental affirmation. So when the jury's kind of going in and deliberating about how uh, James sort of felt about their son and his, his struggles at the time, they can point to this specific scene where he was showing a little bit of acknowledgement about being worried about it. At the same time, James Crumbly uh, was door dashing. And when the parents are asked if they can take their son home after this sort of struggling moment in the morning, and they are instead told that they have to work, Jennifer Crumbly has to go to Southfield, where she works at a realtor company as a marketing director, I believe. But James is just door dashing. And instead of taking his son home, James goes back to work as well. I think with the more fluid schedule on the hands, uh, the prosecution might be able to point to that specific moment and actually say, well, James may have expressed some concern for his son at the time, but he didn't make the actual move to go and help him. That expectation is really interesting here because it really kind of boils down to the final hours and minutes before the shooter's rampage actually began. This painting the picture of what actually was happening at that specific time is really kind of getting into the details of it, but the details are kind of matter when we have such a great case and every single reference that the parents might make to their son or the school's responsibility about taking care of their son is all gonna factor into that final little decision that we hear at the end of this when the verdict is announced. So when Nicholas Ejak was on the stand, um, people online were saying, he liked hurting birds. Is that true? Is that something that we've, we've seen come out of this case? The birds, yeah. We will not see anything about the birds in this trial. Um, I believe that was evidence that actually was scrapped from the case. Uh, I, I don't exactly know what the prosecution wanted to use it for. I believe the defense, though, was very, very concerned about it creating, a, uh, inflaming the passions of the jury, per se, because uh, the video, I believe, was kind of gruesome and, and just showed some disturbing behavior from the shooter himself in the I think weeks and months leading up to the actual shooting uh, specifically. So as far as evidence goes, uh, the bird head and the filming of the bird uh, was, I think, one of those things that might have been requested, but we actually were never going to see it uh, when the trial began. And then uh, we know that um, Mr. Ejak, he was there for about four months prior to the shooting. Um, do you think that he was a good witness to testify in this case? Um, was he really there just to speak to what happened leading up to um, the shooting? Or yeah. was he there to provide some sort of context on um, protocols and procedures and, and things like that? Absolutely. I, I think actually the details in this specific case 
at this specific time are what matters the most. So any witness testimony from that moment in time is really, really important. Uh, I believe on Friday we had the assistant principal, Christy Gibson Marshall, speak, and, and she spoke a lot more and testified about the actual behaviors of the shooter uh, in the moment when it was happening. That necessarily isn't always going to be, all those details don't really matter to James's case because it's kind of after the fact. We're looking at a lot of the de details beforehand. And beforehand, right beforehand, where the backpack that contained the weapon that would eventually be used in the shooting is in the office with the crumbly parents, with with their son, with the counselor, with the dean of students who's in charge of discipline, there's this glaring fact right in the middle of all of them and none of them are aware of it at the time except for the shooter himself. So if you can kind of get into the mindset of the parents that were in that room and the school officials as well, you can kind of gauge whether there was any level of concern from them, either that they should have acted upon or even were aware of uh, when they were having this meeting, which I think for a lot of people was probably gonna be the moment in time when something might have been caught before anything worse did happen. Mm. And then we did also hear that Mr. Ejack said that he didn't believe uh, Mr. Crumbly was being was ne negligent uh, towards his son. Yeah, yeah, I uh, I found that really interesting because I don't really recall any of this spe these specific details in the previous trial. That makes sense since for James wasn't the one on trial, but now. He's sort of the main figure in this, so we all have to look at what specifically he was doing in that room at the time, what specifically he said toward his son. Uh, there was references to the journal as well, and there were some disturbing passages in the journal. I don't know if we're going to see all the little bits about that. Uh, in addition to what you referenced, Bree, with the bird head, not all of it is going to be relevant, and the defense certainly was going to make the argument that we can't use all this violent video, all these sort of disturbing photos and images and phrases that may be part of the case, but not specifically relevant to James's case. So when we kind of look at it in totality, uh, it sort of adds up to a very interesting story that with a lot of hindsight probably would have come with a few different decisions made on the basis of both the officials and the parents involved. All right, well, Jack is following this closely on the web. If you weren't tuned in earlier, you can get all caught up right there. Um, you can also stay with us, stick with us, and watch the live coverage when they get back from lunch. Uh, thanks, Jack. Thank you, Bree. And now Charlie, is, um, who's live in the courtroom, he's going to join us from outside um, of the courtroom in Pontiac right when we get back. Welcome back to Live Now Detroit. Uh, we're giving you live coverage of the James Crumbly trial. Following this story closely is Charlie Langton, who is live outside of the courtroom, and he joins us now um, to tell us what's going on. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Charlie. Charlie, you there? All right, we are going to go back on a quick break really quick and fill out, fix out, fix those technical di difficulties. Uh
All right, welcome back to Live Now in Detroit. As I was saying before we took break, Charlie Langton is live outside of the courtroom. He joins us live now to give us a bit of an update. Hey, Charlie, how's today going? Hey, Bree, this is good. Listen, I just think we, we saw part of the closing arguments for both the defense and the prosecution with the questioning of both Ejek and Hopkins. I think these are the two very key witnesses, and they do good things for each of the sides, the prosecution and the defense attorney. But it seems to me that the real issue in this case, in order to get a manslaughter charge, is how much information did James Crumley give the school officials at that November 30th meeting? And we heard a lot of detail. I was really, um, I had, maybe I'd forgotten or maybe I was unaware, but the school officials had quite a bit of information when they decided that uh, the shooter was not a, a risk, a discipline. Yes, he needed some counseling, but it was okay within 48 hours and they sent him back to class. But James Crumley interviewed, first of all, when they went to the school on that day, they went to the school because of his drawing of bullets and looking at the videos and looking at the words, help me, etc. And that's enough to get the so parents to the, to the school. But when the parents were in that meeting, they volunteered a lot of things, that there was a death in the family, that the dog had died, that their best friend had left, uh, that he went to the shooting range. Um, uh, just uh, over the weekend. And the school had a lot of information in general, being that this is Oxford. A lot of people have guns and a lot of people draw pictures of guns, especially if you're 15 years old. Now, to me, that would be a lot of information given by James Crumley. And we also saw both the counselor and the dean of students admit that James Crumley was talking to his son and saying that if you want to talk, I'm here. And I think that's going to go well for the defense. Now, we heard the prosecutor then, especially in re- uh, direct of, of really pretty much both of them pretty much saying that it's the information that James did not tell the school that's worthy of manslaughter. For example, that the parents had just bought him a gun uh, three days or so before the shooting, that it was a nine millimeter, that he had been, the shooter had been begging for a p more powerful gun, uh, and that um, uh, that the gun was unlocked at home. They, they got that in there too, um, and the prosecutor did. Uh, and, so, and the severity of the loss uh, of, his, uh, of his friend. So I think the jury is really saying, how much information does a parent have to give to the school in order for this to rise to the level of manslaughter. So, but this was a really interesting day. The contrasts between these two witnesses, both defendant and prosecutor, trying to make their case using these witnesses. Bree? Charlie, let's talk a little bit about what people are asking online. Uh, someone, they're comparing the testimony between uh, Scott's first testimony or Sean's first testimony versus the one that he just gave today, and they're questioning his credibility here. Um, they're very different. What do you have to say about that? You mean the credibility of the witness, Shaw? I think there is some issues of credibility. That's what the defendants was trying was trying to do. We actually have a clip of uh, Sean Hopkins testifying um, a couple of key moments, both by the prosecution trying to make the case that had the counsel, this is the counselor we're talking about, had the counselor had more information, he would have done things differently. Why don't we roll that if we can right now? Uh, let's take a look at that uh, part of this testimony earlier today. He basically said, I know this looks bad, but I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, it, it wasn't said as flippantly, but it was, I, he understood, like, I can see why this looks bad. I'm not going to do anything. Okay. So, although you had concerns, you also had the student in front of you reassuring you that he was not going to hurt himself or anyone else. Based on what he told me, yes. You did not ask him on November 30th of 2021 if he had access to a firearm? I did not. You had no reason to look into whether or not he had access to a firearm. Would you agree with that? Based on the information that you had. It, it's easy to go in hindsight on a lot of things. Um, based on what my concerns were, I was concerned about student well-being. Mr. Hopkins, it appears that information and context would be important to you in these kinds of meetings. Yes, it would. Okay. Now, did James Crumbly tell you that November 30th wasn't the first time that his son asked for help? 
No. Did James Crumley ever tell you that as early as, as June of 2021, his son had obtained his own firearm? No. Did James Crumley tell you that his son had been begging for a 9mm firearm? No. Did James Crumley tell you that he worked for DoorDash, he hadn't begun work that day, and he could have take his son, taken his son home? No. Did he tell you that when his son was talking about his friend leaving, it was actually his only friend? No. So there's a, a summary, I think a pretty good summary of both positions from the defense and the prosecutor. And I tell you what, what we just saw there, I think we're going to see in closing arguments. The issue, the big picture here is what do the parents have to do in order to prevent a school shooting? Remember, it's got to be gross negligence and the shooting must have been foreseeable. So gross negligence, all the stuff that the prosecutor's saying, buying him a gun, a nine millimeter, um, despite the fact that he had been begging for some help, reaching out because his friend uh, was gone, et cetera. Is that gross negligence? And the other thing to the prosecutor has to prove is that whether or not it was foreseeable that the shooting would take place. I think the defense is gonna come back and say, school had a lot of information none of it even rose to the disciplinary level they gave the shooter back the backpack because there wasn't even a need to look in the backpack foreseeability you nobody in this room no one two professionals two parents and they were all either bamboozled by the shooter but they did not foresee the upcoming shooting that's the contrast it's up to a jury who do you believe we're going to see all this again Brie? And I think that's the thing here, Charlie. I think everyone is saying that this is foreseeable. Uh, the school should have done more. And that's what we're seeing online, too. Uh, you know, that the people are saying that the school should be, be held accountable in this case. Um, the fact that they didn't go through his backpack. Um, and like the counselor even said here, in hindsight, yeah, that seems like the right thing to do. Uh, but now we're here. Well, the Monday morning quarterbacks, obviously, we know what happened. And, and, and even the defense attorney made it very clear. Everybody in this room and certainly the jury knows what happened just two hours after that school meeting. So, again, um, you know, it's, it's a strategy call for the defense. Do you blame the counselor? Do you blame the dean of students? Um, not really. And then for the prosecutor, because they've got the burden of proof. So I'm a little happy on the prosecutor because they've got to remember, defendant doesn't do anything. But the prosecutor's got to show that this was gross negligence, that James Crumley did not tell the school personnel that they just bought him a gun, that he had been begging for a nine millimeter and they bought him a nine millimeter. You know, James Crumley, uh, uh, the, the student only missed one day of school. His grades were at least weren't great, but he was on his way to graduation. He had no technical academic problems um, and the shooter gave excuses for why he drew the gun he wanted to maybe make videos and some of it was a joke and in the early days uh, he was some of the some of the uh, you know the reaching out back in June it was in a Spanish class who even knew and who even knew what that meant or he said it was a joke anyway parents didn't even know about it so I think again I think we're getting here the contrast, um, could the school have done something? Yes, I, I don't think we're gonna get any more school personnel. I think that's dumb. But the jury's gotta be thinking here, again, prosecutor is gonna say, and there could be more than one reason, or more than one bad person to still get a conviction. Yeah, maybe the school should have been charged. Yeah, maybe the school should have looked in the backpack. Yeah, maybe the school should have done more things. But James Crumley also, should have done more things, more information. And so you can have more than one cause in this case. We know the shooter did the shooting, right? Right. I, I agree with you, Charlie. Uh, thanks, I know you gotta get back in. Uh, we're gonna check back in with you a little bit later today. We're gonna take a quick break. When we get back, we'll replay the cross-examination from Sean Hopkins. Uh, we'll see you soon.
Welcome back. I'm your host, the Bree Teamer. This morning, we replayed the prosecution's questioning of the Oxford counselor, Sean Hopkins. The defense spent about 50 minutes with Hopkins, where they address so many different things. We're going to play that for you right now. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Hopkins. Good morning. I'm going to go back to your first interactions with Mr. Crumbly's son. Um, I'm not going to use his name, so if for some reason the way that I'm referring to his son confuses you, just let me know if we're using too many he's, he's, does that make sense? Okay, okay. I'll do that. Thank you. So your first interactions with Mr. Crumbly's son were in the fall of 2020. Well, fall of 2020. No, it would have been spring of 2021. Okay. So it would have been before the 2021 school year? Yes. And that was for um, planning his class schedule, is that correct? That would have been the main reason that we would have met with every freshman. Um, and then I had that email that was displayed earlier from his English teacher. The May of, of 2021 email? Yes. And... After that May of 2021 email, you didn't specifically recall having a meeting with Mr. Crumbly's son. I don't have memory of that meeting, no. You, in fact, you went back and reviewed your records and determined that there, there appears to have been a phone call. That you called him, you called him down to your office? I called into his class and, and called him down to my office. Okay, but you don't remember ever meeting with him? I don't remember the meeting. You did not contact Mr. Crumbly or his wife after that May of 2021 email. That is correct. So other than discussing his, Mr. Crumbly's son's class schedule with him and then maybe meeting with him in May of 2021 about that email, you don't recall any additional interactions with Mr. Crumbly's son before November 10th of 2021. That is correct. In September of 2021, you received another email from a teacher which was displayed, I believe it was Exhibit 198, sorry, 199, um, which would be the, uh, an email from a teacher talking about a poem. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, that he had a school, a class assignment of writing an autobiography poem. And he had said to that teacher he'd made some concerning statements in that poem. Yeah, so if I can give a little more context to this, this was actually a Spanish class, so the poem wouldn't have even been in English. Okay, so he used words in Spanish? That is my understanding after talking to the teacher. And the Spanish teacher had concerns about the Spanish words that he used? That is my understanding based on the email. I also followed up with the teacher and gained further context about it. Right, and as a result of gaining further context, you were not concerned. Because the teacher lowered the level of concern for me, yes. So even though your response that you were going to catch up with Mr. Crumbly's son, even though that's in the email, you didn't actually meet with him because you had the conversation with the teacher. That is correct. Again, you didn't notify James Crumbly or his wife about the teacher's concern in September of 2021. No, I did not. And you didn't forward them the email? No. And that was because in your mind, based on the information that you had, there was nothing to be concerned about? Well, I just gained further context from the teacher and made the decision based off of that information. And had no concerns? I think that you're putting those words in to make it a little more extreme. But what I would say is I gained context and made a decision based off of that. And if you had been concerned... If you had had sufficient concern, you would have reached out to Mr. Crumbly or his wife. If it had raised the level of concern where I felt I needed to, I would have, yes. So then on November 10th of 2021, you received another email from a different teacher. From the same teacher. Oh, thank you for correcting me. It was the same teacher. She asked you to check in with Mr. Crumbly's son on November 10th. She said he might need to speak with you. And she said that she believed he was having a hard time? She said he's having a rough time right now. He might need to speak with you. The next day, you responded and indicated that you would check in with him. Uh, later that evening, after the school day was over, I responded, I believe. 
So you obviously couldn't have met with him that day because the school day was over, correct? She sent, on... she sent the email at the end of the school day, and I responded approximately two hours after the end of the school day. So you couldn't have met with him that day because the school day was over. Is that fair? He would not have been there. So right. you would have, would have met with him the next day? Yes. And do you believe that you did meet with him on November 11th? Yes. You spoke with him in the hallway? Yes, I caught him in between classes. You simply told him that you were available if he needed to talk? Yes. There was no further discussion with him at that time? No, because the way the email was written was that he might need to speak with you. So I just wanted to let him know that there was an opening if he wanted to speak with me. And having a rough time, like the, the teacher indicated in her email on November 10th, having a rough time isn't necessarily something that raises red flags. Is that fair? I didn't have any other context as to what was going on, and I just wanted to offer a chance for the student to speak if he needed to do so. And his response, if you recall, was something along the lines of, okay, thanks, okay. And I'm not asking you to quote him because I don't know if you remember, but it, it was not an uncommon response. Does that make sense? Yeah, it was a normal response given the situation. You did not email James Crumbly or his wife about that November 10th email, correct? I did not email them, no. Or the November 11th brief meeting with their son? Correct. You did not forward that email to Mr. Crumbly or his wife? I did not. So then the next interaction that you had with Mr. Crumbly's son was on November 29th of 2021, and that was a Monday, if you recall? Yes, that would have been a Monday. You were forwarded another email that was sent to Nicholas Ejak and Pamela Fine. Is that correct? Yes, I was. And this third email, this is the third email you've received from a teacher since the school year began, if you recall. Yes, it would have been. September of 21, November 10th of 2021, and now November 29th of 2021. The email advised that Mr. Crumbly's son was looking at bullets on his phone at the end of class. Uh, could I see the email? Yes. Exhibit 201. This is just the forward, so it doesn't have the actual email in it. You were advised that that was the concern, was that Mr. Crumbly's son was looking at bullets on his phone. I believe that to be true, but this email you have on the screen isn't the one that says that. Correct. The email doesn't say it, but you, you were aware that that's why the teacher was concerned Could and that's why the that teacher email? was emailing. I don't know if that's in the email. That email was displayed earlier, I think. It was sent to Mr. Ejack and Ms. Fine. That was the one. It's at Unless the bottom. It's... Oh, there, there we go. Is. There you. we go. Thank you. Yeah, so this is the email I was forward, forwarded. Um, and it just was at the end of the hour. The teacher didn't get a chance to really find out what was going on, but it just glanced at it um, and had seen that. And I'll leave that up in case you need to look at it. Thank you. So you were aware that on November 29th of 2021, at the time you received this forwarded email, that Mr. Crumpley's son was looking at bullets on his phone in class? Yes, after reading this email, I was aware. At some point, well, let me go in order. Shortly after this email, you then met with Mr. Crumpley's son and Pamela Fine. Yes. And you met in your office or Ms. Fine's office? It was in Ms. Fine's office. And you were there just as support, but Ms. Fine did most of the talking. Is that fair? Yes, I would say that was fair. And Ms. Fine talked to Mr. Crumbly's son about looking at bullets on his phone? She did. Um, she actually asked him to describe why would a teacher be contacting me right now? Um, and the student was forthcoming in what, what had happened in class. He was forthcoming. He was honest, to your knowledge, right? To our knowledge. He shared what we had in the email. He told you what class he was in looking at bullets. He said he was looking at bullets, and he even explained why he was looking at bullets, if you recall. He said that he and Mom had been at the shooting range over the weekend, and he was researching what they had done. And if you recall, Ms. Fine acknowledged that what Mr. Crumley's son was doing may not have been appropriate, but there really didn't seem a lot of concern. Would you, would you agree with that? Well, the concern was that it wasn't appropriate um, and that the concern was then placed by 
expressed by placing a phone call home. So the concern was the appropriateness of the behavior in class. Yes. And at that point, a voicemail was left for Jennifer Crumbly. Yes. You said that, um, if you recall, Mr. Crumbly's son was understanding during the meeting. He didn't fight with you about it. He listened, and eventually he went back to class. Yes, I would agree with that. Later in the day, you received an email from the same teacher uh, who expressed that some of Mr. Crumbly's son's prior work may have been a little violent. No, that was in the same email. It's in the same email? It is. Or was it in an email sent later in the day? No, it's in the same email from that morning. It was up on the screen. It's at the bottom of the it. The one from, the one that was originally sent to Mr. E. Jack and Ms. Fine? Yes. That was later forwarded to you? Yes. You didn't see any of those assignments prior to meeting with Mr. Crumbly's son? That is correct. If you have seen those assignments, it probably wouldn't have changed your approach to the meeting, correct? Because the approach was really more about the appropriateness of the behavior. Is that I fair? mean, it's a hypothetical of what we would have done. We acted on the information we had. And the, the information that you had was that he was looking at bullets in class. Yes. And looking at bullets is not necessarily something that is in itself concerning to you, correct? I think you're kind of trying to put it in like a pigeonhole. It was trying, to, we were trying to gain context of what was going on in the situation. Um, because a student looking at something on their phone at the end of the hour is different than a student brazenly doing it throughout the entirety of the class. But our conversation was, is this school appropriate or not? And in fact, it's, if you recall, your position is, was at the time, it wasn't necessarily concerning because he was honest about it. It seemed kind of a commonplace thing given the Oxford community and the gun, the gun culture in the Oxford community and things of that nature that you took into a factor. We took a lot of things into a factor, including the fact that we conversed of how it was not school appropriate. And that's why a phone call was placed home. As I just indicated, the Ashford area was and may still be a hunting community, if you know. Okay. I'm asking. People hunt who live at Oxford. In 2021, you would, you would classify it as a hunting community. I would say that there are people who are hunting, yes. Activities with guns were a common hobby in 2021, if you know. I mean, there were people who had guns as a hobby, yes. It was common for students to be interested in guns? I'm sure there are students who are interested in guns. And to go to the, the shooting range? Yes, students would go to the shooting range. Yes, I'm just going to object to make sure that the witness is speaking with personal knowledge. It appears counsel is asking him to give general speculation. Well, if you know, if you, if you know you're, you're not familiar with gun, very, uh, guns yourself, it sounds like. So, just if you know. Okay. Um, students going to the shooting range isn't viewed as unusual or concerning in and of itself. Is that correct? I think that you're taking, that you've got to have context with all of these. Right, and I'm just asking, in and of itself, a student going to the gun range, the shooting range, is not concerning in and of itself. It depends on the context. Because the student weightlifting is not concerning in and of itself unless they're doing it inappropriately, right? So you're, you're taking something that's a broad statement that can have a wide context. And on November 29th of 2021, Mr. Crumbly's son told you and Ms. Fine that he'd gone to the shooting range with his mom the weekend before. Correct. That in itself is not concerning to you. He did it in a way that was appropriate. You would agree... And, I, and can you refresh, refresh my memory? How long were you in the Oxford School District as of 2021? Seven years. And in that seven years, you learned that many households had firearms in the household. Is that, would you agree with that? If you know. What is many? 
I, there are people More who own tenants? guns. There are people who own guns. Okay. And you, as, as a counselor at the school, you were aware of that? Yes. It wasn't completely unheard of? No. It was also relevant when looking at the situation, it was also relevant for you to note the fact that Mr. Crumbly's son was not hiding that he was looking at the bullets or didn't hide it from you when he, when he spoke with you and Ms. Fine. Well, he didn't lie about what had happened. And that was important to you? Yes. As a result of the meeting with Ms. Fine, with you and Ms. Fine, Mr. Crumbly's son was not disciplined? To my knowledge, no. There was a phone call placed to his mother, which we've talked about. There was a voicemail left. You did not yourself call Mr. Crumbly? I did not. You did not forward him the emails that you received? I did not. You don't know if that voicemail um, was ever shared with Mr. Crumbly. Is that fair? Well, we talked about it in our meeting the next day. Okay. On the 29th, you don't know if Mr. Crumbly was ever made aware? I would have no way of knowing that. No. Right. You wouldn't know. You responded to the situation of Mr. Crumbly's son looking at bullets on November 29th on his phone with the information that you had. I did. And from what you knew at the time, other than the behavior being inappropriate for school, you didn't see anything else that might have been concerning. Well, and I want to make clear, I wouldn't be the one doing discipline in this situation. So... And I'm asking, and let me clarify, I'm just asking from a counselor's perspective. I'm not asking for discipline. You clarified that Mr. Eject did discipline. And okay. Fine. So could you repeat your question, please? Yes. As a counselor, on November 29th of 2021... You didn't see anything um, overly concerning about what we've just talked about with looking at bullets on the phone. That the focus was more that looking at bullets on his phone was inappropriate for school. So are you asking from a mental health standpoint, did I see anything concerning? Not really. Um, I don't know that, that you're a mental health professional. I mean, you're a school counselor and you do have some training sure. and education in that. I'm not asking for you to go anywhere outside of your education and experience. Just as a high school counselor sitting in Ms. Fine's office, with the information that you had, you didn't see a bunch of red flags. We've talked about, and let me ask, let me give you some, mm -hmm. let me go over it a little bit. You've discussed that you know that there are households in Oxford that have firearms in them, right? Yes, there are. You know that people in Oxford hunt. Some do, yes. You know that students are interested in guns. Some can be, yes. <laughs> you know that students look at bullets. We had one student who did that in that situation, yes. Okay. You know that that student, um, Mr. Crumbly's son, was honest about looking at the bullets when he was asked about it? To the extent of our knowledge, yes, he was. He told you that he'd gone to the shooting range with his mom? Yes. The weekend before? Yes. That Those things were not concerning to you? Taking those things in a vacuum is why we called home. And That's why Ms. Fine called home. And she said, we had this meeting, we told him it's not appropriate, he understands no need to call back unless you have questions, right? I don't remember the exact voicemail that was left. The voicemail was not, we need you to come to school right now. To my memory, it was not, but again, I don't remember the exact voicemail that was left. On November 30th of 2021, you received another email. It's this one, Exhibit 202, which... Um, was from another teacher who was talking about uh, Mr. Crumbly's son looking at a, a video of a guy gunning people down. Correct? Yes, yeah, so this teacher was a co-teacher in that same first hour class. From the day before? Yes. Okay. You reviewed that email on November 30th of 2021? I did. You made the decision to you didn't, I think you said you didn't see it for about 20 or 30 minutes. I didn't. I was on the phone, and I actually responded to it while I was on the phone. Um, and then upon ending that conversation, was going to go meet with the student. And this is the fourth email that you've received about Mr. Crumbly's son since the beginning of the 2021 school year. Yes. The third email in two days. Uh, is it? You would have received the... I think it's the second in two days. The November 29th email about the bullets, and then you do you recall receiving a follow-up email later that day? 
It was a confirmation of that. Okay. Yeah, so this is the second one with additional information. Okay. The second one on a different a different issue. Is that yes. fair? Okay. Yes. The teacher described the video as a movie scene, but not a real event. Yeah, she said it looks like it's a movie scene and not security footage slash a real event. She expressed some concern based on, quote, some of his other behaviors. Yeah, but definitely still concerning when taking into account some of his other behaviors, yes. You did not forward this email to Mr. Crumbly after you received it. Well, no, but over an hour later, I called him into the school. Right. And you decided after receiving this email that you were going to meet with Mr. Crumbly's son. Yes. Approximately an hour after receiving this email, Mr. Ejack advised you of another report made by a teacher about Mr. Crumbly's son. Yes, as I was about to go and um, call down his son, Mr. Ejack actually came into my office with information about the math assignment. And that there were some concerning comments and markings on the math assignment. I didn't have any context about the math assignment. I just knew there was something, something about it. At that point, you hadn't seen it. You were just going off of what you were being told. Is that fair? That is fair. Okay. So you went to Mr. Crumbly's son's classroom? I did. You, you called him out of class? I walked to his classroom. Uh, yeah, I'm, I, when I called out, I meant like at his classroom. You went and got him. Yes. Okay. Um, while you were there, you also obtained a copy of the worksheet that we've seen. I did. And that would have been what I call the modified worksheet. That would be the one that had the things scratched out and the words added that you identified and things like that. Yes. Okay. You and Mr. Crumbly's son went back to your office where Nicholas Ejack was, was waiting in your office, if you recall. Yes, that is correct. It was at that point or shortly thereafter that you called Mr. Crumbly's wife? Approximately 20 minutes into our meeting, yes. So you met with, with Mr. Crumbly's son for about 20 minutes? Yes. It was during that meeting that Mr. Crumbly's son told you about um, his family member passing away. He did. About his dog passing away. Yes. About his friend moving away. Yes. He talked about COVID being hard on him. Yes. He had a hard time with virtual school, if you remember. He did say that, yes. And um, you asked about the drawings and the markings and, and the things on the assignment that you had in front of you. Yes, I asked him to clarify what was going on in the assignment, but I also talked about the email I had received and I had also talked about in context of the conversation we had yesterday. Okay. So some of the meeting was about inappropriate behavior. Is that fair? It started off with a conversation about that um, because I didn't know what was on the phone. Um, so I asked him what he was watching. Okay. Um, and then we talked about, look, we just had a conversation yesterday about appropriate behavior in class. This feels like the same thing that we're dealing with here. Um, and after we had talked about that for a few minutes, I brought the math sheet out and asked him to start explaining to me what was on there. And when the prosecutor was asking you questions, you said initially when you got that email around 8, well, around 8.30 when you saw the email um, from the teacher, initially you were frustrated. In fact, you used the word frustrated. I was frustrated. And yes. it was kind of like, we just talked about this yesterday. Is that, does that kind of explain what, what you were feeling at the time? Yes, I would say that it was, we just had a conversation about this. Why am I hearing about something similar again? So you talked a little bit about that, and then you, you talked about the homework, or the, I'm sorry, the math assignment or the math paper that we saw, and you asked for some more context about what was on the paper. Well, initially I asked him to just describe what was on the paper, and he started talking about how it was a video game, um, that he liked designing them, liked drawing them. And then I asked for him to explain the words on it because I didn't feel those were as easily explained by simply stating, well, it's a video game. And in fact, you said that you didn't want to give context to his words. You didn't want to assume what he meant. You wanted to hear from him what those words meant. Yes. And he gave context. He did. His, that's when his demeanor changed from kind of being like, what do I have to say to get out of here and just not get in trouble to, I, like, he became sad. And you, you expressed, you used the word appropriate to describe his level of sadness based on what he was telling you. The way he was acting matched what he was saying. It, it's 
to me, it's sad if a, a family dog dies or a family pet dies. It's sad if a relative dies or a friend moves away. So his, his demeanor matched what he was saying. And again, in and of itself, being sad is something that you talked about you saw an increase of after COVID in your students. Do you recall that? Yes. And that, did. and that that was not, again, in and of itself. And I'm, and I'm not asking you to, I'm not, I'm not trying to trick you by asking these questions. Um, I'm not trying to, to give meaning to something that isn't there. I'm asking you, based on the information that you had at the time, you felt that his, his sadness was an appropriate level of sadness, not overly concerning. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but the sadness itself was not necessarily overly concerning beyond wanting him to talk with someone. Appropriate and concerning are two different things. Okay. When I say appropriate, I mean it matched with what he was saying. Something can be an appropriate response, but also be heavily concerning, right? Like... I don't know a good example off the top of my head, but what I'm, what I'm saying is his demeanor matched with what he was saying, but to me it was concerning, which right. is why I called parents. Right, exactly why you called parents. So if he had been sitting in front of you and talked about these losses and it was kind of like, yeah, it's no big deal, it's not a big deal, that could also be concerning. It would be a different type of concern, okay. yes. If he said, um, I, I lost the top to my pen and was crumbling in pieces and falling into a puddle of tears on your floor, that would be concerning, but for different reasons. It, it would be memorable okay. concerning, yes. So, the losses that he experienced, you agree, I think we can all agree, were significant. I think when taken in totality, yeah, yeah. And he was showing you that he was sad. Yes. He was also expressing during this meeting that he had concerns about missing class, if you recall. He did, uh, especially as after um, classes changed, which is a normal thing. Um, he expressed that he was worried about missing his chemistry class, which was his next class after the math class. Um, so during that time, Mr. Ejack went and retrieved his belongings and went to go get homework for his chemistry class. And I'm going to go over that in just a second, too, but... Um, if you recall, and I don't know if you, you pay close attention to your students' attendance, but if you recall, Mr. Crumbly's son had pretty good attendance. He did. He didn't miss school a lot. No, he did not. He, if you recall, his grades weren't great. No, but he was on track for graduation. He was passing. Oh, I believe he was failing one class at the time, and it was not by much. So he was close to passing all of, at all of his classes. One of them he was failing, but close to passing. Yes. So his attendance and his grades obviously were not overly concerning to you. I wouldn't say overly concerning, but a student who cares about class and, and wants to, you know, he had expressed an argument the night before um, and, and wanted to go to class, had expressed, you know, frustration of missing school during COVID and, and just that entirety. So it, it wasn't strange at that point to have a student not want to miss class. Right. That wasn't odd to you at all, given his history. Now, if he were somebody who missed school all the time and was failing all his classes, he's like, I really want to be in school. I really want to do my homework. You might feel a little differently. Is that fair? I would say it was in line based with the information I had. Okay. And you said that after Mr. Crumbly's son expressed these concerns about missing class, that Mr. Ejack went to his it was the first hour class to get the backpack? It would have been in his second hour class where his belongings were, yes. So he went, uh, Mr. Ejack went to his second hour class to get his belongings and brought his belongings back to your office? Yes, this would have been after we had confirmed parents were coming, um, probably a, a little after 10 a.m. He, if you recall, began working on schoolwork, waiting for his parents to get there. That is, that is my recollection, yes. Also, if you remember, while you were waiting for his parents, you also began watching some videos with him? Yep, so he had expressed different things he wanted to do after high school, um, and he had expressed wanting to go into video game design. I know that when students are waiting for parents, it can be high anxiety time for them, so I wanted to try and engage him 
as best as I could. So we actually watched videos from the uh, OTEC, the Technical Center campus, where they had programs that were centered around what he wanted to do. Um, so we talked about what it would look like uh, to do an application for them, because he was a sophomore and he would be able to apply for the next school year. Um, and so I did that, one, to, to kind of just bridge that time that could be high anxiety, and two, if you have any inkling that a student may potentially be displaying any signs of, of suicide or suicidal ideation, getting a gauge of future plans is crucial. So I wanted to get that gauge as well. And he did that, and he, he picked out some videos to watch, is that fair, and, and you picked some out? Yeah. You also asked him during that time if he was a threat to himself or anyone else. I asked him that earlier. And that is part of your assessment of the situation, is that fair? Well, it was a question I felt needed to be asked based on what I had. And based on your education, your experience, and your training, you know that that's an important question to ask. In that situation, yes. And he, he basically said, I know this looks bad, but I'm not going to do anything. Yeah, it, it wasn't said as flippantly, but it was, it, he understood, like, I can see why this looks bad. I'm not going to do anything. Okay. So, although you had concerns, you also had the student in front of you reassuring you that he was not going to hurt himself or anyone else. Based on what he told me, yes. Mr. Crumbly and his wife arrived at approximately 10.30. I think that there's a, there was some time lag between them getting to the school and, and actually getting into your office of about 10 minutes, if you recall. Okay, I, I don't know when they arrived okay. at the school. I know when they arrived to my office. Their son was in your office when they got there? Yes. Mr. Ejack came into the office after Mr. Crumbly and his wife came into your office? Yes. Okay. Because at some point he'd left while you were sitting with Mr. Crumbly's son. He left once we had confirmed that parents were coming. Mr. Ejack comes back in. When Mr. Crumbly and his wife walk in, Mr. Uh, I just want to lay the, the room out a little bit. So there's your desk. You're on one side. On the other side was Mr. Crumbly's son. Yes. There was a second chair in front of your desk. Yes. Mr. Crumbly sat in the second chair next to his son. Yes. And then Mrs. Crumbly sat in a third chair that was available in uh, kind of, was it behind Mr. Crumbly a little bit? So there were two across from my desk, and then there was one that was kind of off on a corner, um, okay. and that's where she sat. Your office was not the size of this room, is that fair? Yeah, that is fair. Okay. Um, Fairly small? It, it's not small. It's, it's a decent-sized office, but it had space where there were two seats across from me, one seat kind of on a kitty corner, a door, um, and then some space kind of off to what would have been my right as I was sitting in there. And Mr. Ejack would have been kind of off to your right, is that fair? Yes. Okay, so he wasn't sitting in one of the three or, or four chairs with your, with your chair. He was kind of off to the side. That is correct. You testified with the, when the prosecutor was asking you questions that while you were talking with Mrs. Crumbly, that you recall Mr. Crumbly was interacting with his son. I do. Um, you said that Mr. Crumbly looked at the math assignment, the modified math assignment, because that's the one that you had, that he looked at the modified math assignment with his son. That is correct. They looked at it together, and that he, he showed concern for his son. Yeah, uh, it, it felt like he was interacting with his son, and that he, he mentioned some things that were available for his son. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, you felt that... Mr. Crumbly's interactions with his son, that he was showing the appropriate level of care and, and caring for him at that point in your office? Yes, I, I'm, a, I'm a surface level, yes, yes. You confirmed um, that Mr. Crumbly's son had gone to the shooting range the weekend before? I did. You confirmed that he would had those, those losses, he lost a family member, his... Uh, a family dog and a friend had moved away that he experienced all those things in the year of 2021. I also asked, that, and he had mentioned the argument the night before as well. And they told you about the argument? They, they confirmed that it, there had been a disagreement, yes. It's not uncommon for 15-year-olds to argue with their parents, is that fair? In, in a surface level statement, yes, that can happen. Um, Mrs. Crumbly also confirmed that her son had struggled with virtual school during COVID. 
She did. And that confirms what Mr. Crumbly's son had also told you about not, in, not liking virtual school. Yes. You told Mr. Crumbly and his wife that, well, let me back up a little bit. You told the prosecutor that your hope was that Mr. Crumbly and his wife would take their son out of school, either get, them, get him to see someone to talk to, or to go have a really fun day. My words to them were I'd like him to, to get help as soon as possible, today if possible. And so you expressed to them that you wanted him to get help as soon as possible, today if possible. Yes. And Mrs. Crumbly said, we can't do today, we have to go back to work. Yes. They assured you, though, or at least you felt assured, that they were going to get him help. They, they were... They were not against it, and they made it seem as if it would be something that they would be willing to do. Okay. So you handed these three sheets of paper to one of them. They didn't toss it in the garbage, right? Not in front of me, no. Right. They didn't scoff about it and say, we're not doing this. They took the paper. Right. So you had no reason to believe that they weren't going to get their help, either at some point, get their son help, either some point that day or as soon as possible. Based on the conversation, no, but that's also why I planned the follow-up meeting with the student the next day was to ensure that there was some movement. And you'd plan the follow-up meeting kind of in, in, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but you kind of plan that in your head, like this is my next step. Yes. Okay. You didn't express that during the meeting? No. In the meeting, you expressed that you were going to follow up in about 48 hours. Well, because when mom said that today wasn't an option, I said 48 hours then, I'll be following up. Okay. So, in your mind, you had some kind of timing that you were going to follow up to make sure that things were being followed through on. Obviously, we know that that, that first check-in point didn't come. Um, but you told them within 48 hours you wanted something done by the next morning. And based on your meeting, you didn't have any reason to think that Mr. Crumbly or his wife were not going to follow up. I would agree. Essentially, you wanted to ensure, and, and I believe that you expressed this to Mr. Crumbly and his wife, wanted to ensure that their son's situation and his sadness didn't get worse. Right. I wanted to ensure that we had something that, if left on checks, could get worse. Right. So, sitting in the meeting, you weren't concerned necessarily that that day, or even by the next morning, that their son was going to harm himself. Based on what he had told me, I did not believe him to be actively harming himself, no. Or anyone else? Based on what he had told me, no. Mr. Crumbly's son expressed that he wanted to stay in school. He did. He wanted to stay in school for some of the reasons we've discussed. He didn't like virtual school. He wanted to make sure he could stay up with school. He didn't want to miss class. These are some of the reasons that he gave you. Yes, those were, those were some of the reasons. He, he really just said that I, I struggled with virtual school. I want to make sure I'm staying on top of what I have to do. And that wasn't concerning to you, that he wanted to stay in school? No. Obviously, it's not concerning, right? In, in that situation, no. I, it's... It's not, but it, given the context of what I was hoping, I, you take the kid's desires into consideration, but at the end of the day, you, you want a team making that decision. And if you recall, you had just had two virtual days of school, I think the week before. Yes, leading up to Thanksgiving, uh, we did have days that were virtual. And we talked about this a little while ago. To your knowledge, if you recall, and if you don't, just please tell me, he'd only missed one day of school that school year. I, I know he had good attendance. I don't remember the exact days. With Mrs. Crumbly expressing that she and Mr. Crumbly had to return to work that day, and Mr. Crumbly's son expressing a desire to stay in school, you felt that it was okay for Mr. Crumbly's son to remain in school. I felt that I was not given full options at that point because really what I was left trying to decide between was I have parents saying they have to return to work. I have a student that I don't want left alone. Um, 
And so that's when I asked Mr. Ejack, is there anything from a discipline standpoint, is there any reason he can't stay in school? Is there anything you need to do? Um, and then I made the decision, I, I made a judgment call based on what I, I had, is I didn't want a student potentially home alone. So based on the information that you had, you decided that it was okay for him to remain in school? I decided that that was the best decision I thought I could make on the information. Okay. Based on that meeting, Mr. Crumbly's son, to your knowledge, was not contemplating suicide. You said that he had suicidal ideations, but, that, ideations, but that's different than being actively suicidal. It is. Uh, the student stated that he was not, he was not actively suicidal. You knew that he had been to the gun range with his mom the weekend prior. Yes. You knew at a minimum that he had access to a firearm the weekend before because he went to the gun range. I knew that he had been to a gun range and that he used a firearm at a gun range, yes. You did not ask him on November 30th of 2021 if he had access to a firearm. I did not. You had no reason to look into whether or not he had access to a firearm. Would you agree with that? Based on the information that you had. It's easy to go in hindsight on a lot of things. Um, based on what my concerns were, I was concerned about student well-being. And again, you said it's easy to go in hindsight. So we know what happened within a couple hours of this meeting. Sure. We all in this courtroom know what happened. It's easy for us to look back and say that different decisions could have been made, right? I made the decisions I made based on the information I had. At the time? At the time. You don't have the benefit of hindsight at 10.40 or 10.50 a.m. on November 30th of 2021. Is that fair? I had 90 minutes of information. You suggested that his parents find a therapist for him to talk to or evaluate him. I did. You have had experience with parents who have refused to provide mental health treatment to their child. Is that, is that accurate? Do you recall that? Off the top of my head, I'm not recalling a specific instance of that. If it occurred, do you remember uh, testifying previously about that? I, I don't, no. Okay. Would reviewing your testimony on that help to refresh your recollection? If we want to bring it up, sure. Yes. May I approach your honor? Sure. Thank you. If you would like to read the highlighted portions, Mr. Hopkins, thank you. You can just read that to yourself and let us know if it refreshes your recollection. Sure. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, so I, I've asked, um, like, if it's occurred, and I say it's not overly common, but I'm sure it does happen. Um, but. I'm giving a for instance of what we would do in that type of situation if it were to happen. Mayor Pro Sure. Thank you. So reviewing, based on what you just said, reviewing the transcript has helped to refresh your recollection. Well, what I'm stating in the transcript is in a situation where that could happen, that what we would do is involve CPS and make sure that the student is receiving ordinary care. In fact, in fact the question was... You told the jury what CPS is. Child Protective Services would be involved if that situation were to occur. In fact, the, the question was, thank you, okay, had you ever dealt with a kid at school who you felt needed psychiatric care and yet the parents didn't provide it in some fashion or another? Your answer was, yes, that had occurred. And then I go on to explain what would happen in that type of situation. Right. You said it's not a really common, it does happen. If it did happen, this is what we would do. Correct? Correct. And I know I've asked this a couple of times, but you didn't have any reason to believe on November 30th of 2021 that James Crumbly or his wife were not going to follow through and obtain a therapist for their child to talk to? I didn't have enough time to know if that would happen or not. Um, given our context of our conversation, no, I didn't have reason to believe that at that time. If you recall, the meeting with Mr. Crumbly and his wife and their son concluded at approximately 10.50 in the morning? That sounds about right, yes. Um, their son left the room first, if you recall, and went back to class? Yes. The shooting occurred at approximately, began at approximately 12.51 p.m. that day. Okay. After
after you heard that there was a shooter at the school, you did not immediately suspect that it was Mr. Crumley's son, if you remember. I did not. In fact, you didn't suspect that it was Mr. Crumley's son until you looked into his attendance after the shooting. Correct. This is also after Mr. Crumley's son had already been arrested. Quite a bit after this. I'm going to talk about just a few things. Just go back to your direct testimony with the prosecutor. You said that calling a parent in is a high level of concern. Yes. And that could be a concern for appropriate behavior. It could be, yes. It could be a concern for the student's well-being. It could be. It could be a concern that the student needs immediate care or help. Yes. It could be for any number of reasons. A high level of concern is dependent on the situation. Is that fair? Yes, I would agree. Your concern with going to... Mr. Crumbly's son's class on November 30th of 2021 is you specifically mentioned that you went because it's it doesn't raise it doesn't basically raise concern or, or red flags if a counselor goes down to get a student out of class. Yes, that is true. Um, and I had very little information at that point as to what was going on. So I wanted to to make sure to do it. And I knew that the dean wanted me involved in the conversation. Um, so I knew that student support was at least a potential plan at that point. When you were discussing, you said that um, you told Mr. Crumbly's son while you were meeting with him before his parents got there that you wanted his parents to get him help. Do you remember discussing that with the prosecution? I do. Okay. At that time, Mr. Crumbly's son didn't say, thank goodness, I've been begging my parents for help and they haven't given it to me. I'm not sure many students would. He didn't say, um, I'm glad you're going to ask them because I've asked them and they didn't listen. He did not say that, no. He didn't say, I, I really need this and I'm really glad that you're, that you're doing this for me. He did not. He didn't say any of that. No, which also would not be, it, it's not uncommon for students to not have a big response to something like that. If he had said any of those things, obviously your reaction would be different when Mr. Crumbly and his wife got to the school. It would be different information that I did not have, yes. <laughs> and when Mr. Crumbly and his wife were at the school, they also didn't say anything about, or Mr. Crumbly didn't say anything specifically about, um, wow, Son, you, you, you really did need some help. You've been asking me for it, right? No. The discussion was simply looking at the math assignment, the modified math assignment, and then Mr. Crumbly expressing to his son, you know you have people to talk to, right? That was a piece of it over the 10 minutes, yes. That, um, that they've talked. Mr. Crumbly and his son have yep. spoken. He did, he did say that they talked. When discussing the impact of Mr. Crumbly's son's friend leaving, you don't know that Mr. Crumbly's son had ever expressed how significant that impact was on him. Is that I, fair? Until had, sitting in your office. I had very little context, even when he was in my office, over what that was. All I knew was that a friend had left recently and moved, and that was hard. All right, it looks like we got some movement in the courtroom. Looks like they're back from lunch. We're going to take that live now. Shit.
Your Honor, calling people versus James Crumbly, case number 22279989 FH. Thank you, Marquis. On behalf of the people. Karen McDonald on behalf of the people. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Marielle Lehman on behalf of James Crumbly. Who is the next witness? Uh, Special Agent Brett Brandon, Judge. All right, you ready for the jury? May we approach briefly, Your Honor? Thank you. Microphone.
Do you want to be excluded from the courtroom? Do you want to be excluded from the courtroom? No, not especially. Okay. Are you ready for the jury? People ready. the jury what role you you're playing here today and during this trial um, one of the officers in charge of this case okay and what does that mean uh, it means that I've been uh, assigned with Lieutenant Willis to uh, usher this investigation through the uh, prosecution okay this this Lieutenant Willis yes okay. he's normally sitting right here he's also an officer in charge yes okay and can you tell the jury what your occupation is yes I'm a special agent with the Bureau of Alcohol Tobacco Firearms and Explosives uh, it's commonly referred to as just ATF. And what does the ATF do? Uh, the ATF enforces uh, uh, the nation's uh, firearms, arson, and explosive laws. Obviously, we, we primarily focus on the firearms laws. And so you're employed by the state or the federal government? The federal government. Okay. As part of that, well, I'm sorry, let me get to this. A little bit about your um, experience and background um, that brings you here to testify. How long have you been a special agent how long have you been with the ATF? Uh, it'll be 15 years in July. Okay, how long have you been a special agent? I've uh, been a special agent for, it'll be approaching 11 years in July. And what, what does special agent mean? A special agent, so if it means we're a criminal investigator trained in investigating for the purposes of ATF, the crime underneath the jurisdiction of ATF, but also we assist with other federal investigations and obviously state and local investigations 
uh, for ATF primarily involving the use of firearms. And what is your educational background? Uh, I have a degree from Oakland University uh, with, in political science. Uh, I spent one year at, uh, at law school at the Catholic University of America, and then obviously I was, I was trained uh, at the ATF National Academy for the requisite training to become an ATF agent. Is part of your role in the, the ATF based, you, 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 you're based in Michigan and live in Michigan? Yes. Okay. Do you have um, any interaction with state investigations? And if so, what are they? Yes, I've had many throughout my career. Right now I'm assigned to the Pontiac Gun Violence Task Force. It's a partnership between the Oakland County Sheriff's Office and the ATF. Um, in that uh, role, um, we investigate both state and federal firearms violations occurring within the city of Pontiac, mm -hmm. primarily uh, shootings. And do you ever respond to or have anything to do with investigations that don't involve shootings? Yes. What kind of? Uh, so generally, uh, for whether it's the task force or just a, as, a, as a, an ATF agent, uh, it's primarily the criminal possession and use of firearms. So in other words, it doesn't have to be a shooting. It could just be a possession of sure, firearms? Sure, yeah. okay. yes. About how many uh, shooting investigations have you been a part of? Oh, uh, hundreds at this point in my career. And do you, as a part of in your role, have a general understanding of um, the laws associated with purchasing firearms, both in the state and federally, or just federally? Uh, both, specific to this investigation, it would, be, it would be both, yes. Okay. Can you tell the jury what FFL stands for? Yes, so an FFL is a federal firearms licensee. I think we heard testimony I've seen here before um, from uh, Kami Beck. She was the employee from the gun store in Oxford, as we're referring to it. Uh, <clears throat> that would be a federally licensed uh, gun store, which is the technical term for that, is a federal firearms licensee. And in order to become a, a licensee, uh, what, what does that uh, seller have to do or comply with? So there, there's a, uh, an application process that they have to go through with the ATF to become a federal firearms licensee. And then, as a, as a, um, are there guidelines or, or requirements they must follow? Yes. All right. We're going to get to that in a minute. Do you do you know uh, James Crumbly? I do. And how did you come to know James Crumbly? Uh, I became aware of who James Crumbly was on um, the date of the shooting on, on November thirtieth, two thousand twenty-one, uh, and I had contact with him inside of his residence during uh, an execution of a search warrant that night. Do you see him in the courtroom here today? I do. Can you describe something he's wearing? Uh, he's wearing uh, a white shirt, a blue tie, and uh, headphones. May the record reflect he's properly identified the defendant, Your Honor. The record will reflect in-court identification of the defendant, James Conley. Thank you. What, if anything, did you review uh, in your role as officer in charge in this case? Uh, a, a vast amount of information. So um, there would be uh, the returns of seven cell phones that were forensically attracted, uh, social media returns, um, financial information, uh, firearms records, including from the uh, federal firearms licensee, um, and, and other documents and records, and uh, surveillance video, obviously. You were in the court. Were you in the courtroom when Ed Wagrowski testified about forensic cell phone data? Yes. And do you have? Do, can you tell the jury what software or program you used? He yes. Used? Objection, yes. Your Honor. Uh, the question is what. Officer, or I'm sorry, Mr. Wagrowski used. I don't know that Mr. Brandon, Agent Brandon, knows that. I, I corrected myself in that question purposely to say what you use. Are you aware of what what was the investigation tool they used and what the ATF? What the ATF? They both did. I'm trying to lay a foundation. Are you aware of? Is, may I ask the questioner? Go ahead. Are you aware of, of that tool? Yes, it was the same tool. So Detective Gorowski used uh, Cellbrite to put it in a readable format when he spoke about a readable format. It's Cellbrite, and that's the format that I reviewed the forensic attractions in. Okay, which is what I was trying to get at. You, you have experience. Do you have experience in this investigation reviewing the Cellbrite information, which is the cell phone uh, data? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to draw your attention to November 30th of 2021, um, and... Uh, ask you to first explain uh, where you were uh, when you heard about the shooting. So I was in the, uh, the ATF headquarters for the, uh, the Detroit Field Division is in downtown Detroit. I was in an office uh, that I shared at the time with my partner. 
Um, and the assistant special agent in charge at the time uh, came in. He knew I was from the Orient Oxford area and let me know that there was a shooting at Oxford High School. You were you currently are there or you grew up there? Both. All right. What what did you do? Um, I grabbed my bag and I ran out the door. Did you um, go with anyone else? Was the it, was it discussed about what you were planning on doing? What the plan was? Who was going? Who wasn't going? No, I just ran out the door and got to my car um, in the uh, parking structure, turned on the lights and sirens, and then drove up uh, I-75 uh, in towards the direction of Oxford High School. Do you typically work with a partner? Yes. Was he there that day? He was. Did you let him know you were going, or did he come with you? Uh, at the time, at the beginning, uh, at the time, no, I, I didn't let him know. He was out, stepped out for a minute, and I, um, uh, I didn't even think about it. I was so focused on getting to the school. Okay. Uh, about how long or does it take to get from Detroit to Oxford School? Uh, it depends on traffic. It could be an hour. It could be more. It could be a little bit less, just depending on uh, the time of day. And did you have a familiarity with the area? Yes. Okay. What, if anything, did you know about that incident when you left? All I knew when I left was that there was a shooting. Um, as I drove northbound, I did receive information from our intelligence unit that there was a confirmed shooting. It uh, was not a um, false alarm. Okay. And what did you do as a result of that? Uh, I continued to drive uh, north on I-75. Um, and uh, at, at some point, I believe it was in Troy, met up with other law enforcement forming like a caravan like others have tested, uh, Detective Wagrowski testified to, um, traveling north on 75 and then getting to the exit at exit 81 where the old palace of Auburn Hills used to be. Um, so the caravan, were there other people on the highway? Yes. There were, did all this whole caravan, was it just law enforcement? Uh, it was It was law enforcement. I believe at one point there was even a news truck trying to follow the, the caravan. I wasn't sure if they were aware, but I, they, I think they were just running parallel with the uh, caravan. And were there, was it licensed sirens? Yes. Okay. What kind of rate of speed? I was, it was very fast, but it was as, as safe as we could be. Okay. Can you tell the jury and describe what it was like driving up to Oxford School that day? Your Honor, I'm going to object to the relevance. Yeah, why is it relevant? Because uh, he's describing the scene and what he did and how he got into the school, um, and it was the, the scene of the shooting, and he was part of the investigation of the shooting. Okay, so start there. So you arrive at the scene, you arrive at Oxford High School. Is that where you went first? Yes. Okay. Can you describe the scene in terms of, was it easy to get there? Were there cars? Were there students? Uh, so as, as we're getting to the school through, obviously, Lake Orion and Oxford, it's travel through there. Um, you know, all the cars were parked on the right side of the road. And so, you know, um, it was almost like the left lane, there were no cars in it. And people knew what was going on at that point. It's, it, 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 it had seemed that that word had spread because no one was moving. It wasn't just like you normally would get over and then get back over in the left lane. People were just parked on the road. Um, as I got in uh, towards the, the school, um, I started noticing that there was a large group of people at the mire, um, and obviously learned later that that was the reunification point. Uh, when I arrived at the school, um, there were uh, a lot of law enforcement personnel. I don't I can't even put a number on it. It was, it was dozens, maybe a hundred, uh, in the main vestibule area where like the front offices were located. Um, and I so when you arrived, were there more than one law enforcement agency? Was there more than one represented? Yes, there were. There were quite a few. Okay. Did you know anything about where the um, alleged shooter was? Where wh whether there were victims? What? What did you know when you approached the building? At that point, uh, I had a conversation with someone in our intelligence group that had confirmed related information uh, that they had received that uh, there were fatalities, there were injured, uh, there were injured victims. Um, did you know whether or not the shooter was in custody? No, I, I didn't. Uh, I assumed that uh, I didn't hear any, any gunfire when I got to the school, so I, I assumed that either the shooter was in custody or it was a barricade. I, I wasn't sure what was going on, but I knew that it was not an active shooting scene. Uh, did you do anything before you entered the building? Did you were you carrying a weapon? Were you? Yeah, so I, I you know um, put on my vest and then ran to the front of the school with other people from the parking lot that were approaching the school. 
Um, as I got closer, I, uh, the person at the door verified my identity as a law enforcement officer, and then at that time uh, was informed that the shooter was in custody and that they were starting uh, kind of to figure out who was going to be responsible for what inside of the school. As you can imagine, it was a very chaotic scene. And okay. that's, you mentioned a vestibule when you uh, earlier. What what do you mean? It was like the front area in front of like a, the front of the school where you'd have like offices where you'd check in if you were you know, taking your kid out sick for the day. Um, it was the main office area, um, and that's where I was directed to, to meet with Lieutenant Willis, who was the identified as being the officer in charge of the scene. Is there a difference between the phase of clearing a crime scene versus evidence collection? Yes. Can you tell the jury what the difference is and when, what comes first and, and what, that, what that is like? Sure. So uh, at least the way ATF is trained, it would be an active shooter response would be to train and, and to, to find and eliminate the threat. After that has occurred, you have a clearing of the school, a tactical clearing of the school to ensure there's no other bodies, secondary devices, or things of that nature. Um, in this instance, it became, became clear that there were two things going on at once. There was people uh, volunteering to clear the school for a second time, and then there was uh, Lieutenant Willis who was directing more of the investigative aspects of this case. When you arrived, where uh, do you know if you know about what time you arrived? I don't, I don't recall exactly what time I arrived, no. Okay. Were there still students in the school? Uh, not, not. If there were, uh, and they, if they were in classrooms, I wasn't aware of it. I did not see any students when I got to the school. Is was part of your role to uh, engage in in clearing the school? So generally, yes. With ATF, we would be involved in, in clearing the school, the active shooter response, the clearing of the school, and then the investigation. I mean, when you got there that day, did you did you help clear the school? I did not. I. Uh, Based on the fact that the investigation had, had started, that the shooter was in custody and they had the weapon um, secured, I thought the best use of my abilities as, a, as an ATF agent would be to start the trace of the firearm to determine uh, how it ended up there. Okay. Um, you just said you, you found Lieutenant Willis. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Where was he standing? He was standing in, in front of the school offices. Um, at one point, he was standing on a chair directing people around. Like I said, it was a very, very chaotic um, but uh, I found Mr. Uh, Lieutenant Willis, and I believe someone had told him I would be coming to help trace the firearm, and, and that's when I went over and, and uh, located it. And before that, did, had you ever met Lieutenant Willis? No. Okay. And um, what, what happened next? Uh, so Lieutenant Willis held up a uh, trash bin that had uh, the murder weapon, um, several magazines, ammunition, and the shooter's cell phone inside, and I was able to take uh, photographs of it. Okay. A trash bin, a, a, a plastic trash bin? A yes, so a trash bin, not, not a uh, uh, one you throw like a school lunch in, but like a small one you have in like an office, like a square or rectangle trash bin. And, and if you know, what was it doing there? Or how did it get there? Uh, it was my understanding that that evidence was placed in there to keep it safe while they were continuing to clear the school. Okay. And uh, you said he held it up, and then what happened? Uh, I took photographs of the evidence, uh, specifically the markings on the firearms that I the firearm that I needed to uh, start the tracing process. And when you say markings, what what do you mean by markings? So the um, firearms are required to have a make, model, and a serial number. Those three items are necessary to start the trace for ATF to determine where it was first sold. Did you actually physically uh, pick up the the weapon? I, I don't believe so. I don't think we wanted to uh, we wanted to preserve the evidence. I believe that the firearm was already flipped in a way that had the markings visible. Uh, I believe I just took a photograph of it and then provided that information to the intelligence group that would initiate the actual digital part of the trace. Okay. Um, once you did that, what did you do next? Uh, so once once that process was uh, in was had been started. Um, I went to Lieutenant uh, Sam Marsban, who I had known uh, from the Oak County Sheriff's Office based on prior investigations and, uh, in Pontiac, and asked what, what could be done, what needed to be done. And at that time, I began uh, collecting um, facts for the timeline for a search warrant affidavit for the Crumley's uh, family residence. Okay. Did you... Well, we'll get we'll get to that. As part of your investigation, did you ever look at the the surveillance video of the shooting? Yes. Okay. Um, before we get to that, did you what what are the steps, uh, and how long does it take to trace to trace a firearm through the ATF? So every tra every the timing of every trace is going to be different based on the records and how fast they're able to get to ATF. So it'll help you to understand 
the tracing process starts with those three things, right? The make, model, and serial number of the firearm. Once you have that information and you, you input it, um, you can trace it back to the first manufacturer, right? And when the manufacturer is then contacted by ATF, they can tell you which federally licensed gun store they sold it to, and then that gun store has to tell you who was the first person that purchased that firearm. And did you uh, learn who that was? Yes, it was an individual in Rochester, Michigan, who had obtained the firearm from the gun store in Oxford. And then was that person contacted? Yes. And were they contacted by, by you or someone on your team? Uh, it, was, it was two ATF agents assigned uh, to the same division I was assigned to. And what, what did they learn? They learned that that individual had sold the firearm back to the Oxford gun store um, sometime in early September. And then what did they do? Uh, they went to the gun store and spoke uh, to Ms. Cammie Back, who testified previously, and learned that the firearm was indeed, in fact, purchased by uh, Mr. Crumley on November uh, 26, 2021. So four days earlier? Yes. Okay. Um, and if we can stop for a moment, did you just say September? I meant November. I'm okay, sorry. thank yeah. you. Thank you, too. Mr. Keith, who pointed that out. Um, November, correct? November, okay. yes. And, yeah. uh, if we want to stop here for a moment, um, walk us through a general purchase of a firearm through a federally um, uh, firearm licensee. Sure. So if you walk into a gun store today to buy a firearm, um, you'd have to fill out what uh, Ms. Back testified was called an ATF Form 4473. It would have information about yourself as well as information about the firearm you're purchasing. The, the uh, FFL employee then would contact the uh, National Instant Criminal Background Check System, the NICS system, through the FBI. Um, and once they're uh, given the okay to sell you the firearm, they proceed with that. Do you do you know if that that protocol and procedure was followed here? Yes, in this it was. case. All right. Uh, you you just stated that in order to to buy a firearm, you have to have go through all those um, steps. Uh, is that all guns? Do you have to have to go through this process? So for every firearms uh, sale from a federally firearm li federal firearms licensee, you do have to fill out the ATF 4473 and have those steps be fulfilled, yes. Does that include all guns, long guns and pistols? Yes. Okay. And are there differences in long guns versus pistols? Yes. In terms of who can buy them and where? Uh, yes, in terms of age and, and things like that, there are different restrictions on the types of firearms you're purchasing. Okay, and in general, how would you describe the um, restrictions on what, what is more restricted and less restricted? Sure, so uh, under federal uh, law, if you're going to buy a firearm from a federal firearms licensee, you have to be 21 years of age to buy a handgun and 18 to buy a long gun. That would be either a rifle or a shotgun. All right, um, and what about registering a weapon? So there's, there's no federal requirement for registration of a weapon. Uh, there is, however, obviously based on my experience in this case and others through the task force work, I'm aware obviously in Michigan that there are certain registration requirements for handguns. And why the, the same requirements for long guns? No. And do you know why that is? Objection, Your Honor, speculation. I, Only if you know, did, did you I say have to this? ask him first if he knows that's what I'm trying to do. Did you say in the state there is a federally, but there's a state? Correct. Okay. State addition. Through your position in the ATF, do you know why? I think that's my question. Yes, I thought you did. State of Michigan. It is the state of Michigan. Yes. Thank you. Uh, do you know why there are more restrictions on handguns? Uh, I believe it's due to concealability. Okay. Uh, under state law, um, who can register a weapon? Under state law, uh, register a handgun. Yes. Sir. Okay. So uh, under state law, you can register a handgun at 18 years old, um, but obviously you can't buy one until you're 21 from a federal firearms licensee. So you can, in one way, buy a, a private sale from someone that's 18 to someone that's over 18 uh, and then register that firearm. So I have seen through previous experience that you could register a weapon at 18, uh, a handgun, um, but you could not purchase that handgun from a uh, federally licensed gun store, if that makes sense. Okay. Were you made aware at some point if James Crumbly owned any other weapons other than the weapon he purchased on November 26th? Yes. Your Honor, I'm going to object to the reference of a, of a weapon. I, I don't. I think it's a, a vague question. I think what um, Agent Brandon is aware of is alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives. 
Um, I think that the classification of, of a weapon is, is vague. If, if the prosecution is asking about firearms or handguns or pistols, then I think that that should be the question and not specifically a weapon. Well, this response can clarify that. Correct, Your right. right. So go ahead. Uh, you were made aware um, what what other uh, um, see, I, the reason I'm using weapon is because I, I don't want to specify because I'd be leading, so I'm trying to get him to to explain it without asking a leading question. Um, were you were you you were made aware what what did he uh, also own or purchase? If you know. So in June of that year, he had also purchased a uh, Cobra Classic Derringer and also a Keltec P17. Uh, 22 caliber pistol from that same gun store in Oxford. So that was about five months earlier. Yes. Okay. Both of, were both of those guns bought at the same time. Uh, they were bought within several days of each other, within days of each other, but they were not bought at the same time. And how did, did the gun store have any record of those sales? Yes. What What was it? So they had the uh, 4473 documenting the sale of the Derringer, as well as a sales receipt. And a Michigan pistol sales record documenting the sale to Mr. Crumbly for both the uh, the Derringer and the Caltech pistol. Okay. The so you've indicated now three separate handguns. Is that do I have that right? Yes. Okay. Um, all right. I am going to start asking you in about each of these handguns and describe the difference in, in each. I'm putting on gloves because these are this is evidence and I'm gonna touch it with my gloves on. Um, and the first, uh, the first um, handgun I'm gonna ask you about is the handgun purchased on November 26th. Do you know what type of handgun it was? Yes. What was it? It was a six hour SP 2022. Uh, with a, a specified serial number. And so was it a 9 millimeter? Yes, it was. Okay. This is not, this is not. All right. So before I do that, Special Agent Brandon, what is the this the way to handle a, a, a handgun safely before you even pick it up? I'm, I'm, I know there are firearm safety guidelines, but how do you make sure when you're handling a weapon for the first time that you're doing so in a safe way before <laughs> object relevance, right? Response. I think the um, the the element of, of the crime that that the defendant is charged with goes back to a legal duty in handling and storing a, a firearm, and so I absolutely think it's relevant. Okay, do you mean picking it up or in every way? Okay, I'm gonna allow. Thank you. How how do you safely pick up a handgun? Sure. So, it, based on the fact, so there is a zip tie in it, so everyone is aware that the firearm has been made safe already, but um, for the purposes of this, so if you, if you pick up the firearm, you want to keep it pointed in a safe direction, you want to keep your finger off the trigger, and you want to visu visually and physically inspect the chamber of the weapon and the magazine level weapon to make sure that it's not loaded. Okay, so I'm going to pick up this. We know that this, is this the murder weapon? Yes, it is. All right. And we know that this has a zip tie in it. Correct. Okay. Um, Can you specify what exhibit number that is? Yes, I'm sorry. 163. 163. I think it's either admitted or there's no objection to it. Correct. Okay. This is a murder weapon. There's a zip tie in it. Um, but if, even if there isn't, the, the general um, principle is to make sure the firearm is safe. You want to. You just said you physically examined the magazine well. Is, is that this right here? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And then... You also have to do a second step, did you say? Yeah, so the same thing. So I would say physically and visually inspect the, the chamber of the weapon. So down the barrel, if you look down the barrel right so there. So right yeah, here? And to make sure there's not a round inserted into the, the chamber of the firearm. Okay. And again, there's a zip tie in here. But uh, in order to, to comply with that, you have to physically inspect to make sure there's no round in this chamber. Correct. And why? what's the reason for that? Uh, so with, with firearm, there's there's four basic principles of firearm safety. I, I mentioned two of them. Number one is to treat every firearm like it's loaded. Number uh, two is to point the firearm in a safe direction. Three would be keep your finger off the trigger. And then obviously not for court purposes, but if you're at a, a range or shooting, is to, to be mindful of your target and what's beyond it. Uh, at least that's the way ATF trains the four pillars of firearm safety. Um, so the purpose would be to make sure that firearm's not loaded, that in case the, the trigger was 
in, accidentally or, or uh, uh, unintentionally discharged that there's not an actual round in the chamber to be discharged. Is it possible for a firearm to discharge without touching the, um, the actual trigger? That would depend on a lot of different factors, including the, the type of firearm. Okay. I can't, probably can't answer that question. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you, you mentioned earlier that you have to identify certain markings. Um, where are, and I'm going to give you some gloves if you don't mind. We practice with the gloves, so it doesn't make this long, but it's still... Okay, um, if you wouldn't mind standing, if, the ju if that's okay with the judge, okay. um, I'm going to hand this, this uh, uh, um, handgun to you, safely pointed down, so you can show the jury what markings um, you're, you're talking about to identify the weapon. So as you can see right here, it's kind of hard to see with the light, but it says Sig Sauer, that would be the manufacturer. And then you have the serial number as well as the caliber generally also uh, stamped on there as well. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to put this safely back into its box. Um, and then do you, do you know what these are? Yes, those are the pistol magazines that come with the Six Hour SP 2022. Okay. And just in case there are people on the jury that don't have a familiarity with handguns, um, what what are these for? What's inside here usually? So in a semi-automatic pistol, uh, you would load your ammunition. Those magazines, I believe, contain uh, can take up to 15 rounds. So you'd load the 9mm ammunition uh, to capacity to 15 rounds and then insert that into the uh, firearm. And then once you send the slide forward, that is what allows a round to be chambered into the firearm to be ready to be uh, discharged. So it has a 15-round capacity. So it would have a 15-round magazine capacity. Uh, you could also fit one round in the chamber. So that firearm has a total capacity of 16 rounds. Before you would have to reload. Yes. Okay. Um, so, can you explain to the jury what semi-automatic means? So a semi-automatic firearm means that for every pull of the trigger, it only fires one uh, projectile from the firearm, uh, as opposed to a automatic uh, firearm, which would be that if you pull the trigger one time, multiple rounds are dispelled from the firearm with one pull of the trigger. The other two weapons you stated were a Derringer and a, and a 22, correct? Uh, it was a 22 caliber Derringer and a 22 caliber Cobra Classic, uh, or a uh, 22 caliber Caltech pistol. Okay, so Caltech. All right. What um, what is the difference between the those two guns and a nine millimeter? So a, a Caltech, uh, the Caltech pistol is also a semi-automatic pistol. It's just uh, chambered in 22 caliber as opposed to nine millimeter. It's a smaller round, um, and uh, the Darren. And, and again, you say round, and I think for lay people they think of that as many. But what do you what do you mean when you say round? So I know that there's been some talk in this trial about bullets. Bullets are the part of the, fire, the the piece of ammunition that comes out of the firearm when it's shot. The uh, the round of ammunition is what's inserted into the magazine before it's fired. Um, that has the you know the cartridge fired cartridge case, the bullet itself, and then some type of propellant or uh, powder, usually smokes powder. Okay, so a bullet is what comes out of the shell casing and is expelled from uh, the, the chamber, but a round includes the shell casing and the bullet and any kind of, what was the last thing? Yes, it would be like the, the powder that's used to, uh, to yeah, the, yeah. so okay. it would be the, the round of ammunition is the actual full piece of ammunition prior to being fired. Okay, uh, and does the twenty two that... That James Crumley owned, does it does it shoot or fire faster? Does it have a, a, a larger capacity magazine? So I'm not I'm not uh, an expert on, on ballistics and traveling the speed on of firearms, but as far as capacity goes, it's a uh, it's got I think the Caltech P17 has a 17 round total capacity, um, but the actual uh, round of ammunition itself, the nine millimeter versus the 22, the nine millimeter is going to be uh, a wider round, so the what the caliber refers to is the diameter of the bore, the inside of the barrel. Uh, so it means that the 9mm round is bigger, 
and uh, and based on the, the size of the round, it's it's got more. Um, uh, it's going to be heavier, so the damage from that round would be more than a twenty-two caliber round. Does that make sense? Uh, what what kind of um, handgun does law enforcement usually carry? Nine millimeter, generally. From at ATF, we carry a nine millimeter. Most of the departments and agencies I, I work with carry nine millimeters. And do you know why, Your Honor? I would object to relevance. How is it relevant? It goes to the the power um, and the use for a nine millimeter versus the the weapon that. Uh, the, the two handguns that James Crumbly already owned? I, I guess I would have normally agreed with you, but we've heard um, testimony in this trial um, that the shooter was intent um, even after the family owned two other guns on having his father buy a 9 millimeter. So I'm, I'm going to allow it. Thank you. Can you tell the jury why law enforcement usually carries a 9 millimeter, or, or you do with ATF? If, sure. you know, if you know. Sure. So my understanding, based on, on, on the reasoning that ATF uses and other agencies, is that it's a uh, it's a it has a, it's a powerful round that can be used to neutralize a threat. It's not going to over penetrate, and the uh, advancements in ballistics have made a nine millimeter uh, the ideal round for law enforcement for uh, for for using in defense. And to put this into context. The hundreds of shooting investigations that you conducted or have, have been a part of, uh, do you are those are those done normally with a 22 or 9 millimeter or something else? If you can, if you can say sure. generally, I, I don't think I, I I can't recall working a, a shooting with more than one victim involving a 22 caliber firearm. I, I can't recall several uh, shootings that I've worked in the past with multiple victims involving a 9 millimeter. All right, thank you. I'm going to put this back in the evidence box and hand it to. Lieutenant Willis, who is in charge of... Turner, may we approach, please? All right, thanks for watching with Fox 2 Detroit. Looks like the attorneys are approaching the bench to discuss some things with the judge. The trial should continue momentarily. You've been hearing from Brett Brandon. He's an ATF special agent. He was assigned to this case, uh, and particularly he was assigned to the Oxford High School shooting investigation. What the ATF does is it protects communities from the illegal use of violent criminals, criminal organizations, the illegal use of trafficking, of firearms, the illegal use of storage explosive, acts of arson and bombings terrorism and the illegal diversion of alcohol and tobacco products. Again, this is Brett Brandon. Right now what they're doing is they're kind of going through the science behind the weapon that was used on the day of the shooting. Uh, he says that typically these, um, the type of gun that was used here has a capacity of 15 rounds uh, with the additional round in the chamber, could be fired up to 16.
cutting off the zip ties and putting new ones on. I uh, racked the slide three times, made sure there was no round in the chamber, and then myself and Lieutenant Willis installed zip ties on firearms. Okay, so there's a zip tie in this? Yes. Okay. And, um, again, can you tell the jury what this is? What caliber weapon this is? Yes, that's a 22 caliber uh, pistol. Okay. And, um, in a moment, we're going to see um, the, the defendant's son handling um, a, a video. Is this, is this the weapon? that he was handling in that video. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to hand this to you because I'd like you to explain to the jury um, how to safely handle this weapon in terms of what the safety means on and off. Um, can, can you do that? Yes. Okay. Sure. So this is the uh, Caltech P-17 pistol. Um, so it's it's not an official phrase, but it's what one a lot of people use is red means dead. So when the safety is off, you can see the red dot. So to engage the safety, you have to, you know, put the safety up. I don't think it's going to do that now with the, oh, it'll go up now. Yeah, with the zip tying, sometimes it's hard to get the sliding all the way forward. But now the safety would be engaged. So if you pull the trigger, it would, it's not supposed to fire. Um, and when you come back down, that means red means dead. That means the safety is off. Okay. And that, um... Is this also, do you use a magazine with this gun? Yes. Okay. And how many rounds, if you know, does it hold? 16 rounds in the chamber, one round in the, uh, or in the, mag in the magazine, one round in the chamber for a total of 17. Okay. <clears throat> Were there um, any gun cases recovered in the home. Yes. All right. Um, I'm handing you what's exhibit, People's Exhibit 166. Uh, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, this is the uh, pistol case that goes with the uh, Caltech P-17 pistol that I was just holding. Uh, it was located in the kitchen under the, um, I guess the island in the, in the kitchen of the Crumley residence. Okay, and can you, if, if you wouldn't mind standing and showing how that is opened and what it looks like. I mean, this is the uh, six hour, the cable lock that comes with the six hour pistol that was we're, uh, we're gonna get to that. inside the Caltech box. So this is exhibit, proposed exhibit 42. Um, this case was, was this, was this cable lock found in this case? Yes. Okay. And you said it was located in the kitchen? Yes. Where exactly in the kitchen, if you know? Uh, I believe it was one of the cabinets underneath the island of the kitchen or a kitchen cabinet. Okay. Was there any gun in it? No. Okay. Thank you. That's the Caltech box, right? This yes, is the, This is the Caltech box, 166. All right. And um, was there any other case found in the home? Yes, one gun case. Okay, I want to just, just make the distinction here. Is there a difference between a gun case and a gun safe? Yes. Okay. What 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 is it? And when I'm saying safe, I mean a portable safe. Sure. So a gun a gun case is generally what comes from the manufacturer, um, or sometimes a, a gun store if they're selling you a used firearm will use a, an old gun case to send to give it with you. But the Keltec box I was just holding has two holes in it that can be locked. That's a gun case. That's what comes with. Uh, the purchase of a firearm, uh, specifically and a handgun, most of the time. Is this what you're talking about? Yes, there are okay. holes on both sides that a uh, locking mechanism could be run through to lock the case itself. Did you find any of those <coughs> locking mechanisms, or was it was it found just like this? Uh, there was there were no locking mechanisms in it when it was found. Okay, um, I'm going to hand you uh, People's Exhibit 167, and you might have to stand to show the jury so they can hear. What do you? Do you know what that is? Yes, this is a, uh, it, it's a, uh, a small pistol uh, safe, so it's got a, lock, a combination lock and, um, so it would just, you close the lock, it's typical of your standard combination lock, you close it, spin the dial, and have your, your combination code. And um, do you know where that was found in the house? Yes, it was. In the uh, on a TV stand in the Crumley, uh, Mr. and Mr. Mrs. Crumley's bedroom on the right hand side inside of a cabinet. All right, and were there anything? Was there anything in it? Yes. What was in it? 
So there was the uh, Keltec P17 pistol as well as a Derringer 20, uh, two shot, uh, 22 caliber uh, handgun as well, both inside this uh, safe. And that was the, the small uh, gun that, I, that we just showed the jury, correct? Correct, yeah, they both fit in here. And then the Caltech that you just showed them with the safety? Yes. Those that's, two weapons, That's okay. correct. So, there's a combination on this thing? Yes. And do you know um, what the combination was? was? Well, I know what it is. I just, I just opened it. It's zero, zero, zero. Okay. Was this the combination uh, at the time when this safe was found? Yes. Okay. Um, does the SIG fit in that gun case? It does not. The gun, gun, safe, gun safe? It does not fit. Even, even if it's just by itself without any other handgun? Correct. Okay. Was there any other case found in the home? Yes. And I'm going to hand you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 41. And what is this? This is the. Uh, you know, Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is the Sig Sauer uh, SP 2022, the murder weapon. Uh, this is the pistol case that would have came with it. Similar to the Caltech, it does have two holes uh, to be locked um, as well. Okay. And I'm going to. Open that. All right. And uh, where was this found, if you know? This was found on the uh, on top of the bed in the uh, Mr. and Mrs. Crumley's bedroom. Was there anything in it? Uh, at the time, no. It looked like this. Okay. Is there any? Was there anything underneath the phone? I, I learned later that there was. Yes. Okay. Can, do you want to tell the jury what that was? Yes. So there is a. Uh, a receipt for the SP uh, 2022 from the gun store in Oxford, as well as the uh, ATF Youth Handgun Safety Act notice pamphlet that was previously discussed. Okay, and is that something they have to provide? Yes. All right. Um, Special Agent Brandon, what was your reaction to finding that? What, when did you find that the, the pamphlet was in here? Uh, if you know. During it, for this pamphlet, I, I found that this was in the case during uh, preparation for uh, the trial of Mr. Mr. Crumley's wife. And did you know where it was at, um, up until that point? Yeah, I don't no. want to object to relevance on this line of questioning. About where it was? Mm -hmm. I guess I didn't really understand the question where that box was. So I don't want to put words in his mouth, but as an offer of proof, um, it was not clear to Special Agent Brandon, based on the crime scene and the, uh, and the search of the home, um, where the ATF pamphlet was that he knew must have had to have been sold with this gun. And he he picked up the phone and, and saw it sometime after, is what oh, he's saying. Okay. So not the case itself, Your Honor, but the, the pamphlet that was within the case along with the receipt. I, I'm objecting to the relevance of questions about that. Not the case itself. Okay, well, I think the, the pamphlet being sold with the gun is relevant and its location in the home as well. That's, I'm going to overrule the objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I'm going to ask him about the pamphlet and ask to read excerpts of the pamphlet. And I know that um, opposing counsel actually asked Ed, Ed Wagrowski to do that, so I, I, I'm hoping there's not an objection. Um, but I, I can lay a proper foundation if there is. Okay, did, did, now I don't know if he answered the question about where he found the pamphlet. Thank you, Your Honor. What was your um, reaction to that? To finding the pamphlet? Yes. So um, when I looked at the phone and saw the, the pamphlet in there, I was I was shocked. Okay, why? Yeah, as, as the pamphlet says on the front, it says, Youth Handgun Safety Act Notice. Um, means they were on notice. They had to pick this up and move it to the back of that gun case and basically discard it underneath the phone. Okay, and... Can you tell the jury what's the purpose of, of the, the law requiring that pamphlet to be given to someone purchasing a gun? The, pur the purpose of it? Do you want me to read from it? First, I want you to tell me the purpose, and then I want you to read from it. So the, the purpose of the, the pamphlet is to inform uh, the buyer of the firearm that, the, that juvenile gun violence is a major problem and that safely securing your firearm will prevent that from happening. Okay. And if you open it up, where, where does it refer to that? So on the first page it says Youth Handgun Safety Act Notice, and there's uh, two, there's four bullet points. 
the first says, the misuse of handguns is a leading contributor to juvenile violence and fatalities. And the second one says, safely storing and securing firearms away from children will help prevent the unlawful possession of handguns by juveniles, stop accidents, and save lives. Thank you. Your Honor, we've marked um, the, the pamphlet as, if, um, we're going to mark it as 168. I don't know if it was admitted previously. We did discuss it in other, throughout other witnesses. Okay, we move it for the initial. Yes. Any objection? No. 168. Alright. Um, I want to go back to make sure, like the Caltech box, there is the same, these two like little plastic loops. What, what are those? So those are the, the designed by the manufacturer so that the case is capable of being locked. So you could actually lock your pistol inside that case. Okay. When this was found, do you know if there was any locking mechanism in it at all? There were not. Okay. Um, were the were the, the three guns purchased uh, by James Crumbly, um, including the SIG for his son, were they did they have to be registered? So it's my understanding, based on prior investigation as part of the task force and as part of this case, that uh, the handguns were required to be uh, required to be registered in the state of Michigan. Yes. And um, what's the timing on that? So if you receive a pistol sales record from a, a federal firearms licensee in the state of Michigan, you have 10 business days to drop it off, or 10 days to drop it off at uh, like a local county sheriff's office, your local police department. Um, in this case, obviously, the, the, the murder weapon was purchased four days before, so there was still some time left to, to drop that off. Obviously, that, uh, that never occurred. Mm -hmm. Okay. Were there any, um, were any of those handguns registered? No. All right. Uh, I want to go back to November 30th for a moment, and um, you said you connected with Lieutenant Mars Van, and what was the purpose of doing that? Uh, so the purpose of, of connecting with him at the time uh, was to help in any way I could. He had started working on a search warrant from the Crum Crumley family residence, um, and as part of that, um, I offered my assistance uh, with whatever was necessary. Okay. Um, did you have to watch the surveillance video, or did you watch the surveillance video? Yes. Okay. Was um, there anything notable about it? Yes. There were there were three things that I'm watching the surveillance video from the, the, the shooting that I found relevant. And what were they? So the, the first was uh, the stance that the shooter took um, when, for the shot that, that killed uh, Tate. Um, I noticed that it, he had had some, some type of firearm training. It appeared to me that he did. I remember remarking to the people in the room at the time, but that's what I thought. Um, he had taken what we refer to as a shooter stance. His shoulders were rolled forward. His feet were, were spread. Um, so that was that was the first thing uh, that I noticed. Um, and what did that tell you? I, I thought he had some level of proficiency with firearms, whether he had been to a gun range, whether he had training, um, or, or just been at least introduced to firearms in the past. Okay. And then the second thing? So the second thing was what's called a tactical magazine exchange, or what some other departments call a combat reload. So uh, after uh, the shooter moved through the school, um, and after reloading his first magazine, his, his firearm was completely empty, so he loaded a fully loaded magazine into the firearm and continued to shoot. Um, after that, after se firing several rounds, he ejected that magazine, placed it in his pocket, and then inserted a full magazine into the firearm so that he was um, fully loaded in the firearm. And what's the purpose of that? Why is that significant? So the way we're trained, at least for, for law enforcement shootings, is that if you're involved in an incident, you always want to have as much ammunition as possible. So if you have a, a, a brief moment where the gunfire is low on the gunfire, if you're in a gunfight, would be to eject your partially loaded magazine, insert a full one, but not to throw it on the ground and keep it for later in case you need it. Okay. What's the third thing? So the third thing was when uh, the shooter came out of the bathroom and surrendered to law enforcement. Uh, prior to them coming down the hallway, he took the uh, magazine out of the firearm and made. He, did, he forgot to uh, ra or, uh, didn't rack it around out of the chamber, so there was still a round in the chamber, I believe. But he took the magazine out and placed it on top of a trash bin, uh, which I found uh, unique. Um, not something that someone would do if they had just committed a mass shooting. After viewing that, um, 
what did you do next as a result of, of noting those three things? So uh, my responsibility at the time was to help you know, Lieutenant Marsman create a, a timeline for the affidavit. Um, after noting those things, uh, I, the following day, the day after the shooting, I began uh, to start an investigation thinking that the shooter had been to a gun range, um, contacted a, a gun range in the area, and confirmed he had, in fact, been to the range. How did you know which... How did you pick that gun, that gun range? Uh, it's, it's probably the most popular gun range in the area and for driving distance from the Crumley residents. All right, and um, as a result of your investigation leading to looking at gun range visits, um, what was uncovered? So uh, at the gun range, we were able to, it was a gun range in Clarkston, um, able to uh, locate uh, surveillance video for, for two instances as well as receipts for visits. I believe there was... Uh, N numerous visits. I believe it was around eight total visits. And were there any other tools in the investigation you used to determine uh, visits to gun range and who was there and at what time? Yes. So in addition to the actual records and surveillance video, um, review, forensic review of the uh, extractions of the, uh, the uh, Mr. Crumley's cell phone as well as his son's and uh, Mrs. Crumley's uh, put together more visits to the ranges as well as videos of those instances. All right. Um, I'm going to show, um, just one moment here. Let's start with June 15th of 2021. Do you, um, do you know why that date's significant? Yes, that was the date uh, Mr. Crumley initiated the purchase for the, uh, the Derringer. Okay, and the slides um, in People's 169, uh, what are we looking at? This is a Facebook conversation between James and Jennifer Crumley on the 15th of June, 2021. Okay, now time, it says UTC minus 4, 11.34 a.m. Is that the actual time? Yes. Okay, and can you read the text? And Blue, who, who's, what does Blue indicate? Which person? Blue is uh, Jennifer Crumley. Green is going to be James Crumley. Okay, and can you read those texts? Yes, so, Jen so Jennifer Crumley asks, uh, talk at 12, and then uh, Mr. Crumley responds, taking Ethan to store at 12, and then Mrs. Crumley asks if you get gun. Okay, and then the next? Uh, Mr. He, Crumley... He's answering her? Yes. Okay. Mr. Crumley responds, yes, and Mo, I believe that's supposed to be no. Um, Jennifer responds, huh? And then James says, we paid for the gun and bought it, but can't pick it up till everything clears Washington, in parentheses, FBI. Could be today, tomorrow, or next day, they don't know. And then Mrs. Crumley responds, gotcha, bring me those fruit punch things when you come to bring him. All right. Uh, the the message about he had to wait, um, did you, through your investigation, reveal, did it reveal that that's consistent with what happened? Yes. Okay. And remind the jury why. So sometimes when you purchase a firearm, the background may take a little bit of time, depending on a lot of different factors. Um, and in this case, it... it it took enough time to where Mr. Crumley had to come back the next day to pick up the firearm. Okay, and then the next exhibit, People's 170. Do you know what that is? Yes, this again is uh, Facebook messages between James and Jennifer Crumley. Uh, Blue is, is Jennifer, and she says, how much is your gun? Uh, and Mr. Crumley replies, 300. All right. I'm going to show you what's been marked as, uh, and admitted as People's 29. Um, what this is a receipt for? Um, what is it for? Do you know? This is the receipt for the Cobra for the Derringer. Uh, this is dated 6:15. It says 16 at the 6:16 at the top, which is the date the actual sale went through, and it's for 180 dollars and 15 cents. So this is not 300 dollars. This is was there a gun he purchased that was 300 dollars that day? Approximately yes. And what gun was that? Uh, that would have been uh, the uh, Caltech P17 22 caliber pistol. Okay, so the Derringer, the small one, was 169, and this is the receipt for the Caltech. What else is on that receipt? Uh, it's two boxes of ammunition at 14.95. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to draw your attention to June 26, which is about 10 days later. Um, do you know if James Crumbly went to the gun range at that on that day? Yes. What? Oh, sorry. 
I'm sorry, I skipped a page. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, June 20th. Yes, that's um, correct. And the People's 171 is on the screen. Can you tell the jury what that was? What, what that is? Yes, this is, a, a, again, Facebook messages, messages between James and Jennifer Crumley. Uh, in blue, Jennifer asks, can you guys answer your phone? And then uh, James Crumley responds, no, at gun range, loud. All right. And people's... Did you find any videos um, through your investigation of the range on that day? Yes. And where'd you find it? Uh, on James Crumbly's cell phone. All right, and um, you're looking at 172 and 173. We're going to play those for the jury, but before you do, before we do, can you tell them what they're going to see? Yes, so the first video is at 12.58 p.m. on uh, June 20th, and it's uh, a video of the shooter's son uh, shooting the Caltech pistol at the gun range. And then the following video is a, a video of the shooter's of the um, the defendant's son shooting the uh, Derringer at an outdoor gun range uh, a couple minutes later. Okay. Same range. Both. Yes. shot his hand on the, uh, during the video. And why is that? He had his hand in front of the muzzle of the firearm. Okay, when you say he, who do you mean? Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, uh, the defendant, uh, Mr. Crumley's son. Okay, the shooter. Yes. All right. Did, did you know, did James send those videos to anybody that day? I, I'm, I don't recall if he sent them that day or the next day, but he did send them to uh, Mrs. Crumbly at some point. All right, and how do you know that? Uh, I reviewed her cell phone as well. Okay, and... Exhibit 174, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, so that is uh, one of the videos being sent on June 21st, 2021. All right, and the, this is two slides, or do you know? this two slides, can you do the next one? And then, is this the second video? Yeah, this is the, well, this is the, in, in the reverse order. So the first, the, the, they're both videos were sent from James Crumley to Jennifer Crumley on June 21st, 2021. Okay, so... These exhibits are him sending her the videos. Yes. All right. Were you? Did you learn if she what she did with the videos, if anything? Yes. She took one of the videos and uploaded it. Uh, I believe as an Instagram story. Okay. And that's exhibit one seventy five. post says in addition to the video. Sure. It says uh, Ethan and it tags, uh, I believe that's Mr. Crumley's Instagram account, um, both got handguns this week testing them out at the range. All right. And then now we're to drawing your attention to June 26th. Uh, did they go to the gun range that day? Yes. Do you know where it was? It was at the, the, the so for the rest of these I believe it's the indoor gun range in Clarkston, Michigan. Okay. And um, uh, exhibit 176, can you tell the jury what that is? Yep. This is a receipt uh, in the name of James Robert Crumley uh, on June 26, 2021 for one range, uh, uh, handgun range fee of $20 and then one small silhouette uh, target at 75 cents. Did Do you know if the videos were taken on that day? Yes. Do you know if they were sent to anyone? I do. 
And who are they? If, who are they sent to? Uh, Jennifer Crumble. Okay. Um, drawing your attention to Exhibit 177. <coughs> what is that? If you know. This is a video sent from Jennifer or from James Crumbly to Jennifer Crumbly of the shooter at the firearms range in Clarkston on June 26th. Okay. And is 178, which is admitted, I believe, um, is this the video that was taken and sent to, to Jennifer? Yes, this is actually, the, I believe, is the Instagram story that was created from that video okay. and uploaded to Instagram by Jennifer Crumbly. Can you tell from the video? Which, uh, which, which um, firearm he's using? Yes, that's the Caltech P17, uh, 22 caliber pistol. Okay. Drawing your attention to July second, uh, did you uncover any evidence that that James um, and his mother-in-law, Jennifer's mother, um, went to the range with the shooter? Yes. And how did you um, discover that? So there were messages between uh, James Crumbly and his mother-in-law on Facebook. Um, discussing a range visit. I think it's, the conversation occurs on July 2nd, 2021, but it's actually for a range visit occurring on, I believe, July 3rd, 2021. Okay, can you read that to the jury? Sure. So in blue is going to be uh, James Crumbly's mother-in-law. She says, still planning on taking uh, the shooter to the gun range tomorrow morning. Then lunch, is he still available and do we need to make reservations? Uh, Mr. Crumbly responds, he is good, no reservations needed, I'll go with you guys. Um, his mother-in-law replies, awesome, glad you could join us. We don't know what we are doing, LOL. And then, this is 377. 377. And then the next um, response from James? Uh, just take Maybe Road up to Dixie, turn left, and it will be on the right-hand side. Uh, the shooter will be excited. We will rent a few different guns. They have a special for 9mm on 25 for a box of 50. Uh, his mother-in-law re uh, replies, sounds great. Uh, Mr. Crumbly says, make it closer to 1045. Right, and do we have any video from that day? We do not. Uh, do we know um, uh, that uh, who was there? Well, first, it's 179 and 180. Can we? What are those? Those are receipts uh, from uh, July 25th. Those are not from that visit. Okay, so now we're to July 25th. Yes. And what are those? What do those receipts show? Uh, so on the the left hand side of the screen uh, is a. Uh, Looks like a purchase of ammunition for six boxes of 22 caliber ammunition for a total of 47.90 or 50.82 at the bottom, and then on the right it's a range visit um, by Mr. Crumbly. Um, it's a handgun range fee of twenty dollars, a small silhouette. Uh, I should mention that the receipt on the left also is in the name James Crumbly. What's a silhouette mean? Uh, it's a it's a silhouette of a person uh, that's used at a, at a gun range. Okay, and Exhibit 181, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, so this is geolocation information for uh, the Gmail account for James Crumbly, um, and for, I believe he is in green on this, uh, and then the purple dots would be Jennifer Crumbly, meeting on July 25th, 2021. Both Jennifer and James Crumbly were at the firearms range in Clarkston, uh, Michigan. Okay, I'm drawing your attention to August 15th. Uh, Exhibit 183. This is a receipt. What is it for? This is dated August 15, 2021. Uh, the receipt has a range uh, range fee of $20 again. Um, I believe that's four. So it'll be 200 rounds of 22 caliber ammunition and one small silhouette. Again, a silhouette of a person uh, target. And 184. What is this? This is uh, James Crumley's uh, Gmail uh, geolocation information showing he was at the Clarkston gun range at that time. Okay. And you were here for Ed Wagrowski's testimony, correct? Yes. All right. Did you see the video that the shooter sent to his friend in August of 2021? I did. All right. I'm going to um, put 70 and 71 up on the um, screen. That's one slide. Um, first, what, what, are you, what are we looking at? So this is the first video filmed by uh, the defendant's son, on August 19th, around 9.30 p.m., that was sent to his uh, friend. All right, and what what time was it? It was 9.31 p.m. Okay, and can you see that video? Can you stop it right there? 
Okay, I'm stopping. Uh, Mr. Keese is stopping at what, what are we looking at? So this is uh, the defendant's son holding the Caltech P-17 pistol. It uh, doesn't appear to have a magazine inserted. didn't appear to have a round in the chamber. Uh, the safety was, you know, again, red means dead. The safety was uh, not engaged. Okay. And then can you continue? All right. Can you tell, based on, uh, I should probably lay a better foundation, were you ever inside the Crumbly home? Yes. When were you there? Uh, on the night of November 30th, 2021, the night of the shooting, we uh, executed the search weren't there. Okay, so you were there during the search? Yes. Okay. Do you recognize anything in that video that signifies where the shooter was? I do, but not from being in the, the residence. It was from other um, cell phone extractions from, I believe, Mrs. Crumbly and Mr. Crumbly's phones. I believe they changed couches in that, that living room at some point. It was, an old, it was a black leather couch that I recognized being in the living room. Okay. All right. Um, exhibit 72 and 73, the, the, they've both been previously um, admitted. Can you tell the jury what this is? This is uh, the video that I believe Detective Wabrowski um, had testified to previously. It was uh, sent to the de uh, defendant's son's friend by the defendant's son on August 20th at 1230 in the morning. All right. And was there a, a text that accompanied this right after or before the video was sent? Yes, it was around the time that the, the video was sent. I believe it said, um, my dad left it out, so I thought, why not? LOL, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know if that's the exact text, but that's the general idea. Is that the text? Yes, that's it. Okay. And um, we're going to play the video, which has been previously um, admitted. And before we do, can you tell the jury what they're about to see? Sure. So the, uh, the defendant's son has the uh, Caltech P-17 pistol in his hand. This, again, the safety's not engaged. Um, he slams the firearm down on top of the magazine, loads the magazine, and then charges, sends the slide forward, chambering around the firearm, uh, meaning that if he pulled the trigger at that moment, it would go off. Okay. All right. Um, what do you see in that picture besides the Caltech? Here's to be a, a cat. And based on your investigation, do you do you know about that cat? I believe that's uh, the shooter's cat, uh, Dexter. All right. And what what surface is that? Can you tell? Yes. So after being in the home for the, the search warrant, uh, I'm aware that that is their, their their kitchen. Really didn't have a kitchen area. It was more their their living room or dining room table, so to speak. It was a, a higher kind of four top table. Um, that is the same wood grain that's on the, the table in their dining room. All right. And we. We know this. This was taken at 12:30 a.m. Is that what you said? I believe it was sent at 12:30, but I think it was it was taken relatively close to that time. Okay. Um, do you hear anything else in the background? I, I, all I heard was crickets and then the sound of the magazine and then the slide going forward. Okay. And we've previously introduced the GPS data um, that shows whether or not James Crumbly was in the home during this time. Was he? He was. Okay. Um, okay. All right, if just want to talk to me about this video, uh, Special Agent Brandon, and, um, and, and what your view is on the safe, the, the, whether or not what was happening in that video was safe. So I, I would say that regardless if Mr. Crumley was standing over his shoulder or not, or not, that would not be safe. The firearm is on top of a, a dining room table. It's, it's loaded. The safety's off. Uh, and it's pointed in a direction that if you're inside their home, you can't tell from the video whether he's facing uh, the front of the home or the side of the home, but regardless, the firearm's pointed in a direction that would be almost chest level if a person was beyond the walls of the house or if, if a person was standing nearby. Um, not to mention almost, you know, uh, pointing the firearm at the cat. All right. That's the magazine. Can you tell if it's loaded or not? Yes, that magazine there, you can see the, round of, the rounds of ammunition um, in the firearm. All right, and um, you said, could you see whether there was a round in the chamber? 
Uh, I don't believe there was until he loaded the magazine and then sent the slide forward or else it was uh, malfunctioned. Okay, where's he loading? That's loading the magazine. Is that the, that's the safety? Yep, so the safety's not engaged and the round is, uh, yep, the top of the magazine is visible there and if once he sends that slide forward, that's what takes that round and puts it into the chamber. Okay. What if that was being supervised by somebody like James? Would it change your opinion of the safety of that action? No. So based on what we spoke about before being the four rules of uh, firearm safety, so um, obviously that firearm is loaded, so treat every firearm like it's loaded, point it in a safe direction, so there's really no safe direction for that firearm to be if it's chest level on a table. The only safe position would be whether it was outside or pointed at the floor. Um, you know, obviously if you're loading a firearm to carry on your person, you know, you point it at the floor where it's away from people so it can't hurt anyone at the discharge. Okay. I want to draw your attention to um, September 1st. Did the defendant, um, did James and his take his son to the, the shooting range on that day? Your Honor, yes. I'm just going to ask for clarification. September 1st of what year? 2021. The weapons weren't purchased until June 2021 um, and November 2021. Yes, I believe that's correct, yes. All right, and um, Exhibit 185, what is that? It says, uh, it's a Facebook message from James Crumley to Jennifer Crumley, and it says, uh, the shooter and I are headed to the gun range. And Exhibit 186 and 187? Those are uh, receipts from the gun range in Clarkston, in both in James Crumley's name. The one on the left is for uh, range time. Uh, it's like 200 rounds of 22 caliber ammunition. Um, two silhouette targets, and then a rental of a uh, 22 caliber revolver, and then on the right-hand side is a uh, 150 round box of 22 caliber ammunition. Did there, James take a video of his son that day? Yes. And how do you know? Uh, it was located on, I located on James Crumley's phone. And that's exhibit 188? Yes. All right, we're gonna play that. September 25th of 2021, did you come to learn that James took his, his son to the range on that day? Yes. And this is Exhibit 189. What's that receipt for? Uh, so it's a receipt again in the name's James Robert Crumbly. It's got uh, a range, range fee, uh, a rental of a, um, a 9 millimeter pistol, a 9 millimeter ammunition, 22 caliber ammunition, as well as a torso, uh, black torso target, it says. All right. And this... Do you know if that was a SIG? Uh, that was not. It was a it was a nine millimeter HK VP9. Okay. Um, is there a video of that day? Yes. So uh, the actual gun range surveillance video. This was the furthest back for the range visits that we could get due to the the footage writing over itself. So September 25th was the first day that we actually could get footage from uh, the gun range in Clarkston. All right. And this is 190. We're going to play that. And what are we looking at here? So this is uh, at the gun range in Clarkson. This is outside of the uh, shooting area. This is where you pay for targets, ammunition, rent firearms. Um, and in the white sweatshirt is Mr. Crumbly wearing the looks like a Seattle Seahawks ball cap. And then you have uh, the shooter wearing a gray sweatshirt, dark colored pants, uh, Nike shoes, and a uh, black hat. And what do you observe um, James Crumbly wearing at his belt level? Uh, appears to be a holster.
And can you tell the jury what what you're observing? So at some point, it looks like uh, the shooter was trying to clear a malfunction from the firearm. Um, he's checking the, the chamber to see if a round's chambered. He's having some kind of malfunction with it, and he um, is having trouble clearing it. And can you tell what, what firearm that is? Uh, the footage here is real grainy. I, I can't say for certain. And what does he appear to be doing right at this time? So he keeps checking the, the chamber uh, for a round. He's having issues with it. He goes over to his uh, to Mr. Crumbly. They walk back over. Mr. Crumbly takes up the firearm. He uh, racks the slide three times to try to see what's going on with the firearm. And then he inserts uh, the magazine here and uh, gets the firearm back in operating condition. difference between the 9mm ammunition and 22 ammunition? So ge just generally speaking, a 9mm ammunition is, is more expensive than 22 caliber ammunition. 22 caliber ammunition is more for target practice, and you know 9mm ammunition can be used for anything from target practice to home defense. It's generally more expensive for 9mm ammunition. And when you say more expensive, can you roughly say about how much, generally? It, honestly, it's to relevance, Your Honor. Yeah, what's the relevance? The relevance is that 9mm ammunition is expensive, and it's typically not something that you would buy just to shoot at the range, particularly if this is your hobby. It's uh, expensive. That calls for speculation, Your Honor. Well, uh, unless, unless he knows. Unless, unless he knows. Is 9 millimeter ammunition, because of the cost, is it, is it something that you typically see at a range? People generally people do shoot 9 millimeter ammunition at the range. Now, what level of money they're willing to pay for that type of ammunition all varies depending on uh, if you're going to shoot at the range, obviously you're going to try to use less expensive ammunition, but I'd be speculating anything beyond that. Okay, thank you. Drawing your attention to October 3rd, was there evidence uncovered that the, that James and his son went to, to the range on that day? Yes. And Exhibit 191, that's a Facebook message? Yes, this is from James uh, Crumbly to Jennifer Crumbly on October 3rd at 12.01 p.m. It says, cool, just got, just got cleaning our guns, leaving for range in a few. All right, and then 192 is a receipt. Is it from that day? Yes, it's from October 3rd, uh, 2021, in the name James Robert Crumbly. It's for uh, a silhouette target, a range fee. Uh, I believe that's 100 rounds of 22 caliber ammunition, and then an additional, um, looks like an additional two boxes of 22 caliber ammunition. All right. Drawing your attention now to November 26th of 2021, you testified earlier that you were involved in the tracing of the weapon um, and, and the purchase of it on that day, correct? Yes. All right. And was that 9mm SIG purchased on that day? Yes. I'm showing you previously admitted 37 and 38. We've talked about this. What are these? This is the receipt from the gun store in Oxford for the Sig Sauer SP 2022 9mm uh, pistol that was sold to James Crumbly. All right, and the cost? Uh, it was, uh, the gun itself was $489.95. With tax, it was a total of $519.35. All right, and 38 is what? This is the pistol sales record um, that would have been completed by uh, the gun store and signed by Mr. Crumbly documenting his purchase of the uh, Sig Sauer pistol. And were you able to, um, or did you review any posts um, that the shooter made uh, with this firearm purchased for him? Yes. All right, and I want to draw your attention to Exhibit 95, and there are three slides here. What's the first one? So the, the first one, uh, so the text for the post it was uh, November 26th, uh, says, just got my new beauty today, six hour, nine millimeter, ask any questions, I will answer uh, it's a picture uh, in the Crumley's kitchen. It's hard to see from this photograph, but there's a yellow. You see yellow, and then some wood floor underneath it. That's 
uh, the counters in their kitchen. So I'm holding the box, so this would be showing through this, this handle with the circle? Correct. Okay. Yes, and that is the six hour SB 2022 purchased by James Crumley. All right, and then nine, the, the second slide? This is a picture of uh, the defendant's son holding the six hour SB 2022 uh, in uh, the Crumley family residence. That's the same floor inside their house. And it's a post? Yes. All right, and it says? It's the same, so the same text appears in all three photographs, but the, there's the second, there's there's the first photograph of just the firearm, second of uh, Mr. Crumley, or Mr. Crumley's son holding the firearm, and then the third uh, picture, I believe, is the uh, Mr. Crumley's son lining up the sights. So on a, on a firearm, there's the rear sights and the front sights, and when you line those up, that's what you're shooting at, that's what you use to aim. Um, and that's where those three dots are aligned, that's uh, Mr. Crumley's son pointing the firearm at the floor inside the residence. All right. Drawing your attention to uh, 97, Exhibit 97. This is, where was this photo found? Uh, this was found on uh, Jennifer Crumbly's uh, cell phone. Uh, it depicts the, so the top firearm where you see the red dot again is the Caltech SP, uh, uh, SP, uh, the P-17. Uh, and then the bottom firearm is the murder weapon. It's the six hour SP-2022. This is all inside of uh, the six hour box. So you see the two six hour SIG magazines on the right side of the screen plus the uh, ATF pamphlet and the cable lock provided by Six Hour. Okay. Anything stand out to you about this picture? As far as? The ATF pamphlet? Well, the pamphlet obviously is on top of the foam in this picture and the, and the cable lock is still in the box with the SIG uh, Sour. Obviously it was later recovered in a, the Keltec box, not in the box with the Six Hour. All right. and. And in, tr in, in addition to the ATF pamphlet, is there anything else posted at the, uh, the gun store about safety? Yes, so behind the counter in the gun store in Oxford is the same, same four bullet points that are on the inside left cover of that ATF Youth Handgun Safety Act. Um, it hangs behind the counter. All right. That's 193. Yes, it's 193. All right. This is... This is... All right, this is exhibit uh, 42. What is, what is this? That is the, uh, the cable lock that was provided with the six hour pistol. All right, and is this, this cable lock is specifically provided with the SIG, with this actual gun? That's correct, yes. Okay, and looking at this, um, I'm gonna hand it to you now. I think another pair of gloves is getting a little hot up here. I know, I took mine off too. Is it getting hot in here? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's climbing. Yeah, yeah, it happens all the time. I don't know if those are the small ones. Yet. That's all right. We're working on it. Definitely smaller ones this time. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I do have the bigger ones. That's all right. You got them on. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to hand this to you, and then I'm going to ask you to tell the jury whether or not you think this has ever been opened. So I would say, <clears throat> is it possible that <clears throat> this top part had been opened? Yes. If this was <clears throat> used consistently and pulled out of this packaging, there'd be more tearing on the side. Um, you know, it's cheap plastic bag. All right, and what's inside of it um, at the bottom? So there's the instruction manual in here as well as the, the two keys that are still inserted in the cable. Okay, and your testimony is this This is provided with, I'm going to take this back, this was provided with the SIG when it was purchased on November 26th, correct? Yes. And where was this found in the home when you searched it? on November 30th, 2021. That was in the Keltec box in the kitchen. All right, so it was found not in the SIG box. No. So the Caltech box, which is somewhere here. Underneath right the SIG box. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the SIG cable lock was found with the, the Caltech. Where was the Caltech? The Caltech box is in the kitchen. Okay, but the Caltech, the weapon, was in the gun safe? That's correct, yeah. The, the, Caltech uh, pistol was in the gun safe in the Crumbly's bedroom. Okay, so this was found open or closed? <clears throat> that was closed. All right, and did you testify earlier this was found in a cabinet in the kitchen? 
I believe it was a cabinet or like a little space in the kitchen underneath it, like an island or whatever. Okay, and if we go back to the picture that <clears throat> Jennifer Crumbly posted, same cake block. Yes. Okay. On November 27th, uh, drawing your attention to Exhibit 195, what is that? Uh, that is a receipt from the range in the name Jennifer Lynn Crumley uh, for November 27, 2021. It's for um, pistol range visit, uh, one target, and two boxes of Patriot Defense 9 millimeter, 124 grain ammunition uh, at $23, or almost $24 a box. Okay, so four days earlier when the gun was purchased, there's, <coughs> is there a video of that? Yes. The purchase of the gun? On the oh, is, it, is there a video of the purchase of the gun? Uh, no, the, the gun store did not have footage uh, for that day. Okay, so but this is the 27th, the next day. Is that a Saturday? I believe so, yes. Okay, um, and is there a video from that? Yes, there was footage <clears throat> at the gun range in Clarkson. There was not footage at the gun store in Oxford. Okay. And do you, you, you've heard all the testimony before. You, were you able to determine where James Crumbly was um, on this day, on a Saturday when, the, um, when Jennifer and the shooter went to the, to the range? Yes, he was working that day doing uh, DoorDash deliveries for most of the day. Okay. Um, all right, it's Exhibit 196. I'm gonna play this um, and the first part of it and, and stop for a moment um, at the counter and then move to, I think, just a section uh, at the end, other, because it's long. So sure. just wanted to let everyone know. Okay, so what are we looking at right now? So <clears throat> the woman holding the uh, pistol case, that's the six hour pistol case, that's Jennifer Crumbly. Behind her is the, the shooter wearing uh, that gray sweatshirt and sweatpants and black shoes. Now that she's paying for what, if you know? So right now I think she just handed him her license. Um, okay. <clears throat> based on, on the receipts for this visit, like you said, there was the, uh, the, the target, two boxes of 9 millimeter ammunition, and then the range visit itself. All right. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. What is he doing? Uh, he made a two with his with his hand. All right, and how many boxes of ammo did they actually purchase? Uh, uh, two. Your Honor, I'm going to object. It sounds like the prosecution is asking Agent Brandon to speculate as to what the number two could be. There are also two people there. There could be two sets of ear protection. It could be two targets. It could be two of anything. She's asking for speculation. That goes to weight, not admissibility. Yeah, I think it does. Okay. Uh, you don't know what he was referring to. There's no sound. I, I don't. If you play the video and it continues, we'll see what happens next. Okay. Okay. And if you know what what is happening now, uh, it's picking up the target targets and two boxes of ammunition. He's ringing the two boxes of ammunition up now. And how much were the two boxes of ammunition for nine millimeters? A nine millimeter. I don't, I, don't re I don't recall, um, it would be on the previous slide for the receipt, but I, I think it was around $24. Okay, so that's $24 total or $24 for each box? I believe it was $24 for each box. Okay. All right, we're going to now go to, uh, what happens after they leave here? 
So they pay for their, their range visit, they get their firearm or the, the ammunition, the targets, they then proceed to go uh, put ear protection on and walk into the range and begin to load magazines uh, and then take turns firing the weapon. All right, and we're going to um, go to the segment where they're actually firing the weapon. Okay, what's happening here? So in the back, um, the shooter is loading uh, ammunition into the magazines. At, at one point during the video, Mrs. Crumley does help load at least a, a couple rounds of ammunition as well into the magazines, and then they proceed to take turns shooting the firearm. All right, and that's, uh, we're going to speed to a part. Is there some point where he's, um, you're observing him instructing or trying to um, help his mother? Yes. All right. Okay, what are we seeing here? So this is uh, one of the times that the shooter uh, shot the murder weapon. He sends the target down range, loads the magazine into the firearm, and then uh, discharges it several times. Now, as far as you know, in terms of looking at all the evidence, is that the first time he's fired that weapon, if you know? Yes, based on all the evidence I, I, I was able to locate, this is the first time, yes. We're going to um, jump ahead to. D does, if you know, does Jennifer Crumbly ever fire the weapon? Yes, she takes, I think, two total turns firing the weapon, I believe. What are you observing? Right so, in the video, uh, the shooter is instructing his mother how to load a magazine and uh, chamber around. He's, right now, he's pointing to the slide release, telling her how to send the slide forward and, and chamber around from that magazine in the firearm. How many rounds, if you know, did they fire that day? Uh, I believe it was a total of, of 50. The, they, they, the, there was two boxes of 50 rounds of ammunition, and they went. They left the range with one full box of 50 rounds. Do you know how many um, she fired versus the shooter? I, I don't know the exact number. I know that it was significantly more for uh, the shooter than his mother. Okay. Do you um, know? If, how do you know that they left with a one full box? Uh, so at the end of the video, um, the shooter packages up the uh, six-hour in the six-hour pistol case, and then uh, hands the, the box. His mom takes the box, Mrs. Crumley takes the box as they leave, and uh, the shooter walks out carrying the box of ammunition. Okay, and we're going to fast forward to that part. Do you see any, um, can, can you, in watching this video, do, do you, can you, um, is it visible, the actual case? Yes. And do you see a, a lock or the ATF pamphlet? Uh, no, not during this video, no. Okay. And is that the, the SIG case? It is.
Now, was he permitted to carry that gun out of the range? So there, there would be nothing uh, barring him with his mother's supervision right there for carrying the firearm, no. Okay. And what about the ammo? Uh, same, same with the ammo. Okay. And we see later, he's packaging it up? Yes. Okay. And we see later them leaving and who's carrying what? Uh, so the, right now he's trying to figure out how to fit all the magazines and the firearm in the, in the pistol case. He eventually successful in doing so, uh, closes the clamps on the, on the firearm case. Uh, his mother walks out with it and he walks out with the uh, ammunition. Okay. And if you know how many rounds did he take to the school that day? I believe there was a total of 50 based on uh, the number of rounds uh, discharged being 32 and the rounds were covered. We, we talked about the cable lock um, that, that was sold with the SIG. Um, if it had been installed in that uh, firearm, about how long does that take to install a cable lock? Uh, I mean, if the slide's already to the rear of the firearm um, and the magazine port and the ejection port are visible, it would take under 10 seconds. Okay. I want to, um, lastly, draw your attention to Exhibit 130. What's that? So this is an Instagram post by the defendant's son. Um, it's 100, sorry. Oh, yeah. um, By the defendant's son, uh, after returning from the shooting range, took my new SIG out to the range today, definitely need to get used to the new sights, LOL, and then there's a picture of his target. All right. And this is a post that Jennifer Crumbly posted that day? Yes, that same day, uh, Mom and Son Day testing out his new Xmas present. My first time shooting a 9mm, I hit the bullseye. And this is just a different picture with the same post? Yes, I believe she had three photographs with her post, including the, the six hour on the kitchen counter with the uh, ATF pamphlet underneath. And do you see a cable up? I do not. Okay. Moving to Exhibit 130. This is the math worksheet. Yes. Did you have an opportunity during your investigation to look at this? Yes. And what caught your attention, if anything, at this with this drawing? The very first thing I noticed was that there was an apparent shooting victim on the drawing. Um, whether it was a fatal shooting, not fatal shooting, I, I'm not certain, but clearly when I looked at it, I, you know, it was not a suicide. Anything else? Yes, uh, so the, the firearm that was drawn on the piece of paper, um, after reviewing the murder weapon, uh, I noted several similarities between the two and, and uh, believed that this was actually a drawing of the murder weapon. And what was similar? So on the back of the murder weapon, there are uh, striations or lines on the slide of the firearm. Um, additionally, the shape of the, what's the trigger guard, so it's the part that where the trigger is housed in, it's that kind of a, uh, let's say that it's like a half U shape uh, where the trigger's inside of, as well as where the ejection port is, and most notably, uh, the magazine. So the, ma the bottom of that firearm, you see how it's not flush, how there's basically two parts there? That part on the six hour uh, magazines, there's like a lip that's different than other firearms um, that shows how it kind of like curves down in the front. All right, next I'm going to, um, what, what, what about the, is there a picture of an, any um, ammo on that drawing? Yes, there's a picture, uh, pic, a picture of ammunition. Um, you know, it, it's, a, it's definitely a pistol, pistol caliber ammunition. It's definitely not 22 caliber ammunition. It does uh, appear to be a 9 millimeter round of ammunition, or at least resemble one. Okay, and next I'm showing you exhibits previously admitted um, 97, 101, and 130. What are we looking at? So those are pictures of the murder weapon on either side. Um, you can see the, the markings I was talking about, the striations on the slide, back of the slide of the firearm, the shape of the magazine, um, especially when you look on the picture on the right. Um, you see how the, it, it's not a, a flat shape. It doesn't sit flush with the firearm, um, how there's different levels there. Uh, additionally, the uh, location of the ejection port and the shape of that trigger guard, again, that half kind of U-shape there. And Special Agent Brandon, my last question is, what was your impression when you viewed that drawing? When am I impression when I viewed the drawing? Yes. That he, he drew his firearm. And the entire drawing, did, what was your conclusion or what were your impressions through your investigation? What was the drawing up? He drew a murder. Thank you. Nothing further.
Can you take a break at this time, Your Honor? I sure. think the jury's probably sure you need a break, right, Ms. Yes, please, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, I have asked about the heat, but this is an old building and this happens all the time. An hour from now, we'll all be freezing. So. <laughs> um, and, and then you got, let's take a ton of quick minute break. You can, you can step down. Please don't discuss your testimony with them. Yes, sir. Thank you. All rise for the jury. You've been watching day three of live coverage of the James Crumbly trial. We've been listening to Brett Brandon. He's an ATF agent for a little over two hours. Uh, Brett Brandon walked us through the ballistics of um, the gun that was used and um, which was found on top of the Crumbly's parents' bed. Interesting here, Brandon mentioned he, when he watched the surveillance footage from the day of the shooting, he noticed the shooter had some level of experience with guns, specifically noting the stance he took when he shot and killed Tate Muir. So far, we've heard from a lot of the same witness, witnesses who testified in Jennifer Crumbly's trial. We've heard from a few school faculty, including Molly Darnell, who was shot in the arm by the shooter on the day of the shooting, and the counselor who met with James Jennifer Crumbly and their son the day of the shooting. We've also seen a little bit of cross-examination, but not too much. Right now, it is just a little bit after 3 p.m. Court could go on for another up to two hours. Uh, while the court's taking a break, so will we. When we get back, we'll revisit Brett Brandon's testimony uh, when he explains the difference between a 9 millimeter gun and a .22. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Live Now Detroit. Um, you've been watching live coverage of day three of the James Crumbly trial. For those of you who are just now joining us, so far we've heard from Sean Hopkins. He was the counselor at Oxford High School. Right now he's on a leave. Um, Nicholas Ejack, he's the dean of students. And Brett Brandon, an ATF special agent that was on the case. The most recent witness to take the stand was Brett Brandon. He broke down the ballistics of the murder weapon and also walked the jury through some of the video footage captured while he was uh, while um, Eth or the shooter was at the shooting range. Here's a testimony describing the difference between a nine millimeter and a 20.22 millimeter handgun um, from Brett himself. Check it out. What um, what is the difference between the those two guns and a nine millimeter? So uh, the Caltech uh, the Caltech pistol is also a semi-automatic pistol. It's just uh, chambered in 22 caliber as opposed to 9 millimeter. It's a smaller round. Um, and, uh, the and, and again, you say round, and I think for lay people they think of that as many. But what do you what do you mean when you say round? So I know that there's been some talk in this trial about bullets. Bullets are the part of the, fire, the, the piece of ammunition that comes out of the firearm when it's shot. The uh, the round of ammunition is what's inserted into the magazine before it's fired. Um, that has the you know the cartridge fired cartridge case. The bullet itself, and then some type of propellant or uh, powder, usually smokeless powder. Okay, so a bullet is what comes out of the shell casing, and is expelled from uh, the the chamber. But a round includes the shell casing and the bullet, and any kind of what was the last thing? Yes, it would be like the, the powder that's used to uh, to yeah ex yeah. So okay. it would be the the round of ammunition is the actual full piece of ammunition prior to being fired. Okay. Uh, and does the 22 that that James Crumley owned does it does it shoot or fire faster? Does it have a, a, a larger capacity magazine? So I'm not I'm not uh, an expert on, on ballistics and traveling the speed on of firearms, but as far as capacity goes, it's a uh, it's got I think the Caltech P17 has a 17 round total capacity. Um, but the actual uh, round of ammunition itself, the 9mm versus the 22, the 9mm is going to be uh, a wider round. So the, what the caliber refers to is the diameter of the bore, the inside of the barrel. Uh, so it means that the 9mm round is bigger, and, uh, and based on the, the size of the round, it's, it's got more, um, uh, it's going to be heavier. So the damage from that round would be more than a 22 caliber round, if that makes sense. Uh, what... What kind of um, handgun does law enforcement usually carry? Nine millimeter, generally. From at ATF, we carry nine millimeter, and most of the departments and agencies I, I work with carry nine millimeters. And do you know why, Your Honor? I would object to relevance. How is it relevant? It goes to the the power um, and the use for a nine millimeter versus the the weapon that uh, the the two handguns that James Crumbly already owned. I, I guess I would have normally agreed with you, but we've heard um, testimony in this trial. Um, that the shooter was intent um, even after the family owned two other guns on having his father buy a 9mm. So I'm, I'm going to allow it. Thank you. Can you tell the jury why law enforcement usually carries a 9mm or, or you do with ATF? If, sure. you know, if you know. Sure. So my understanding based on, on, on the reasoning that ATF uses in other agencies is that it's a, uh, it's a it has a, a powerful round that could be used to neutralize a threat. It's not going to overpenetrate, and the uh, advancements in ballistics have made a nine millimeter uh, the ideal round for law enforcement for uh, for for using in defense. All right, that was um, the testimony on the difference between a nine millimeter handgun and a point twenty two. Now we're going to revisit the testimony where Brett mentions the um, shoot the footage from the shooter participating at the shooting range. Let's start with June fifteenth of twenty twenty one. Do you um, do you know why that date's significant? Yes, that was the date uh, Mr. Crumley initiated the purchase for the uh, the Derringer. Okay, and the slides um, in Peoples 169, uh, what are we looking at? 
This is a Facebook conversation between James and Jennifer Crumley on the 15th of June, 2021. Okay, now time, it says UTC minus 4, 11.34 a.m. Is that the actual time? Yes. Okay, and can you read the text? And Blue, who, who's... What does blue indicate? Which person? Blue is uh, Jennifer Crumley. Green is going to be James Crumley. Okay. And can you read those texts? Yes. So Please Jennifer. So Jennifer Crumley asks, uh, "Talk at 12," and then uh, Mr. Crumley responds, "Taking Ethan to store at 12," and then Mrs. Crumley asks, "If you get gun." Okay. And then the next. Uh, Mr. He, Crum he's answering her. Yes. Okay. Mr. Crumley responds, "Yes," and Mo, I believe that's supposed to be no. Um, Jennifer responds, huh? And then James says, we paid for the gun and bought it, but can't pick it up till everything clears Washington, in parentheses, FBI. Could be today, tomorrow, or next day, they don't know. And then Mrs. Crumley responds, gotcha. Bring me those fruit punch things when you come to bring hay. All right. Uh, the, the message about he had to wait, um, did you, through your investigation, reveal, did it reveal that that's consistent with what happened? Yes. Okay. And remind the jury why. So sometimes when you purchase a firearm, the background may take a little bit of time, depending on a lot of different factors. Um, and in this case, it, it, it took enough time to where Mr. Crumley had to come back the next day to pick up the firearm. Okay. And then the next exhibit, People's 170. Do you know what that is? Yes. This, again, is uh, Facebook messages between James and Jennifer Crumley. Uh, Blue is, is Jennifer, and she says, how much is your gun? Uh, and Mr. Crumley replies, 300. All right. I'm going to show you what's been marked as, uh, and admitted as People's 29. Um, what, this is a receipt for, um, what is it for? Do you know? This is the receipt for the Cobra, for the Derringer. Uh, this is dated 615. It says 16 at the, 616 at the top, which is the date the actual sale went through. And it's for $180.15. So this is not three hundred dollars. This is was there a gun he purchased that was three hundred dollars that day? Approximately yes. And what gun was that? Uh, that would have been uh, the uh, Caltech P17 22 caliber pistol. Okay, so the Derringer, the small one, was one sixty nine, and this is the receipt for the Caltech. What else is on that receipt? Uh, it's two boxes of ammunition at fourteen ninety five. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to draw your attention to June 26, which is about 10 days later. Um, do you know if James Crumbly went to the gun range at that on that date? Yes. What? Twenty-six. I'm sorry, I skipped a page. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, June 20th. Yes, that's um, correct. And the People's 171 is on the screen. Can you tell the jury what that was? What, what that is? Yes, this is, a, a, again, Facebook messages messages between James and Jennifer Crumley. Uh, in blue, Jennifer asks, can you guys answer your phone? And then uh, James Crumley responds, no, at gun range, loud. All right. And People's 
All right. What, um, if anything, do you see or notice in that um, in that video? In, in the second one? Yes. Uh, it appeared he almost shot his hand on the uh, during the video. And why is that? He had his hand in front of the muzzle of the firearm. Okay. And when you say he, who do you mean? Uh, I'm sorry. The, uh, uh, the defendant, uh, Mr. Crumley's son. Okay. The shooter. Yes. All right. Did did you know? Did James send those videos to anybody that day? I, I'm, I don't recall if he sent them that day or the next day, but he did send them to uh, Mrs. Crumbly at some point. All right, and how do you know that? Uh, I reviewed her cell phone as well. Okay, and Exhibit 174, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, so that is uh, one of the videos being sent on June 21st, 2021. All right, and the... This is two slides, I mean... It's two slides, can you give me one? Okay. And then, is this the second video? Yeah, this is the, well, this is the, in, in the reverse order. So the first, the, the, they're both videos were sent from James Crumbly to Jennifer Crumbly on June 21st, 2021. Okay, so th these exhibits are him sending her the videos? Yes. All right, were you, did you learn if she, what she did with the videos, if anything? Yeah, she took one of the videos and uploaded it, uh, I believe, as an Instagram story. Okay, and that's exhibit 175. says in addition to the video. Sure. It says uh, Ethan and it tags, uh, I believe that's Mr. Crumley's Instagram account, um, both got handguns this week, testing them out at the range. All right. And then now we're to drawing your attention to June 26th. Uh, did they go to the gun range that day? Yes. Do you know where it was? It was at the, the, the so for the rest of these, I believe it's the indoor gun range in Clarkston, Michigan. Okay. And um, uh, exhibit 176, can you tell the jury what that is? Yep. This is a receipt uh, in the name of James Robert Crumley uh, on June 26, 2021, for one range, uh, uh, handgun range fee of $20, and then one small silhouette uh, target at 75 cents. Did Do you know if the videos were taken on that day? Yes. Do you know if they were sent to anyone? I do. And who were they, if, who were they sent to? Uh, Jennifer Crumley. Okay. Um, drawing your attention to Exhibit 177. What is that, if you know? This is a video sent from Jennifer or from James Crumbly to Jennifer Crumbly of the shooter at the firearms range in Clarkston on June 26. Okay. And is 178, which is admitted, I believe, um, is this the video that was taken and sent to, to Jennifer? Yes, this is actually, the, I believe, is the Instagram story that was created from that video okay. and uploaded to Instagram by Jennifer Crumbly. Can you tell from the video which, uh, which, which um, firearm he's using? Yes, that's the Caltech P17 uh, 22 caliber pistol. Okay. Drawing your attention to July 2nd, uh, did you uncover any evidence that that James um, and his mother-in-law, Jennifer's mother, um, went to the range with the shooter? Yes. And how did you um, discover that? So there were messages between uh, James Crumbly and his mother-in-law on Facebook. Um, discussing a range visit. I think it's, it's a conversation occurs on July 2nd, 2021, but it's actually for a range visit occurring on, I believe, July 3rd, 2021. Okay, can you read that to the jury? Sure. So in blue is going to be uh, James Crumley's mother-in-law. She says, still planning on taking uh, the shooter to the gun range tomorrow morning. Then lunch, is he still available and do we need to make reservations? Uh, Mr. Crumley responds, he is good, no reservations needed. I'll go with you guys. Um, his mother-in-law replies, awesome, glad you could join us. We don't know what we are doing, LOL. And then, this is 377. 377. And then the next um, response from James? Uh, just take Maybe Road up to Dixie, turn left, and it will be on the right-hand side. Uh, the shooter will be excited. We will rent a few different guns. They have a special for 9mm on 25 for a box of 50. 
Uh, his mother-in-law re uh, replies, sounds great. Uh, Mr. Crumbly says, make it closer to 1045. Right, and do we have any video from that day? We do not. Uh, do we know um, uh, that uh, who was there? Well, first, it's 179 and 180. Can we? What are those? Those are receipts uh, from uh, July 25th. Those are not from that visit. Okay, so now we're to July 25th. Yes. And what are those? What do those receipts show? Uh, so on the, the left hand side of the screen uh, is a. Uh, Looks like a purchase of ammunition for six boxes of 22 caliber ammunition for a total of 47.90 or 50.82 at the bottom, and then on the right it's a range visit um, by Mr. Crumbly. Um, it's a handgun range fee of twenty dollars, a small silhouette. Uh, I should mention that the receipt on the left also is in the name James Crumbly. What's a silhouette mean? Uh, it's a it's a silhouette of a person uh, that's used at a, at a gun range. Okay, and Exhibit 181, can you tell the jury what that is? Yes, so this is geolocation information for uh, the Gmail account for James Crumbly, um, and for, I believe he is in green on this, uh, and then the purple dots would be Jennifer Crumbly, meaning on July 25th, 2021, both Jennifer and James Crumbly were at the firearms range in Clarkston, uh, Michigan. Okay, I'm drawing your attention to August 15th. Uh, Exhibit 183. This is a receipt. What is it for? This is dated August 15, 2021. Uh, the receipt has a range uh, range fee of $20 again. Um, I believe that's four. So it'll be 200 rounds of 22 caliber ammunition and one small silhouette. Again, a silhouette of a person uh, target. And 184. What is this? This is uh, James Crumley's uh, Gmail uh, geolocation information showing he was at the Clarkston gun range at that time. Okay. And you were here for Ed Wagrowski's testimony, correct? Yes. All right. Did you see the video that the shooter sent to his friend in August of 2021? I did. All right. I'm going to um, put 70 and 71 up on the um, screen. That's one slide. Um, first, what, what, are, what are we looking at? So this is the first video filmed by uh, the defendant's son, on August 19th, around 9.30 p.m., that was sent to his uh, friend. All right, and what what time was it? It was 9.31 p.m. Okay, and can you see that video? Can you stop it right Okay, I'm stopping. Uh, Mr. Keese is stopping it. What, what are we looking at? So this is uh, the defendant's son holding the Caltech P-17 pistol. Uh, it doesn't appeared to have a magazine inserted, didn't appear to have a round in the chamber. Um, the safety was, you know, again, red means dead. The safety was uh, not engaged. Okay. And can you continue? All right. Can you tell, based on, uh, I should probably lay a better foundation, were you ever inside the Crumbly home? Yes. When were you there? Uh, on the night of November 30th, 2021, the night of the shooting, we uh, executed the search warrant there. Okay, so you were there during the search? Yes. Okay. Do you recognize anything in that video that signifies where the shooter was? I do, but not from being in the, the residence. It was from other um, cell phone extractions from, I believe, Mrs. Crumbly and Mr. Crumbly's phones. I believe they changed couches in that, that living room at some point. It was, an old, it was a black leather couch that I recognized being in the living room. Okay. All right, um, Exhibit 72 and 73, the, the, they've both been previously um, admitted. Can you tell the jury what this is? This is uh, the video that I believe Detective Wabrowski um, had testified to previously. It was uh, sent to the de uh, defendant's son's friend by the defendant's son on August 20th at 1230 in the morning. All right, and was there a, a text that accompanied this right after or before the video was sent? Yes, it was around the time that the, the video was sent. I believe it said, um, my dad left it out, so I thought, why not, LOL. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know if that's the exact text, but that's the general idea. Is that the text? Yes, that's it. Okay. And um, we're going to play the video, which has been previously um, admitted. And before we do, can you tell the jury what they're about to see? Sure. So the, uh, 
The defendant's son has the uh, Keltec P-17 pistol in his hand. There's, again, the safety's not uh, engaged. Um, he slams the firearm down on top of the magazine, loads the magazine, and then charges, sends the slide forward, chambering around the firearm, uh, meaning that if he pulled the trigger at that moment, it would go off. Okay. All right. Um, what do you see in that picture besides the Caltech? Appears to be a, a cat. And based on your investigation, do you do you know about that cat? I believe that's uh, the shooter's cat, uh, Dexter. All right. And what what surface is that? Can you tell? Yes. So after being in the home for the, the search warrant, uh, I'm aware that that is their, their their kitchen. Really didn't have a kitchen area. It was more their their living room or dining room table, so to speak. It was a, a higher kind of four top table. Um, that is the same wood grain that's on the, the table in their dining room. All right. And we. We know this. This was taken at twelve thirty a.m. Is that what you said? I believe it was sent at twelve thirty, but I think it was it was taken relatively close to that time. Okay. Um, do you hear anything else in the background? I, I, all I heard was crickets and then the sound of the magazine and then the slide going forward. Okay. And we've previously introduced the GPS data um, that shows whether or not James Crumbly was in the home during this time. Was he? He was. Okay. Um, okay. All right, if just want to talk to me about this video, uh, Special Agent Brandon, and, um, and, and what your view is on the safe, the, the, whether or not what was happening in that video was safe. So I, I would say that regardless if Mr. Crumley was standing over his shoulder or not, or not, that would not be safe. The firearm is on top of a, a dining room table. It's, it's loaded the safeties off. Uh, and it's pointed in a direction that if you're inside their home, you can't tell from the video whether he's facing uh, the front of the home or the side of the home, but regardless, the firearm's pointed in a direction that would be almost chest level if a person was beyond the walls of the house or if, if a person was standing nearby. Um, not to mention almost, you know, uh, pointing the firearm at the cat. All right. That's the magazine. Can you tell if it's loaded or not? Yes, that magazine there, you can see the, round of, the rounds of ammunition um, in the firearm. All right, and um, you said, do, could you see whether there was a round in the chamber? Uh, I don't believe there was until he loaded the magazine and then sent the slide forward or else it was uh, malfunction. Okay, where's he loading? That's loading the magazine. Is that the, that's the safety? Yep, so the safety's not engaged, and the round is, uh, yep, the top of the magazine is visible there, and if once he sends that slide forward, that's what takes that round and puts it into the chamber. Okay. What if that was being supervised by somebody like James? Would it change your opinion of the safety of that action? No. All right, looks like there's movement back in the court. We're going to go ahead and take that shot live. James Crumley, case number 22279-989-FH. Yes, thank you. Good 
you take your seat. a little bit and get just a little bit of background information. In November of 2021, you were employed by the ATF and you also worked um, on a, a, was it a task force? Did I understand that correctly? So at, at the time of the, the shooting, I wasn't on a task force yet. I was working on cases in Pontiac that which morphed into, led into the creation of that task force. In connection with this case, you reviewed a significant amount of information and data in the investigations related to the Oxford High School shooting. Yes. And that would be... Um, specific to Mr. Crumbly, some specific to Mrs. Crumbly, and some specific to their son. Yes. On September 25th of 2021, you testified that uh, that James and his son went to a gun range in Clarkston. September 25th, yes. That they rented a 9 millimeter handgun, if you recall, and I can pull the exhibit up if you'd like. No, that's correct. Okay. That they purchased two boxes of 9 millimeter ammunition. I believe that's the correct quantity, yes. If you recall, the price of those boxes was $29.99 each. I, I don't recall, but that wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. Okay. That sounds about right for a box, uh, a box of 9mm ammunition. Yes. There was also 22 caliber ammunition that was purchased? Yes. They fired a 22 caliber pistol? Uh, I believe the video we had, yes. And that was the Caltech that's owned by James Crumbly? I, I believe that is the firearm that's depicted, yes. Okay. And you also learned that they, they also fired a 9mm pistol. Yes. Which is the one that they rented. Correct. That was the HK. Yes. In October October 3rd of 2021, they rented the gun range again, they being James Crumbly and his son. Yes. They purchased 22 caliber ammunition. Uh, I don't recall the, the exact receipt for that day, but that sounds correct for that day, yes. And in October of 2021... To your knowledge, based on your knowledge uh, of the investigation, there were two pistols in the home, and that was the, and I'm not, there were BB guns as well. I'm sure. not referring to those. Sure. Um, there were two pistols. There was the Derringer, which you've been shown, and the Caltech. Correct. Okay. Those are both 22 caliber handguns. Yes. November 26th of 2021 is when the SIG Sauer 9mm was purchased. Yes. And that was done so by James Crumbly. Yes. And if you recall from the receipt, there was, um, it was a handwritten receipt? Uh, yes, that, the receipt was handwritten, yes. And the receipt had the firearm listed? Yes. The serial number of the firearm? Correct. Prices and, and things of that nature? Yep. Okay. On November 27th of 2021, James Crumbly's wife, Jennifer, took their son to the gun range. I'm sorry, what date was that again? November 27th of 2021. Correct. So that was the day after the 9mm was purchased? Yes. They purchased two boxes of Patriot Defense 9mm ammunition? Yes. Based on your investigation, you learned that they fired one full box of ammunition, or at least you believe that that occurred? That's correct. You recall that each box was approximately $23.99? Yes. That they left with one box of 50 rounds of ammunition? Correct. I'm going to get back to, you compared the the handgun on the math assignment and also the handgun in the home. I'm going to get back to that in just a minute, but I do want to talk about um, keeping a handgun safe in a home. Uh, you would agree that there are a variety of ways to keep a handgun safe in a home, and I'm going to give you some examples. 
One would be to store it in a safe. I'd say that's less one way to... Are you saying when you said keeping a firearm safe, what does that mean exactly? Sure. Um, well, just that. Keeping it safely stored. Keeping it safe in the home. Safe? I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to play a game. I'm just trying to... So you're saying like keeping it safe from from access or from a person? Like I'm trying to understand... Sure. From Safe from others. Safe from accidents. Safe from accidental discharge. Sure. Safe from mishandling. Safe from... Safe from dot, dot, dot. Sure. That, that's one way I think you could keep a firearm uh, securely stored inside of a home. You can store it in a, in a locking gun case. We saw that the cases that were on the table, they have holes where you could put a lock in them. Yes, that's, that's another way. Yes. You could store it in um, the, the small safe. I guess there's a couple different styles of safes. There's the little safe that, that you showed us earlier, and then there's other bigger safes, correct? Yeah, there's a variety of gun safes out there, yes. You could use a cable lock. Yes. You could use a trigger lock, which goes in the, the trigger. Yes. You could store the firearm unloaded. Obviously, an unloaded firearm is not inherently dangerous, correct? I, I don't want to speculate on whether that would be a safe way to secure a firearm because you don't know I, not, whether knowing all the ins and outs of whether someone else has ammunition or magazines or things like that. I, I, I don't want to. I can't answer that question. Sure. I guess my question is actually a lot more simple. I'm not asking you to speculate on anything. Sure. Um, simply having an unloaded firearm, is an unloaded firearm in itself dangerous? Or does it become dangerous when you put ammunition in it? I would say that the answer to that question really depends on the, the proficiency with firearms of people in the home. Um, if you have ammunition stored separately and it's just the firearm by itself, if someone clearly knows how to load a magazine and insert it, it's no longer stored safely secured, I would think. My question is a little bit different, though. It's not necessarily talking about, and we can get to the other sure. stuff too. I'm not asking you to avoid that. I'm just part. trying to. I'm really just trying to answer your question. I'm trying to understand what you're trying to ask. Sure. Yeah. What I'm trying to ask is an unloaded firearm, in and of itself, no ammunition in it, no magazine in it, is that itself unsafe? Again, I don't know what else. Being not knowing what else is in the home, I can't answer that question. You would agree that keeping a handgun safe depends on a variety of circumstances. And you talked about some of those, not knowing if there's ammunition in the home, right? Yes, yeah, so are you talking now again about the same line of about it being stored just by itself? Correct. I mean, yeah, there are so many factors that would go into whether that would be a secure way to store a firearm, yes. Where it's stored could also, um, could also be dependent upon the age of the people in the home. I think that's one relevant factor, yes. The home, the people who live in the home, their knowledge of firearms. And I think you mentioned proficiency, like whether or not somebody could load a magazine. Right. I, 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 I think we're getting into an area that's kind of, uh, I, I don't know that how to answer that question. I'm just really trying to try my best here. I don't know how to answer that question. There's just too many variables. There's a number of variables. That's kind of the point that I'm making. There's a number of variables that go into determining whether or not a firearm is stored safely. Is that fair? Yes. There are a number of variables that, that come into play when considering how to store a firearm, yes. Okay. One of the ways that we just discussed was a cable lock. Cable locks can be removed in more than one way, correct? It can be removed by using a key and unlocking the cable lock? Yes, that's the, the way to unlock the cable lock, yes. And I think that one of our witnesses previously also testified that you can also cut off a cable lock. Yes, I, I'm, I'm aware that there are you know tools you can use to uh, defeat the cable lock, yes. As for the youth handgun safety pamphlet that the prosecutor showed you, um, you're aware of federal law, which that ATF handgun safety pam pamphlet is about federal law, correct? Yes. It's not about Michigan laws. Uh, correct. I believe it references state and local ordinances at one point, but it, generally speaking, yes, it references the federal law. Okay. And you're aware that it is legal under federal law for a minor to possess a handgun in certain circumstances? Yes, that's correct. That includes going to a shooting range? So if... We have to be careful about how we're uh, using the words in that in that sentence. So, there's certain specified five specified things in particular about what minors can do alone with firearms with written consent from their parents. It would be hunting, uh, ranching, employment, target practice, and, and hunting, I believe. Um, but there's spe specific things you have to do with as far as if they're doing it alone with written consent, the consent has to be on them. There's a variety of things in the actual statute itself. I can't recall all of them off my head, but. 
But if, if I'd have to love a little more information to know that was okay. Sure. And we don't have any evidence, and you haven't, we haven't looked at any evidence during your testimony, and, and you've been sitting in court for all the witnesses, correct? That's correct, yeah. There's been no evidence presented by Mr. Wagrowski or any other witness to show that Mr. Crumbly's son went to the range by himself? No, not that I've discovered in okay. this case, no. So you, we're talking about going to a shooting range with a parent. That, that itself is not illegal under federal law. No. Learning firearm safety. Uh, um, a minor can handle a firearm while learning firearm safety. Again, assuming they're with a parent. Right. There's only certain uh, things that are covered by federal law that, are even, that federal law even touches upon, and it's the transfer of a handgun to a minor. It's, it's not talking, it's not even contemplating those scenarios you're discussing. So there is not a federal law that says a parent can't show their, fi their child firearm safety. No. And during your involvement in this case, you found no evidence that James Crumbly was aware that his son had obtained unsupervised access to any of the firearms in his house. Can you repeat the question? Yes. During your involvement in this case, you found no evidence that James Crumbly was aware that his son had obtained access to the firearms in his home. I don't recall him ever having the videos of his son playing with the firearm or anything like that, just the fact that he was present during the time. So he was in the home during those times, but you don't have evidence that James was aware that those activities were occurring. Is that fair? I and I'm not trying to trick you. No, either. no, I, I haven't. I, I understand your question. If I understand it correctly, you're saying that there's not evidence that, um, you know, he sent a video to his dad saying I was playing with this gun or something to that effect. I never found anything like that, if that's what you're asking. You've been involved in this case since November 30th of 2021. We heard your testimony about that. You were involved in the search of Mr. Crumbly's home? Yes. And that was on November 30th of 2021? Mm -hmm. Yes. And we talked about there were various uh, BB guns found in the home. That's not illegal, correct? You know, I, I can't even comment on I don't know. I'm sure that I'm sure they are. I don't I have no idea. No idea. Okay. I mean, under state law, I have no idea what's legal and not with BB guns. There were also two pistols which were located in the gun safe, which you testified about previously. Yes, that's correct. Those that gun safe with those two handguns were located inside of a you said a, a TV stand or a dresser of some sort? It was it was like I think it was a dresser that had a TV on it and it was like had like a, a couple of drawers and a sliding thing in the middle. Yeah. So it was located inside of that dresser in a cabinet. Yes. There was also an empty Sig Sauer gun case, which we've seen, found in James's bedroom. That's correct. Along with an empty box of Patriot Defense 9mm nine ammunition. Yes. Also found in James's bedroom. Yes. You learned that Mr. Crumbly purchased three handguns between June and November of 2021? Yes. We went over those purchases today. Yes. With each purchase, um, you know that Mr. Crumbly signed a trigger lock statement. That's correct. And you reviewed those as part of your involvement in the case? Uh, I, yeah, I reviewed the documents from every purchase, yes. Now, you also know that to, for an FFL dealer to be compliant with federal law, that they also have to provide the ATF use safety handgun notice? Correct. With each purchase? Yes. So, Mr. Crumbly purchasing three handguns between June and November, he would have received three of those pamphlets? I believe that's correct, yes. So, we've talked about one, the one that was found in the Sig Sauer case, but... You don't know the location of the other two? I do not. And there's no requirement in that pamphlet or anywhere that Mr. Crumbly display that notice anywhere in his home? No. Okay. Federally, fire, federally licensed firearms dealers provide the cable locks to each seller, and typically the cable lock comes with the firearm from the manufacturer, is that fair? Correct, with new, new firearms that's generally the case, yes. Used firearms, the cable lock might come from somewhere else, is that is that accurate? Yeah, either the store will, will have you buy one or sometimes people throw it in for free, it all just depends, yeah. And I think we, uh, Ms. Back testified that the the cable lock that we have was from Sig Sauer, correct? Correct. Cable locks are not, not necessarily specific to each firearm, so it's not like a key in a, in a lock, right, which is specific to that lock. Cable locks can be used on other firearms. Yeah, generally speaking, yes. They're, they can be used on uh, multiple uh, makes and models of firearms, yes. So assuming that there isn't an issue with the caliber, uh, a 22 caliber we've, we've determined has a smaller um, a smaller bore, so it's, it's more narrow than a 9mm, which has a wider bore. 
Correct. So a cable lock specific to a nine millimeter may not fit in a 22 caliber, but a 22 caliber cable lock may fit in a nine millimeter, if that makes sense. It depends how you use it. I mean, if you were going to put it through the magazine well and not the actual barrel, uh, some, you know, it, there's, there's different recommendations on how to use it, but if you were going to put it through the magazine well and lock it, it would fit both. So that Sig Sauer cable lock isn't necessarily designed just for that Sig Sauer. A Caltac cable lock could have been used on a Sig Sauer, correct? Uh, Caltac, to my knowledge, does not make cable locks. They provide trigger locks, but I get your point. Yes, yes. a different, different model could work just as well. Okay. There are also universal cable locks, which we've kind of talked about, which could work on any caliber handgun. Correct. Semi-automatic handgun, yes. Semi-automatic, thank you. Again, Mr. Crumbly, we know received three either cable locks or trigger, lock, trigger locks in connection with the purchases of the handguns. Correct, based on the documentation we have, yes. Right. You found one cable lock in the home. That's correct. The keys were still in the lock. Yes. You did not find the other two. No. Or their keys. Uh, not to my knowledge, no. You don't know where those other two cable locks are? Uh, I believe there would have been a, a, a trigger lock with the Caltech, but to your point, yes. Okay. You don't know whether Mr. Crumbly had a cable lock on the SIG or not at the time that it was taken by his son. Based on your investigation. Uh, I would, and based on statements made that we've heard in court and other things like that, I've never heard mention of a cable lock. Um, I've always heard hidden. Okay. You don't know though. Is that fair based on your investigation? I know that one wasn't recovered at the school or in the house. Um, so I, I is it a certainty? No, I think it's, it's highly improbable. You said that one was recovered at the school? I said one was not recovered at the school. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't um, hear you. you know, so it would, yeah. I found no evidence that a cable lock was ever installed in that firearm. The prosecutor was asking you about the difference between a 22 caliber round and a 9 millimeter round. And there was something about the size of it, um, the bigger the round, the bigger the hole, things like that. I don't know if I said that today, but I, I know it, yes. Okay. Um, there's no evidence that you've realized that you've learned to show that James bought a gun because he wanted more damage. I think that's what you said, more damage. More damage. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I found any evidence that James decided to purchase that firearm. I, I, if my understanding is right, based on things, is that the only person ever researched the purchase of the firearm was the shooter. We also heard Ms. Back testify that um, and confirm that when Mr. Crumbly went and purchased the 9mm Sig Sauer, that he had made indications that he had been looking at it for a few days. Do you remember that testimony? Yeah, I remember it was either a few days or quite some time. I'm not sure the, the phrasing, but I remember hearing that testimony, yes. And we know that James Crumbly also has fired a 9mm prior to November 26th of 2021. I believe it was September or October of that year. Yes, I, I recall he had at least fired it uh, then and then maybe in July of that year, too. We talked about Exhibit 167, which was the small safe. Yes. The combination on that was 000? Yes. You have no knowledge if anyone other than James knew the combination of that safe? I do not. Specifically, you have no knowledge if his son knew the combination of that safe? I do not know if he knew the combination was 000, no. You don't know if James was aware if his son had the combination to that safe. Is that fair? I, I have found no evidence that he provided the, the, the combination or his son knew the combination, but, uh, you know, based on the fact that we recovered the firearms in the home in the safe and that we have videos of, at least there's one, the one video on, was it August 19th and August 20th, the two videos of uh, Mr. Crumbly's son playing with the Caltech. Um, there's also a video, I forget the date, of, of uh, the shooter playing with a Derringer inside the house at one point. So if they were in the safe, um, I don't know if his father was there or not. I can't answer that question for certain whether his son knew the code of that safe. Okay. And you talked about August of 21. That was obviously before November 30th of 2021 when you recovered that safe from the cabinet. Correct. You testified with the prosecution that you were, I believe you were, used the word shocked to find the ATF youth handgun pamphlet in the, the six-hour gun case, right? Yes. Now, we just talked about the fact that there were at least, we believe at least, two other pamphlets that were provided to Mr. Crumbly. Correct. Correct. 
there, because we know that because there were two other firearms in the home, sure. and you have no reason to believe that those were not sold in compliance with federal law. Correct. You don't know when or how often Mr. Crumbly reviewed those pamphlets with his son? I do not. Prior to November of 2021? No. In fact, it would be a, an assumption that because it was in the, the Sig Sauer case that that must mean that, that Mr. Crumbly wasn't reviewing those rules or following the rules with his son. Is that fair? Can you, can you either rephrase or repeat the question? Yes. It would be an assumption about whether or not Mr. Crumbly reviewed those pamphlets with his son just because it was found in the Sig Sauer case. Correct. Yeah, I think that's why I said I was shocked that it was just kind of discarded to the back. Yes. And we also established that there was no requirement that he post that pamphlet anywhere in his home. Correct. The prosecutor asked you about registering handguns. Um, you don't know whether James mailed the, the pistol sales records, correct? Uh, you mean mailing them in to... If they, were, if they were mailed in and processed, they would have shown up in the registry. I've actually ran it between trial, or either right before the first trial or this trial, and it still wasn't in there, so um, it'd be odd if all three got lost in the mail. Even assuming that James didn't mail them or drop them off, um, the penalty is a civil infraction, correct? Yes, I was only answering the question that they weren't registered. It's a fine, correct? I'm, I'm not, a, I'm, I, don't, I, mean, I don't enforce that state law, particularly I generally deal with with other, other parts of state law with firearms offenses, um, so I'll take your word for it. Well, and I can show you the exhibit if you'd like. The pistol sales record actually lists the penalty at the top. Sure. You talked about uh, Mr. Crumbly's son's stance while at the shooting ranges, and you said that it shows that there's some level of proficiency, that he has some level of proficiency with firearms. Do you remember saying that? Yes, I believe I was talking about the surveillance video from the school, but I, yes. Okay. You would agree that it's important for people in a home where there are firearms present to be familiar with them. And let me let me clarify that question a little bit. Sure. Obviously, if you have a two-year-old in a home, you are not going to familiarize your two-year-old with a firearm. Is that fair? Sure. Not intentionally. Correct. If you have a teenager in the home or other adults in the home, they should be familiar with the firearms if they're going to be in the home. Is that fair? I think that's obviously a personal decision that I... It's not something covered by federal law that you're required to do that. I think some people may choose to, to not do that and just keep them away from their kids and out of view. But, you know, like I said, that's not something I can speak to. Prosecutor specifically asked you about Exhibit 169, which was the firearm purchase on June 15th of 2021, and that there was a delay. Um, you testified that sometimes the background may take time. That's not a negative or a positive, it's just a fact that it's, sometimes it's, they take time. Correct. You heard voices, if you recall, in Exhibits 172 and 173 at the outdoor range, um, which was where the videos on Mr. Crumbly's cell phone of his son firing the Caltech and the Derringer. Do you remember those videos? Is that the, the June videos, June 20th? Yes, June 20th, yes. Yes. And you recall um, that there were other voices. Do you recall hearing other voices? I, I don't recall hearing them. I, I don't disbelieve you. Do you recall hearing other, other firearms being fired? I don't know what they were, but you can hear other firearms being fired. I don't, I don't recall after watching it right now this time. I, I was focused on the, on the shooter in this instance. Um, I, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that our people may be shooting at a range as well. Exhibit 175 um, is the Instagram post by James Crumbly's wife that both sh uh, Mr. Crumbly and his son, quote, both got handguns. That was the Instagram story? Yes. Yes, yeah. And that was, uh, that video is showing Mr. Crumbly's son firing the Caltech. Yes. Which was in the safe in his room, in the safe in Mr. Crumbly's room. On November 30th, yes. Correct. Yep. Exhibits 70 and 71 are the August 19th of 2021 um, video and text that we just talked about a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. You That is of the Caltech, correct? Yes, both of the August 19th and 20th videos were of the Caltech, yes. So... 
you would agree that these may have been the same night. The August 19th video was nine, about approximately 9.30 p.m. and the second video was about 12.30 a.m. the following morning. Correct, yeah, it was the same night into the following morning, yes. Exhibit 70 and 71, you specifically can see that the Caltech is unloaded. In the 819 video? Yes. Yes. That there's no round in the chamber and that the safety is not engaged. Correct. Exhibits 72 and 73 are the August 20th of 21 videos. Your testimony was that Mr. Crumbly's son slammed the firearm down onto the magazine and released the slide forward. Correct, yes. You testified that the way that Mr. Crumbly's son was handling that firearm was not safe handling. Correct. You may have also testified about this, but I wanted to clarify. There was nothing in your investigation that showed that James was aware that his son had made that video. No, again, just only what I testified to, that he was in the home at the time of the video, but uh, no. Exhibit 190 is the September 25th, 2021 um, gun range. There was some uh, nine millimeter rental, some ammunition purchased, and then targets also purchased. Yes. There were silhouette targets and also non-silhouette targets purchased, if you recall. I don't recall, but I, but I take your word for it. There were also range safety officers present, if you recall. Yes, I think that's, that's standard at that, that range, in, in my experience. You described a little bit, discussed a little bit, watching Mr. Crumbly's son, and I don't know if you used the, words mis, the word misfire, but you indicated in your testimony that Mr. Crumbly's son was having an issue with the semi-automatic mm -hmm. handgun. Yes. That he was struggling and, and was a, unable to clear something, correct? Yeah, I think he thought a round was in the chamber, and he thought he cleared it, but there was actually nothing in there, and that's when Mr. Crumbly picks up the magazine and inserts it and, and you know, makes it operable again, yes. And obviously we know that Mr. Crumbly and his son went to the shooting range. Yes. And Mr. Crumbly's son handled the handguns. We, wa we watched it. Correct, yes. You would agree that it's important for a person who fires a firearm or a handgun to know how to properly clear a misfire. I wouldn't say that it was a misfire. I would say that, you know, what it appeared to me is that he was, you know, being instructed by his father on how to properly uh, deal with it, any malfunction of the firearm, which is when he racked the slide and then, um, you know, inserted the magazine. So same question, but worded a little bit different. It's important for somebody who fires a, who handles a firearm, or who fires a firearm to know how to deal with things that come up while you're firing it. Is that fair? I would say that, that that's a safe way to, yeah, if you're going to be sh shooting a firearm, that's, that's correct. And if somebody handling a firearm or shooting a firearm doesn't know how to properly do that, it can have potentially very dangerous consequences. Yes. Exhibit 95 is the social media post by Mr. Crumbly's son about um, he, the one where there's the multiple photos of the Sig Sauer. He talks about his new beauty, his 9mm, his Sig Sauer. That. I recall the post, okay. yeah. There was no evidence other than those pictures. Well, let me say this. And I've asked this question before. You've heard it. Based on those photos, you don't know if Mr. Crumbly is standing right outside the frame of the photo, correct? I do not know. Okay. Um, you've learned nothing during your investigation to show that Mr. Crumbly wasn't standing there with his son. On the date he purchased the firearm when he took those photos? Yes, November 26th. Correct, correct. There's no evidence that Mr. Crumbly gave his son that Sig Sauer and that he had it unsupervised. Is that fair? Other than on, on November 26th of 2021. So I recall there being another video that Detective Wagrowski uh, testified to that I've also observed. I believe that was later that night, um, showing uh, the shooter in possession of that firearm, filming down the barrel of it. Um, I don't recall uh, any other videos or photos of that on the, on the devices. And along the same lines as I've asked previously, you learned nothing during your investigation that Mr. Crumbly was aware of that video, the one that you just described later that night on November 26th of 2021. Yeah, like, again, the only thing I, I believe he was also present in the home for that one, um, but that, that's the only thing that I could find, yes. In fact, the Sig Sauer case was found in Mr. Crumbly and Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly's bedroom. That's correct. It was on the bed next to the, it was open next to the box of uh, Patriot Defense Ammunition. Exhibit 97 was a photo taken by, I believe, Jennifer Crumbly of the open Sig Sauer box with the Caltech 
and the SIG Sauer in the case, correct? Yes. That has the ETF pamphlet and the cable lock. Correct. In looking at the Caltech, there's no magazine in the, in the Caltech. I don't believe so in that picture, no. You testified about the Exhibit 42, which is the cable lock that was found at the Crumbly home. Your testimony was if it was used regularly, the bag would be damaged. That cable lock was provided four days before you found the cable lock in the home, correct? Correct, yeah. But if you tried to take that in and out of there, the way that the, mat, the cable lock expands in that bag, it would tear up the edges of it. Um, so that, there would be more wear and tear on the bag. Exhibit 95 is the receipt on November 27th of 2021 when, when Jennifer Crumbly and her son went to the shooting range. Yes. I think I've already discussed this. There was Patriot Defense 9mm ammunition purchased that day, two boxes. Correct. Based on your investigation and your involvement, that was the first time after that six hour was purchased that ammunition was purchased. From, from records we've located, yes, that's correct. If you recall, and if you don't know the answer to this, please tell me, um, you reviewed a lot. Did you also review any statements made to law enforcement um, or the, the interview from the substation of Mr. Crumbly? Yes. Okay. And if you recall, during that interview, James did not know how much ammunition was purchased that day, November 27th of 21. I recall there being a conversation between uh, him and his wife, and I believe he ends up correcting her saying it was 50 rounds, but I, I don't recall the exact words he used. Okay. They discussed the cost. I believe so, yeah, because he was, he was, I think she initially thought there was like 200 rounds, and I think he eventually informed her it was 50 rounds. Okay. Exhibit 196 is the video of Mr. Crumbly's son and Mr. Crumbly's wife at the range. You can see when Mr. Crumbly's son is actually in the booth um, handling the handgun, the 9mm handgun, the Sig Sauer, that there's actually a range safety officer standing slightly behind him to the right. He's got like a bright yellow vest on, correct? Yes. And... If you know, and I assume that you do know, the pur purchase purpose of a range safety officer is to ensure that people are handling their firearms correctly. Yeah, I would say it's in compliance with whatever the rules are for that specific range, yes. So if that, we would assume, and if you don't want to assume that's okay, but if that range safety officer had seen Mr. Crumbly's son doing something incorrect or inappropriate, it would have been raised as an issue that day. I would, I would assume so, that's his job, so yes. The box, the empty box of ammunition that was discovered in the Crumbly home on November 30th of 2021 was Patriot, Patriot Defense Ammunition. Yes. And I think you testified earlier that there are um, nine millimeter ammunition is more is more expensive than 22 caliber ammunition, correct? Generally speaking. Okay. Yes. But there are within that there are, are varying levels of expensive for the nine millimeter ammunition, correct? Correct. And we know that there were two different prices on two different purchases of 9mm ammunition in 2021 by James Crumbly and by his wife Jennifer Crumbly. Yes. And obviously if you're going to the shooting range, you need ammunition to shoot, correct? Yes. So it's not unheard of for somebody to buy rounds of ammunition at a shooting range? No. During your involvement in this case, you saw no information that James Crumbly was aware of the Instagram post by his son. Uh, let me clarify, because I think there were a couple. The Instagram post where his son commented, it was Exhibit 100, about his, quote, new SIG. I don't recall if he saw that one. I know he saw uh, the social media post by his wife of the fire, but I, I, don't, I don't believe that there was evidence of the uh, uh, viewing that specific post that I found. You also talked, lastly, you talked about the similarities between the drawing of the handgun on the math that we've seen, the math assignment that we've seen in Exhibit 130, and also, and let me see if I can get back to it, and also um, the similarity to the handgun, the Sig Sauer handgun. Do you remember making that comparison? Yes. Okay. Let me see if I can pull that. Person that's turning the TV guys. Oh, yeah. There's a button the back. There we go. That's fine. Can you see? Okay. Yeah. So you talked about the similarities where the striations on the back of the slide. 
Yes, that correct? Was, that was one of them, yes. The location of the ejection port? Yes. The shape of the trigger guard? Yes. And for those reasons, you believe that that was the same as the Sig Sauer handgun? Uh, and also the, the, the shape of the floor plate of the magazine. When, you, when all those are combined, each one taken in isolation, not the case, but if you put them all together, then yes. And you're obviously work for the ATF. Yes. You have some significant familiarity with handguns. Yes. This is the Sig Sauer handgun. It's Exhibit 86. This is the I'm sorry, the Smith and Wesson handgun. A photo that was sent to James Crumbly by his son um, prior to the purchase of the Sig Sauer handgun. Correct. Um, there's striations on the back. Correct. Um, not on the front. Uh, there's striations on the back. There are striations on the back, but not the front of that firearm. And there's that's the ejection port that we can see on the top. Well, the, the side facing us. Obviously, you can't see what's on the other side. Correct. There's also a black line that's not, you know, it's a, a two-tone firearm, and there's a black line. There's, there's vast differences between that one and the one that's drawn. There are some similarities, like we discussed. Like, but I said again, taken in isolation, it could be a different firearm. But when all put together, it appears to be the same firearm. And you don't know if anyone who viewed that handgun on the math homework even made the connection between that and the Sig Sauer. Is that fair? Other than you. We know you did. I found I found no evidence that they did. I, you know, I, I know that if you if you buy a firearm, you know, you generally know what it looks like. But you know, okay. I know for the questions, Jeremy. Briefly, <clears throat> Special Agent Brandon, um, Defense Counsel just asked you some questions about um, other cable locks being used or could have been used. Do you remember that? Yes. All right, and she asked you about the other two cable locks. Um, do we have any evidence there were there were two other cable locks ever given to James Crumbly? No, there were two trigger lock forms that could have been trigger locks or cable locks. Um, uh, and honestly, the, the, the cable lock for the Derringer probably wouldn't even work uh, because you'd have to have one small enough to fit through the, you know, the actual firearm itself, which the SIG one would not. All right, and you just testified that you believe a trigger lock was what was sold with the Caltech. Did you say that? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, did you find any evidence of the, the, the a trigger lock or another cable lock anywhere in the home? No. Anywhere in the school? Uh, I, I didn't search the, the school, but I'm not aware that one was ever located. Okay. Um, she just asked you about the, subs, the comments at the substation. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. What did James Crumbly say when he was asked where that weapon was? I believe he said it was in the armoire, hidden in the armoire, and then he said the, the ammunition was um, underneath a pair of jeans. Did he ever say locked? No. Was there anything that struck you about his, um, his mention of the SIG? Yes, so when he mentions the SIG Sour, he mispronounced sour as Sawyer, which if you purchased that firearm and it was for yourself, you'd be familiar with how to say six sour. Okay. And Your Honor, I, I would I would object to that response and ask for it to be stricken. He's making an assumption about what Mr. Yeah, Crumley yeah. knows. System. System. I'll move on. Uh, Special Agent, last question. You mentioned earlier that you reviewed the the cell phone data um, and web searches of that were on the um, the phone of James Crumley. Yes. All right. And did you ever find any searches that he did relating to firearm safety or minors? Uh, it was, I, I did, there were searches related to that topic. It was after the shooting had occurred. Okay, so December something, after the shooting occurred. Yes, I don't recall the exact date, but it was after the shooting. Anything before? Uh, regarding firearm safety, not that I recall. Thank you, nothing further. May this witness be excused, Your Honor? Yes, you can, you can step down when you're excused. Thank you, Your Honor. You don't have someone brief for today. Not 15 minutes brief, Judge. We have somebody here, but we wouldn't get through my direct, that's for sure. All right, so 9 o'clock tomorrow? Yes, sir. Thank okay. you, Judge. I need to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, during the trial, do not read, listen to, or watch any news reports about the case. Under the law, the evidence you consider to decide the case must meet certain standards. For example, witnesses must swear to tell the truth, 
and lawyers must be able to cross-examine them. Because news reports do not have to meet these standards, they could give you incorrect or misleading information that might unfairly favor one side. So to be fair to both sides, you must follow this instruction. Do not go on social media, do not post, do not do research, do not discuss this case with anyone. Um, and please uh, call out your lunch order for tomorrow. All right. Have a great night. It's going to help you. It's 9 o'clock tomorrow we'll start. All right for the jury. You've been watching the third day in the trial of James Crumbly. Today we heard testimony from Sean Hopkins and Nicholas Ejag. Both were a part of the faculty at the time of the shooting. Sean Hopkins was the counselor at the time. Nicholas Ejag was the dean of students. For most of the witnesses thus far, it hasn't been the first time they've been on the stand and testified. We've seen many of them testify in the Jennifer Crumbly trial. We've got a recap of today plus the previous two days, so Thursday and Friday of last week. You can find it on fox2detroit.com. Charlie Langton will rehash what was unveiled in court today um, at Fox 2 News at 5 and 6. That wraps up our time here on the stream today. We'll be back tomorrow when court resumes at 9 a.m. Live now on Fox is next. Next.